The Tower, an Ian Bragg thriller, book five. Written by Craig Martell. Narrated by Chris Abernathy. Chapter One. Nobody was born a master. Amateurs become experts because they did not give up on learning. Israel Moore Ayavor. I am not until I have to be. It was difficult getting used to a sedentary life, so I refused. I hired people to do the jobs that required sitting. That freed Jenny and me to do the more important things in life. Was that a shark? Jenny said, pointing toward the gentle surf. I sipped my fruit punch. I didn't see anything besides that pot of dolphins. She shook her head. Not a shark, then. Dolphins will keep the sharks away, I replied. Kind of like us. Maybe we should be the dolphin conglomerate and not the peace archive. Jenny laughed. It was music to my ears. I was glad we didn't move within social circles that would have judged us for our whirlwind romance, three weeks from meeting to married. If they only knew about the trail of dead bodies we left behind. That came with the territory. An unscrupulous regional director had tried to take me out after I exposed her for losing focus on the Peace Archive's purpose. Removing bad people from existence was a service we provided, but it came at a high cost. Removing the Peace Archive's regional director was something completely different. It had set up the series of events that landed us in our second home in the Hamptons, a mansion on the ocean, because I was now in charge of the Peace Archive. We had over 40 operators working for us, 40 different people to contract for work outside the law. I considered us to be the good guys. For me, making Jenny laugh was my mission in life, in between the company contracts, of course. I sat in my beach chair with my untraceable satellite phone on my lap because I was expecting a call from Gladys in our main office in Chicago. I would have preferred not to go back to Chicago, but that would be unavoidable. At least we could get White Castle hamburgers, a treat denied us out east. Besides working out, my daily routine was a slave to eating. What can I say? We loved good food. Our stint in Vegas was a culinary holiday. We still hadn't found the perfect egg foo young. The Hamptons wasn't the same as Vegas. Everything you could possibly ever want could be found on the strip. The phone buzzed. Yes, I answered. Gladys here. Please confirm. You are the sparkle in the stars that brings us hope and peace, I replied with our coordinated phrase. You are a piece of work, Ian, but I love you anyway, Gladys replied. I'm sorry to be the messenger of bad news, but the meeting is scheduled in a downtown high-rise called the Tower. It's in person only for next Tuesday. Your first-class tickets are online. You leave from JFK in two days at nine in the morning. We were growing so tired of sitting on the beach and sipping fruity drinks, Gladys. Thank you for saving us from the tragedy of our lives. Incorrigible, Gladys replied. We will see you when you get here. She ended the call. Jenny could hear everything, even my emotions. She hadn't missed a word of the call, even though the speaker had been pressed against my ear. I know why you wanted this meeting, but will any good come from it? She wondered. We don't need competition. I looked around to make sure we were alone before lowering my voice. Killing people isn't a job where we want an antagonistic relationship with our fellows. I suspect we have a better infrastructure and a wider network than others in this business. If we can keep from stepping on each other's toes, we'll all be better off. We only eliminate bad guys. Jenny reiterated. Jenny had killed, too. One of the company's operators had tried to kill Jenny, and the operator paid for that with her life. She had adopted the nom de guerre of Jack Palance and had been one of the Peace Archive's most successful operators. But we learned too late that she was also a psychopath. The company was more professional without Jack, and I was much better with Miss Jenny. We made a team that carried an incredible secret one not to be shared with the outside world, ever. There's going to be some friction at that meeting. Maybe we can bring them some Atlantic salmon or caviar. Who doesn't like caviar? 
I don't like caviar. And keep in mind, I was raised outside Seattle. You can't beat Alaskan salmon. You should probably think harder about a gift from the Hamptons, she replied. You went to the Hamptons and all I got was this lousy t-shirt? I wasn't suggesting it, but it would probably start the gunfight I was trying to avoid. At Jenny's look, I regrouped. Maybe not. How about $5 gold coins? They have some value, about $250 each, or $10 gold coins. We can easily carry them. They can receive them and slip them into a pocket so no one is encumbered. Something bigger, and they would think we're trying to keep their hands occupied and in plain sight. Jenny said, Maybe we should do that. Keep their hands in the open. Now you're starting to sound like me. We don't need any more conspiracy theories. How do we protect ourselves? I asked. We have two days to figure it out. I nodded toward the ocean. Fancy a swim? In that ice water? I think not. How about naked hot tub? Jenny waggled her eyebrows at me, and I was done for the day. The Jeep Grand Cherokee was where we left it, as it should have been. We paid a long-term parking fee, so we always kept our ride in one place. We were spending as much time in the Hamptons as we did in Chicago, driving up our cost, but that was the least important element in the process. It was worth it to stay under the radar. Taking a taxi or other type of rideshare would publicly expose our movements, much more so than keeping our company vehicle at a long-term parking garage. Then again, we were legitimate business people. If they were tracking us, they'd know when we were in town, but nothing beyond that. We kept our cell phones off most of the time. Survivability came at the cost of staying off the grid enough to create gaps and confusion, and in the extreme, a lack of evidence. In the 21st century, you couldn't stay off the grid in entirety and still run a multi-million dollar business. We had to have some visibility. Just enough. The Jeep started right away, as it always did. It had a layer of dust on it from recent windstorms blowing through the multi-level parking garage. I cleaned the windshield and rear window with the wipers. The low fluid light came on. I stared at it as if that would make it go out. At least the check engine light isn't on, Jenny offered. Whatever you do, don't stop by White Castle on your way. I want you to eat a little healthier than that. I like their burgers. I can eat a mountain of them. They sit there all small and innocent looking, and wham, before you know it, you're full. The best way to take my mind off anything going on in the vehicle was to jam my Rush playlist. It opened with Dreamline. I grinned as the music filled the cab. We drove out of the garage and turned toward Chicago's downtown instead of going north like we usually did. Our meeting wasn't at the club, an exclusive property that we owned thanks to the previous leadership of the Peace Archive. The club was public, while the archive was not an entity that needed to have any public profile. We were going to the Tower, the name the locals gave to the McManus Brothers building, a mix of high-end condos, offices, and small businesses. Sixty-two stories within which the other heads of the contract assassination companies would meet and outline a way to keep from stepping on each other's toes. It felt like a mob meeting. Stay off my turf or my boys will pay you a visit. I chuckled. We were stopped in traffic and I had too much time to ruminate. What's so funny? Jenny wondered. She didn't bother looking at me. I was the same as I had been all day, only the outside scenery had changed. We don't come down here very often, she said. Actually, I don't think we've ever come down here, not together. No, because I don't like it. We had the one contract down this way, but that was something completely different. The hood never knew what hit them. Jenny sighed heavily. You had me scared. Don't do that again. They shouldn't have killed Chaz. They laughed about it, too. They don't deserve to belong in a society with decent people. And now they aren't. That was time well spent. And as much as it scared you, I would do it again. We would do it again. For a society to function, people need to be safe going about their business. We can't live in fear. Jenny put her hand on my leg and squeezed. I know, but let's try to keep it to paying contracts that other people carry out. You're in charge. 
Never ask your people to do something you wouldn't do yourself. Your people can take care of it even if you haven't done it yourself, Jenny counseled. Dear, you instigator, I chuckled once more. Things were getting too heavy. We were going to get enough of that in the tower. You're worried about this meeting, aren't you? Jenny knew. Why wouldn't I be? We cover the whole of the continental United States. Everyone else has smaller slices of the pie, but I need to make them understand that their clients and our clients couldn't be more different. We're the only ones who turn down contracts that aren't about people who are blights on society. We're even sanctioned by the government. Shh, don't let anyone hear you say that. We run a club with an exclusive clientele who network among their own kind for camaraderie, fine dining, and a little golf. Exactly that, I replied. Thanks to my first contract, I saved the life of one Jimmy Triplethorn, who rose quickly in the political ranks and was now vice president of the United States. It made for a friendly but uncomfortable relationship. He had a tendency to call and ask for help, help that only someone with our kind of company could provide. So we did favors for the government, which they paid us well to do, but they would let us hang if we got ourselves caught. Top cover without necessarily being top cover. We had met the president. I should forever be shocked by the events that led to that meeting, but those tales were for a day when it would no longer matter. I couldn't imagine that day would ever come. We were living for the moment, making a difference in today's world, not the one 20 years from now. Or maybe we were. Small changes today, or great changes later, if only people could see the influence of their actions. How many lives had we saved because of the lives we had taken? Big changes. Fine dining and a little golf. I'd like a smidge of each right about now. The last thing I want is to go to this meeting, but go we must. Maybe we can come to an agreement soon enough to make the club for dinner. Chef will take care of us. Traffic picked up again, and I focused on driving and worried about parking, the same thing everyone worried about when they went downtown. Until the traffic broke and we raced to our destination, getting there too quickly. We had an hour to kill. There was an underground garage, and parking had already been arranged. We didn't need to worry at all. We drove down four levels and into spot number 444. Is that our lucky number? I asked. Jenny shook her head. I'm pretty sure it's not. I took her hand and looked into her eyes. Let's do this thing and then get the hell out of here. Quick as we can, Ian. I already feel trapped. I winced. That wasn't a word I liked to hear. It reminded me of the parking garage in Seattle where I sanctioned Daniel Nader because Jimmy's father-in-law paid me to remove him from his daughter's life and it was for reasons I agreed with. Four other owners, only four. We've had worse. We haven't, Jenny replied. Wait, no, we have. David Koresh. That was far worse. It was. This was only four of them. Five with us. Chapter 2 If the mind is clear, whatever you do or say will bring happiness that will follow you like your shadow. Buddha the company is greater than one man, I told myself, or greater than one couple. I was an effective operator before Miss Jenny entered my life, but I wasn't a manager. That took the two of us. It took the pressure off me. I wanted to hang up my rifle, even though I didn't have one. I used whatever was at hand, meaning whatever could be stolen or otherwise used in the vicinity of the target to do the deed. A car wreck, an axe, razor blades whatever it took to complete the mission. These were the heads of the four organizations besides the Peace Archive that provided operators for hire. We were going to meet on the top floor in a conference room that looked out over the city. We were early, way early, which gave us a chance to see the location, determine our exit route and other particulars should the situation go sideways. It was a standard operator tactic. Always leave yourself an out. The conference room door was open. I looked both ways before entering. We weren't the only ones who were early. It appears that we're in the right place. 
I walked up to the older, shorter gentleman wearing a silk suit, the likes of which were common in New York City. Ian Bragg and my wife and business partner, Jenny. Guido Kalkovecki. My friends call me Guido. I had to exercise all my self-control not to make a joke. This was deadly serious, but that made it even funnier. I knew I would laugh later, but couldn't now. Guido. New York City? The Big Apple, he confirmed. The other individual in the room looked to be cut from the same cloth as Guido Kalkovecki. He also looked like the stereotypical mobster, at least what we were conditioned to think from the movies. He spoke with a heavy Chicago brogue. They call me Freddie J. Mac. Is that what you call yourself? I asked without thinking. His eyelids drooped as he stared. Funny, he deadpanned. Nice to meet you all. Do you know who we're waiting for? I do know. Guido waited. I waited until I regretted not making a joke earlier. Just pulling your leg. Felipe Luis San Bernardino out of L.A. and Paul Steyer from Houston, he finally admitted. The geography and population density of the United States suggested there was a huge gap from Atlanta to Miami. I knew that we had the area covered with our southeast region. I didn't feel the need to share that just yet. I wondered if there was going to be arguments over turf. We had people everywhere except for Texas. I figured the Texans would take care of their own problems. We're going to take a stroll. We'll be back, I told them. Guido snorted and his lip curled on one side. Steps are down that way, he tipped his chin to my left. There are four conference rooms the other way, and of course, for people of my age, bathrooms. Good info. We'll take a look while getting some fresh air. If you'll excuse us. I bowed my head to the two older gentlemen. Jenny nodded to them, and we left the conference room. I'm proud of you, Ian, Jenny said softly as we walked toward the stairway. Why is that? Guido, and you didn't make any jokes. You even kept a straight face. Thank you for not looking at me. I knew how it would have gone. I'm aware of my limits. When in a situation where I shouldn't laugh, I'm most definitely not looking at you. Does that make us bad people? It didn't make us bad. It makes us different, I said. It makes us two of a kind, introverts, and those who excel in high-stress operations. I saw it in the Marines. We laughed at the worst of times. It's the only way to keep your sanity. I count on you to keep me grounded. By making you laugh when you shouldn't? Jenny shook her head and opened the door carefully. I glanced into the semi-dark of the stairwell. It was as plain as a high-rise stairwell could be. Steel stairs turning within square concrete walls. A single landing of non-skid stood midway between the floors. A narrow gap between the handrails showed a drop to infinity, but the only thing that could fit in the gap was a wallet. It wasn't enough to give me the willies. That's a long way down. Jenny looked into the gap. Not wide enough to worry about. We doubled back to the other end of the top floor. Conference rooms lined the walls to provide million-dollar views for the executives who would deign to look upon the world from the top of the mountain. The bathrooms had no view. They were blocked within the center of the floor. One way in and one way out. The elevators backed up against the bathrooms. It was the simplest of floor plans, utilitarian to maximize the view. The elevator dinged while Jenny and I stood in the hallway outside our conference room. A woman stepped out, striking, tall with dark hair and features. I nodded and stepped aside, but she was headed for our conference room. Ian Bragg, I introduced myself. Philippa Luisa San Bernardino, she replied. That bastard! I had to throw my hands up and surrender. Guido got me. I should have made my Guido joke. He set us up. I knew it wasn't his New York accent. I don't understand. You're not Felipe, I'm happy to say. I tipped my chin toward Jenny. My wife, Jenny. I didn't know we could bring spouses, Philippa replied coolly. Business partner. She belongs in these conversations. You're just the action side of the business, Philippa purred in a sultry tone. It was hard not to laugh. 
Operators were actors, assuming personas that suited them in the moment. Jack was effective because her looks allowed her to get close. Philippa was gifted with the same set of tools. It made me wonder if she was a psychopath as well. I've been known to act on this side of the business, but Jenny can hold her own in the action department too. I suddenly wanted nothing more than to extricate myself from the conversation. I opened the door to the conference room for her. I'm going to powder my nose first. She waved with just her fingers, her eyes never leaving mine. When she was gone, Jenny raised her eyebrows at me. I'm going to need a shower after this. Those wiles are well practiced. In my look of confusion, she clarified. Feminine wiles? She's as authentic as a three-dollar bill. I know all that. The challenge is figuring out how to get the real her to come out and talk to us like professionals. It'll make this go a lot smoother. We entered the conference room and took two seats at the table that was set for ten. Water glasses and sealed bottles of water were placed before each seat. We would have been skeptical of anything that was opened or untended. No one tampered with anything, Guido said. He took the water in front of my seat, cracked the lid, and took a drink. I should have brought a coffee, I replied. I'll order enough for all of us. They'll have it here in short order. The kitchen is only one floor down. It dawned on me that I didn't know who was running this show. That bothered me. I had such blind trust in Gladys that when she told us to come to this meeting, I accepted it. She would have told me more information if it had been necessary. Order the coffee, Guido. I'll be happy to share a cup with you. I nodded toward the corridor. Jenny headed that way. You'll get your own cup, you Midwest perv. You stay out of my cup. Guido gave me the finger. Maybe you've had enough coffee. I'm starting to like you, Guido. And thanks. Straight up, black for me. In the corridor, I removed my untraceable satellite phone and called Gladys. The club, Gladys speaking, came the well-practiced reply. Ian here. What do you know about this meeting? Guido is in charge? Guido, yes, includes lunch and a conversation to keep the companies from stepping on each other's toes. Simple and straightforward. Why, what's happened? He said he'd order me coffee, and that made my hair stand on end. Was it the New York City accent? She asked rather abruptly. I didn't want to admit that she was right, but he struck me as a gangster. I had an unnatural fear of the mob because of too many movies. Maybe, was the most I would admit. Is there anything else you know that I should know? This doesn't feel right. It's because you're perpetually paranoid, which is probably a good trait in your business. Gladys sounded certain. But there's nothing else. I know these are the heads of real organizations. It's important that you all talk. I relaxed. That doesn't help, but we'll make it work. I hope we see you this afternoon. If not today, then first thing tomorrow. I hung up, as uncomfortable as I had been before I called. Jenny had heard everything. I put my phone away as the restroom door opened and Philippa joined us. You're not one of those antisocial types, are you? We are, I replied. We don't get along with people, not at all. A power couple like you? Bah, well played. This time, she accepted my offer of holding the door and sauntered through to greet the others. She knew them all by name, but we were still missing one. We were now a half hour before the designated start time. It boggled my mind that four of the five attendees were that early. It was nothing like the corporate world. The elevator sounded. I backed against the wall and watched the door open. An attendant pushed a cart out with the coffee service. I intercepted her to offer our help. She politely declined, but we removed the obstacles to her expeditious delivery. She smiled and was gracious. Guido and Freddy pointed cups and ordered their drinks, one with cream and sugar and one without. Neither thanked the server. I noted things like that. It went to the core of the individual. It also suggested the little people would be invisible to our fellow executives. Anyone being invisible was dangerous. I slipped her a 20 and thanked her profusely for my coffee. She topped off my cup after a single sip. She moved the cart to the side and departed.
nearly running into our last attendee. Is that coffee I smell? He asked. You're a gem. If I wasn't married, oh, baby. She squeezed past him, nodding before hurrying away. Paul Stare, he said, from Houston. He waved to the others and went straight to the coffee cart. He watched me with one eye while pouring himself a cup. Ian Bragg and my wife, Jenny. Guido chimed in. They're the upstart power couple. Is that what you're calling us? I blurted. Maybe we can get started to skip past the posturing and other things a bunch of alpha personalities feel obliged to spew. I sat in the chair at the place where Guido had already taken the water bottle. Jenny sat next to me. She reached under the table and squeezed my thigh. Guido closed and locked the door. He took a device out of his briefcase and plugged it into an outlet on the table. When he turned the device on, nothing happened. Enough of the mystery. He caught me staring at the electronics. Local jammer, so we can speak in private. No need for anyone else to hear what we're talking about. And if any of you try to record this, it'll come out as white noise. I didn't nod or change my expression. It sounded like the system we used at the club to prevent recordings or eavesdropping. That wasn't good for business. I rolled my finger at Guido for him to continue. Our esteemed colleagues from New York City, Chicago, L.A., Houston, and the interlopers who claim all of the states within their purview. We're here to hash out some boundaries. No wonder you all know each other. We didn't prepare for this meeting. Interlopers? Your business is different from ours. That's all there is to it. You'll take any contracts. We only take those for morally reprehensible individuals who are better off not participating in society with the rest of us. I think I should take offense, Max said. We don't take just any contract. I leaned back in my seat. Ambushed in the boardroom. I shook my head for effect. I'd like to think there's enough work for all of us. That's where you're wrong. Our numbers are down. Way down, Guido said in an ominous voice. If they weren't so deadly serious, it would have been funny. The Peace Archive had been in business for 25 years. Recently, Jenny and I had gotten enough contracts that it may have appeared like we were increasing our market share, but we were only holding steady. Our year-over-year -year numbers are not increasing. They're maybe even declining, Jenny said. She knew more about that than I did. I watched the macro numbers, steering clear of the granular view. Maybe discretionary income is less, as in people don't have the mill or two to throw away to sanction targets? Your speculation doesn't do you any favors. It doesn't make you sound smarter, Max said. Jenny tensed. It was my turn to be the calming influence. I patted her hand where it rested on my leg. Trying to get under my skin isn't a winning strategy. What do you want? Is it us off your turf? Is that the cool term nowadays, or should I be using something else? I stared at Guido. I had been wrong. I didn't like him. I know you've bought a house in the Hamptons. You're encroaching, and we don't like it. You need to sell that house and leave New York alone, Guido said. Mac added, And you have a house here in Chicago. You'll need to move out of there. We've had enough. Anyone else? I asked. The others watched. They weren't committing until the first moves had been played. Did you guys give Chaz and Vinny any grief? They founded the Peace Archive and went where the work was. Now that they've handed the company to us, we've stayed where the work is. I guess we'd be willing to change our geographical engagement. Easy enough. I looked from Guido to Mac and back to Guido. Just pay us our annual take from the region. What is it, honey, for New York and Chicago? The two men scowled. Jenny jumped in without missing a beat. New York is the most lucrative with contracts of $20 million a year. Chicago is more engaged, even though we try to limit the contracts in our home city. Let's say $12 million a year. There you have it. A mere $32 million. I stood. You can work with Gladys to arrange the payments. Oh, I trust you not at all, so those sums need to be paid in advance, each year, in perpetuity. Guido relaxed. I see you understand how the game is played. That confirmed my suspicion that it was some kind of game. They were posturing. I started to think it wasn't about geography, but about control. Is this where I'm supposed to bluster and threaten? 
From what I know, we have the biggest organization of our kind. Even if you've been around longer, you haven't been able to build the secure clientele that the Peace Archive has. You're playing second fiddle. You're trying to see if we'll crack. We can have an antagonistic relationship if you want, but that's not my preference. Internecine warfare is less than optimal, shall we say. Do you think that's what we're doing? Philippa asked. I think you'd be much better positioned to expand your own businesses if you teamed up rather than tried to take us down. Do you think you can intimidate us? Heaven forbid you think you can kill us and get away with it. This isn't bluster, but I expect you'd all be dead before you left this building. My regional directors would move into the void left by your untimely demise. Chapter 3 The best defense is a good offense. George Washington I hadn't asked Gladys to have any of our operators on standby, and that was a critical shortcoming. I shouldn't have had to bluff to protect Jenny and me. Cool customer. We've been watching this building since before we called the meeting here. There are no operators waiting to be activated. Paul tisk tisked and shook his head. I'm calling your bluff. As you wish, believe what you will. I slouched and laced my fingers together across my taut midsection. I had to force my neck and shoulders to relax. This was dangerous, probably the most dangerous situation I'd ever been in, and that included getting shot at. Jenny and I were in a room with our backs to the windows. That would have been fine, but the people we faced had declared themselves to be our enemies. One-on-one, -on -one, I had no doubt I could take them, probably easily, but I wasn't armed at all, not even a small pocket knife, since we didn't check any luggage. I twiddled my thumbs, but the movements were jerky since my arms were tense, ready to lash out should anyone make a move. It was a battle of wits. I wondered if the serving lady was on max payroll. There was one exit, and we had to pass by the four leaders of companies filled with hitmen, although I didn't know how many they had in each of their organizations. I didn't care. The Peace Archive wasn't in competition with them. We offer a boutique service. We're not in competition with any of you. What happened that got your backs up? You shouldn't feel threatened. Not by us. Look at our innocent faces. Jenny looked sideways at me. Humor was the best weapon I had in my arsenal. Guido was my exact opposite. If someone told me that he had gone his whole life without cracking a smile, I would have believed them. You are hardly innocent, Guido said. You are getting into my business, and I don't like it. I wanted to break into a profane tirade to let Guido see a little of the marine inside me. I wanted to pound him into next week. If it was his intent to get me flustered, he was getting there. Jenny squeezed my leg again. She was maintaining her composure. I stood up. The others pushed their chairs back. Our attendance here was a courtesy. You hold no sway over us. Doing your best to make us your enemies is ill-advised. We could be working together, but if you are not open to any kind of arrangement, then we'll be on our way. I don't have to negotiate with you. It sounds like you're the ones begging me for quarter. How about that? If you'll excuse us, White Castle is calling my name. Maybe you're being hasty, Philippa offered. There might be an arrangement we can make, an agreement we can come to. Why didn't you start with that? I asked while I remained standing. Jenny had not yet risen. She was doing her best to keep the situation from escalating more than it already had. I glared at them one by one. They had made me angry, and that was dangerous. I walked slowly to the coffee cart, watching my colleagues. A hand close to the briefcase, the purse suspiciously half-opened, a bulge in a suit jacket. They were all packing, all of them except Jenny and me, but I didn't own a weapon. That was my stock in trade. I would make do with whatever was available. I poured myself a fresh cup, ignoring the mostly full cup in front of my seat. There were ten chairs and only six of us. I walked behind Guido and took the empty chair between him and Mac. Guido reached down to slide his briefcase to the side away from me. I stopped the movement with my foot. You wanted to play hardball, Mr. Kalkovecki, not me. 
You'll leave your briefcase right there or I'll break your hand. Guido was a good 20 to 30 years older than me. I expected he was used to having his boys around to provide the muscle. Just leave it. It'll be okay. Neither of us is going to need whatever you have in there. I looked to the others. None of you are going to need your hardware. I don't want to see if you're still in practice. I used my toe to move the briefcase back to where it had been. Internecine. It's a good word. If you don't know it, you should. I took a slow sip of my coffee. It was good to see that I had the other four on their heels. Jenny bit her lip while making eye contact. Violence was a tool, just like the viable threat of violence. I had made my point. Now we could get to the real conversation. But it wasn't going to be led by Guido or anyone besides me. These four were used to getting their own way. Not this time. Here's what's going to happen, I started. When we get contracts we can't live with, we give them to one of you. And we get them on occasion. We only deal with bad guys, not marginal people who got contracts put on their heads. That's not our business. That's the best compromise I can offer you. And you know what? We don't even want a cut of it. If we don't take it, we don't want to have anything to do with it. Sounds enticing, but I see a challenge sending a client through a middleman. How many contracts are you going to send us? I asked. Mac looked confused. Never met a contract you didn't like? I wondered. Don't answer that. One way. Not because I'm trying to buy my way out of here. Like I said, anything happens to us, it'll happen to you too before you leave. We know that's a bluff, Paul said. I smiled. Do we? I feel like a demonstration is in order. But then again, how many of you would have to die to prove it's not a bluff? But I don't want your businesses. What you do and what we do doesn't overlap. I gestured toward Jenny and me. Why wouldn't they get it? What was so hard to understand? A show of force! That's what you want then? The alarm bells started going off in my head. I grabbed the briefcase and jumped toward the coffee cart as the door popped open. Get down! I shouted at Jenny. An individual walked in carrying a pistol before him. I was only two steps away, but he already had the pistol raised. I threw the briefcase at his hand and ran toward him. The case hit his arm but didn't dislodge the weapon. I reached him before he could bring it to bear. I landed next to him, planting my feet and rotating to deliver a short-stroke heel strike to his face. He dodged, but not far enough. I hit him on the cheek. It staggered him. He started to fall. I brought my left knee up hard as I could toward his midsection. He took the full force of the blow to hard abs, but they weren't hard enough. He came off his feet and crumpled to the deck. I punched him in the temple to finish the fight. I launched myself across his unconscious body toward the pistol that had skittered away. The others were still at the table, but Philippa and Paul had their pistols out. I grabbed the pistol on the floor and rolled away. Jenny popped Paul in the back of his head before he could draw a bead on me. The surprise attack caught Philippa off guard. She was torn about where to aim. Jenny stayed behind Paul while relieving him of his piece. Philippa surrendered, carefully setting her pistol on the table. I should kill you all right now, I growled. Is this what you had planned for us? What a pathetic attempt to kill a frontline operator. We won't underestimate you again, Guido said in a cold voice. You are self-proclaimed as our competition. I'd laugh if it wasn't so sad. I nodded to Jenny, and she recovered the small pistol in front of Philippa, a three eighty. The other she had was a Glock 9mm. The one in my hand was a forty five Smith & Wesson M&P 45 Shield M2.0, a boutique kind of pistol with a limited single-stack magazine. Three pistols, three different calibers, and only the rounds in the magazines. It wasn't a lot, depending on how many others were waiting for us. It dawned on me that this wasn't an attempt on our lives. I dropped the magazine to confirm my suspicions. Blanks. I checked the unconscious man to find a spare magazine with hollow points. I swapped the live bullets for the blanks, cleared the chamber, and sent the live round home. That's more like it. Mac shot a look toward Guido that suggested the actor wasn't supposed to be packing any live ammunition. Guido shrugged. I'm glad you saw it for what it was. 
an interview. Paul rubbed the back of his head and glared at Jenny. Jenny dropped the magazine like a pro and caught it in her free hand. Blanks, I'd say I'm sorry, but I'm not. Jenny crooked her fingers toward him. Spare mag, please? I don't have one, Paul answered. Then you won't mind if I keep this. She stuffed the pistol into her small purse and checked the 380. The first three rounds were blanks, but the rest were live. She reseated the magazine and put the small pistol into her bra. I snickered. Out of pockets, she explained. I opened Guido's briefcase, but it didn't contain a weapon. I stared blankly at its emptiness. But it had been heavy. I knocked with the barrel of the pistol on the outer panel. Kevlar? I guessed. Nice touch, Guido. I decided not to box myself in again. The explanation of an interview didn't mean there weren't others waiting, just in case Jenny and I failed their test. What if we take over each of your organizations and close them down, except for consolidating your assets under our control? I think that sounds like a good plan. I called it North Korean negotiating, where an artificial crisis is created and then used as the baseline for a conversation. Paul winced, holding the back of his head. And once more you bluff. Really, after we just showed you that I don't need a team to eliminate you. I don't understand. Aren't you supposed to run some of the most dangerous organizations operating in North America? You look and sound like a bunch of pretenders. Then it dawned on me. More of a setup. It was a test, but a deadly test where we weren't supposed to win. The man with live rounds threw their plan into disarray. Despite their act, they were sweating. Professionals in my line of work wouldn't be sweating. They also wouldn't be so helpless. Come on, Jenny. These people aren't who they say they are. Whoever paid you for idiots put you into the middle of something where it's highly likely you're going to die. Did you know you signed up for that? The first one to come clean was Philippa. I didn't sign up to die, even though this was a lot of money for a one-day acting gig. A tough guy role. I relished it, but that little thing where you're carrying a cannon with real bullets is a bit off-putting. You're not even from L.A., I told her. Born there, yes, but I live here in Chicago. Come on, Jenny, time to go. It would be best if you four stayed here until we were safely out of the building. Jenny moved toward the door while I came back to the table. With the butt of the forty-five, I crushed the jammer on the conference room table. I backed to the door. Jenny watched the room while I opened the door and scoped the hallway. Stairs, I whispered over my shoulder. I'm sure they're waiting for us. We'll talk later about why. For now, our only job is to get the hell out of this building. Chapter 4 It is the mark of an educated mind to rest satisfied with the degree of precision which the nature of the subject admits, and not to seek exactness where only an approximation is possible. Victor Hugo Sixty-two stories were between us and the great outdoors, or sixty-six if we tried to get to our car. I discounted that option. We only had to get out of the building, catch a taxi, and go somewhere safe like the club. The elevator dinged, sounding that it had arrived, and we ran, stopping at the door to the stairs. Jenny watched the hallway while I opened the door and looked inside. The area was brightly lit. I stepped through as the elevator discharged its two passengers. If an operator had a standard look, these two had it. They looked our way. I yanked Jenny through the door as they flattened themselves against the wall. Pistols appeared in their hands. We dove to the side. I dropped to the decking. Crack the door, I told Jenny. She carefully lifted the handle, then unlocked it since the door opened into the stairwell, and it released the catch. Jenny opened the door enough for me to get my fingers on it. I pulled the door open enough to look out. A bullet slammed into it, waist high. I let go and rolled behind the wall. A second bullet punched through the sheet metal and skipped off the deck where I'd just been. We find ourselves at a disadvantage, Miss Jenny. I stood beside the door, aiming at where someone might open it. Hit them when they come through, Jenny said softly. If that's what they choose to do, they'll regret it. I replied. 
or we could make an expeditious retreat. She nodded toward the next landing. Down is out, but I'd rather not have them riding our back. I think we'll wait them out. Get behind me. I didn't give Jenny any other options. She had little live ammunition. If they came through the door, I needed an unimpeded line of fire. We waited. Twenty seconds. A minute, which stretched to two minutes. Next floor down. They might try to come in behind us. Jenny stepped carefully onto the stairs and tiptoed down. I backed away from the door to the top step and waited, my pistol aimed waist high to give me the least distance to adjust. When it came to close quarters combat, he who landed the first shot was usually the winner. Sending around home meant the second shot could be better aimed. It was a lot harder to return fire after a bullet ripped into your body. Jenny pounded down the last few steps. Door! I almost looked, but a slight click sounded at the door I watched. I backed away another step, keeping my aim steady. The door opened, revealing an arm, but no body and no face. A man stepped into sight. I fired center mass. The forty-five thundered twice in rapid succession within the concrete echo chamber. The man flew backward with one round to his chest and the second lower to the groin. A small pistol sounded from the next floor down. I launched myself to the landing. I hit, spun, and aimed at the open doorway. Jenny stood away from the opening while a man squirmed, his face blackened from a blank round fired at point-blank range. Jenny held the three eighty in her hand. I took aim and fired once, catching him under the chin. The bullet tore upward through his head, the hollow point expanding and shredding. Take his gun. I stabbed a finger at the dead man. I glanced upward and didn't see any movement, but it was time to go. Too many guns were firing. The blasts had to echo across each floor. Down the stairs I went, around the corner, accelerating toward the next landing. Something looked out of place. A shadow and a shine. I jumped up, grabbed the railing, and hauled myself to a stop, keeping my feet off the stair. Jenny nearly ran past me. Wait! She was able to stop easier than I had. I let myself back to the stair and crouched. I ran my finger along it. A thread about one foot up, balanced on attachments above the lowest rail. The wire continued down the vertical support and out of sight beneath the stair. Head on to the 61st floor. We'll cross and use the stairway on the opposite side of the building. Jenny turned and ran the few steps to the doorway. She vaulted over the dead body and into a long hallway. I ran after her, but stopped at the body and searched it quickly for a spare magazine. He had one in an inner pocket of his suit jacket. Nine millimeter. I nudged the body away with my foot and closed the door. I hurried after Jenny, sidling up next to her and slipping her the magazine. We stopped before walking into an open area. She held out the 380 and the second 9 millimeter. I took them one by one, wiped them off, including the magazines, and dropped them into a trash can. Jenny put the spare magazine in her bra. No pockets, she said. Why would you wear clothes with no pockets? How many times do I have to educate you when it comes to women's clothes? Jenny shook her head. We talked with our heads close, but we both looked elsewhere for anyone who might be coming or going. We need to keep going. I nodded toward the open area beyond the end of the corridor. Jenny took my hand and we strolled through like we belonged there, not making eye contact with the two people we saw crouched in their cubicles, but still keeping them centered in our peripheral vision. The other stairwell came as a pleasant surprise when we arrived without incident. The elevator dinged from down the hallway and we both jumped. I opened the door more quickly than I should have to find a young, athletic woman standing there. The quick opening worked to our benefit as it caught her off guard, but only for an instant. I reached for her, and she turned, lashing out with a foot. I blocked it with my forearms braced before my head, followed by a backhand toward her face. She withdrew her foot and tried a high kick followed by aiming for my knee. She was fast, faster than I was, but I had her by fifty pounds. I danced close, removing her advantage of speed. I caught a handful of her shirt and shouldered her off the landing. I pushed as she started to fall. The young woman went over backward. 
and I took one step down to keep her from getting too far from me. Jenny followed me through the door and closed it behind her. I took aim for when the woman bounced to her feet, but she did not. She landed with a crunch, and her head twisted to an odd angle. As she rolled over, a heavy click set my internal alarms screaming. I turned and wrapped Jenny in my arms. The explosion sent shrapnel and smoke up and down the staircase. Fire surged across my back, but quickly subsided. Get out, I grunted. Jenny opened the door and fell through. One last look behind me confirmed the stairwell was destroyed. We weren't getting out that way. We found six employees staring at us when we emerged from a cloud of smoke billowing from the stairs behind us until the door closed and cut it off. The air cleared almost immediately as the smoke was sucked into the overhead vents. Steps are gone, I told them. Is the elevator working? The elevator always works, a young, almost anorexically thin man replied. What happened in the stairway? Excellent that the elevator works, I replied and straightened. It didn't hurt as badly as I initially thought. Jenny draped my arm over her shoulders. I hadn't thought I needed help, but a low level of pain pulsed across my back. I appear to have caught some shrapnel, I muttered. Did a plane fly into us? Is the building going to collapse? The young man asked in a cascade of words with wide eyes and flushing skin. No, I laughed my answer. Nothing so extreme. Somebody playing a trick that went wildly awry. Nothing more. But it did take out a couple flights of stairs. Why do you have guns? There are no guns allowed in this building, an older woman stated and crossed her arms. Then only the bad guys will have guns. We're here to protect you from the bad guys. You know, the kind that blow up stairways. Why didn't you take the elevator? The young man suggested. I glanced toward the bank of elevators where the light above each door flashed. The call panel had an error message that was too far away to read. I suggest they are out of order. Is there any way you can see to that? I looked at the young man. He was momentarily alarmed and then nodded tightly. He backed away slowly before turning and disappearing behind a half wall blocking a series of cubicles. Jenny caught my eye. I saw something I had only seen once before. Fear. We had been trapped on the top two floors of the tower, with actors pretending to be our competition in the hitman space, and actual assassins trying to kill us. It was far-fetched, but our reality had raced beyond our control. I don't like this either, I whispered into her ear, because I didn't see a way out. They'd had time to plan this. We were reacting, not acting. We were not in control of any part of this situation. I need to make a call. I moved closer to the window and dialed Gladys's phone number. She answered on the first ring. It was a setup. Send backup. Anyone you can get here right now. Clear a path to the 61st floor and get us out of here. How many are you up against? Unknown. We've neutralized three. At least now we're armed. Of course you are. I will call as soon as I have something. Jenny looked over the five remaining employees who were keeping their distance from us. Is there a first aid kit? On the wall between the bathrooms, a middle-aged woman said. Follow me. She looked at the others and then walked slowly away. She stopped when she realized Jenny wasn't following. Were any of them armed? The best I could come up with was probably not, which wasn't the epitome of my professional game. They weren't dressed in clothing that would conceal a firearm. Plus, Jenny and I were obviously packing, as they'd already noted. We had established ourselves as the good guys, the survivors of the stair explosion. I recommend no one take the other stairway either. It's rigged, too. They looked at me oddly. How would you know that? We saw the tripwire and decided to take the north stairway, but they were waiting for us. Why would anyone be waiting for you? Why would they be willing to blow up a building to get you? They started to back away. So much for cementing our position as the good guys. Do you all know each other? Jenny asked. They nodded. That's good. The bad guys are out there. We came here to expose them. Gangsters. Criminals of the worst sort. Who else would blow up a building to get at someone? You know they're not the authorities. 
new people will have to be suspect because they may be working for the wrong side. What is the right side? Jenny smiled and pointed at me. He is, and he's injured. You were showing me to the first aid kit? She looked to the middle-aged woman a few steps away. We can get him patched up enough to get ourselves out of here. You're taking us with you, aren't you? The middle-aged woman asked. That was something neither Jenny nor I had contemplated. Gaining an entourage wasn't the best way to stay out of the limelight. Of course. Leave no one behind, isn't that the Marine's mantra? Jenny asked. She realized what she'd done the second my eyes shot wide. I suggest that everyone shelter in place until we can clear the building. We made our way to a short hallway with the restrooms. The first aid kit was behind a glass panel with a break in case of emergency label. But there was nothing to break the glass with. Our entourage had grown back to six, and as one, they flinched when I brandished my pistol. The glass broke easily, as it was designed to do. The best we could find inside the first aid kit was gauze and medical tape. Do your best, I told Miss Jenny. I stuffed the pistol into my waistband and removed my shirt. I had a few scars, but I was in the best shape of my life. Despite our life on the beach, we worked out every single day. The women raised their eyebrows. Jenny tried not to smirk. I can't believe you even felt this. These are barely scratches, Jenny said. She dabbed antibacterial on before putting the gauze over top and taping it down. If you sweat, the bandage will probably come off, so don't sweat. No sweat. Got it. I shrugged back into my shirt, but I had to admit the likelihood. I'm probably going to sweat. I know, Jenny replied. Some things are immutable. Gonna need a new shirt, I added. But I'll wear this one, for now, that is. We checked the elevators, which were still out of order, before moving to the north stairwell, the first one we had used. I thought you said there was a bomb in there. The older lady pointed with a shaking finger. There is. We'll need you all to stay here while we clear the stairway. Help will come for you. We couldn't have them trailing after us. Our fellows in the trade had proven they were willing to do whatever it took, sacrifice anyone or anything to get to us. Taking them into the stairway with us would have put them at a risk they weren't ready for. I didn't want to see any of them die. They were everyday people doing everyday things. These were the people I was trying to protect by means of the Peace Archive. That meant we had to go it alone. You're going to abandon us, the young man said, ignoring the clarification that Jenny and I were going into a volatile area. We're going to protect you. We've already been in two gunfights in the stairwells. There could be more. I don't think these other people, we'll call them the bad guys, care about collateral damage. They'll kill you without a second thought just to get to us. What kind of horrific people are you? The young man pressed. We're the kind who take bullets so you don't have to. You were in the Marines, the young man pressed. I thought I heard. The middle-aged woman looked for clarification. She sought anything to give her some semblance of understanding. Why was this happening and who could they trust? I was. Semper Fi, good people of the 61st floor. We'll be on our way now. If anyone shows up demanding information about us, tell them the truth. We're descending the north stairs until we get to the ground floor, and then we're calling the police to clear the building. Someone will come for you, I promised. I was sure it wouldn't be us. The door operated with a push bar, opening into the stairwell because that was the rapid egress if there was a fire. People stampeding off the floor couldn't get trapped on their floor. I pushed in the bar and, using my toe, nudged the door open a crack to look for a shadow or movement. I ducked my head quickly into the gap and back. There was nothing in the immediate opening. I kicked the door open, looking over the sights on my pistol, but there was no one inside. I opened the door far enough to peek through the crack by the hinges to make sure there was no one hiding behind the door, but again, the space was clear. I moved through the door and eased to the left, my back against the wall. I scanned the area for movement. The instant Jenny stepped through, a pistol appeared from above in the crack between the stairs. I adjusted aim and fired. Jenny ducked back. The pistol fell, clunking down the stairs below, the hand holding it yanked out of sight. I wasn't sure what I had hit, the pistol, the hand, or neither. 
I took the lead down the stairs to where the tripwire stretched from one side to the other. We can't leave it here. Those people are afraid and could stumble through the trap, Jenny said. I was never EOD, explosive ordnance disposal. I'm not sure what I'm doing. Jenny nodded. You know enough to make sure no one else trips over it. Hold this end and make sure it doesn't move. I pointed to the side that turned to end somewhere under the stairs. I unwrapped the wire from its end point, then tied it at the side where Jenny held it. I tightened it until it took the pressure off her fingers. She let go. There was no movement. We didn't hurry down the stairs. Jenny watched our backs while I looked for more trip wires. I picked up the dropped pistol when we passed the 60th floor. Between this exit and the next landing, the underneath of the staircase above should have been the inverse of what we could see from the top, but it wasn't. It was sealed and flat, made from the same non-skid metal as the steps. Somewhere in there were the explosives, but without a ladder and tools, there would be no getting to the device. I slowed to a crawl. An explosion would be as effective up as it would be down. When we were a floor above, it did a number on us. My ears were still ringing. Being beneath it when it exploded would be a death sentence. I hurried downward, 59th, 58th, and my hope for a quick exit started to improve. At the next floor, the stairs were blocked by a construction sign, scaffolding, and canvas drop cloths. We couldn't get through the scaffolding. The door out looked unpresuming, identical to the doors on every other level. Jenny kept her eye and aim on the drop cloths scattered around the construction area in case someone was trying to hide. I pulled the door open, a little at a time, crouching on the platform to stay below any watcher's line of sight. I removed the bullets from the 10 millimeter pistol and tucked it under a tarp covering more scaffolding. And to the fray, once more we weighed. I stepped through the open door. Chapter 5 I no doubt deserved my enemies, but I don't believe I deserved my friends. Walt Whitman The door to the 58th floor opened to show a layout dominated by small offices with plaques testifying to the importance, or lack thereof, of the individual within. Internal offices were wood, while the outer offices had glass walls to allow a view past the busy executives. A maze of short hallways afforded visibility of the city in three of the cardinal directions. Unlike the 61st floor, this one was hopping, caught in the middle of a busy workday. Sometimes it was best to join a crowd and hide within the anonymity of a sea of faces. We strolled in as we did, our weapons tucked where they wouldn't be seen. Jenny's was in her purse and mine was in the back of my waistband. I could use a new shirt, as my current one was shredded across the back. That wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for the blood stains. Then again, looking like you'd been attacked by a bear was in vogue, wasn't it? I had seen plenty of younger people wearing the fashion with relative arrogance. I wasn't the young guy anymore. Into my thirties and in the best shape of my life, but I was an executive. I need another shirt. I whispered to Jenny while we held hands and walked in a random direction. We passed the bank of elevators to find they were showing an error with a note to use the stairs for an emergency. These people were screwed if there was an emergency. In my mind, it didn't get any worse. People with guns running around willy-nilly. I laughed at my own humor. Two of those people were us. I agree. New shirt. Maybe one of these fine office dwellers has a spare in their closet. Why don't you stay here and I'll check? My lip twitched with the thought of Jenny going one way while I went another. We shouldn't split up. The south stairs are blocked below this level and the north stairs above. Can't swing a dead cat without hitting bad guys. Jenny frantically looked around. Do you have a feeling? Nothing more than thinking it's what I would do. Keep your eyes peeled. They might not know what we look like. Getting a shirt is first order of business. Let's see if someone my size is in. Jenny took a deep breath, in through her nose and out through her mouth. She stretched her neck and then dug in her purse, past the pistol, to pull out a couple hundred dollar bills. 
I didn't question her tactics. She seemed to have a game plan. I could use some rush, I whispered, longing for music to calm my mind. Shh. Jenny focused on the task at hand. We walked past the first pair of offices. Stylish, oak-looking wood rose to waist height, and the rest of the false wall was glass. A man on his phone. A slight woman focused on her computer. An empty office. The fourth office held promise. A man about my size, but with a slight paunch, looked up from his computer to catch Jenny's sparkling green eyes. She smiled at him, and he waved. Jenny opened the door and helped herself inside, closing it behind her before I could enter. I stood with my back to the door. She would have to handle him if he turned out to be an enemy. I couldn't watch him and the rest of the office. I listened carefully. Jenny's voice was slightly muffled, but I made out her play. Would you have a spare shirt? My boyfriend and I had quite the session upstairs, and his shirt got a little ripped. The blood was an unfortunate byproduct. Did you know that there's a corner of the 61st floor where no one goes, and there's only a handful of people up there right now? He laughed. The 61st floor, huh? I think I'd get fired if I tried to drag a secretary up there. Sure, I have a spare shirt. I think we all do. Sometimes the sun comes through those windows and bakes us like we're in a microwave. He took out a pink floral pattern. Jenny snorted. He's going to love that. But word to the wise, make sure it's the secretary who drags you up there, and then make an honest woman of her. I glanced over my shoulder to see Jenny toss the money on his desk. What's this for? A shirt as stylish as this one had to cost a pretty penny. Replace it in kind, and I thank you greatly. We're still in that phase of our relationship where we can't get enough of each other. It's pretty fantastic. Just hearing that there's still that kind of passion in the world is enough for me. Take your money. It's no good here. How long have you worked here? Jenny asked. Two years. Why? Have there been any strangers in here lately, especially today? Jenny pressed. This is a busy office. We get lots of strangers. I myself have an appointment in half an hour with a rep from Bolton Bank. Hopefully the elevators will be working by then. Steps are out of order, too. There's a little bit of a challenge getting to the ground floor right now. We're only trying to leave after a meeting on the top floor. Those are nice conference rooms. Expensive, but they make a great impression, don't they? We were duly impressed, Jenny conceded. You can always use the freight elevator in the back. They keep the door unlocked because the cleaning staff are in and out so much. My company pays extra to keep this place spotless. You're getting your money's worth. Thanks for the shirt. My man will wear it with pride. Appropriately so, the junior executive replied. Jenny returned to the hallway and handed me the shirt. This won't draw any attention. I made a sour face while examining my new shirt. Jenny shrugged. Have I told you lately how much I love you? I said softly. Because I do. Now let's hit the head so I can get rid of this rag and dude up in my groovy new threads. Please don't, Jenny said, wincing while trying to stifle a laugh. But she was a professional and didn't dwell on looking at me. She kept her eyes moving, as did I. This way. I nodded toward where the bathrooms had been on the floor above. I figured they would repeat the floor plan. They were right where I expected. If someone flushes on the top floor, they'll hear it pass at terminal velocity. Will not. It's not a multi-floor outhouse, Jenny replied. Sometimes I swear you're such a man. I'm pretty sure I can't be anyone but me. Good thing. Being someone else sounds exhausting. I checked the stalls to confirm that I was alone. I moved into the handicapped stall and changed shirts. I ripped the bloody section off my shirt and stuffed it into my trouser pocket like a hanky. No need giving authorities more DNA than necessary. I hurried into the corridor, instantly alarmed at not seeing Miss Jenny. I rushed one way and then the other. Jenny popped out of the family bathroom. Should have just gone in here. I shook my head. That would have been the optimal solution. Let's find that freight elevator. Strangers? No need for them to see us walking around looking lost, I replied. On the way toward what we thought was the back, a corner office stood out. 
The sign on it read, Freddie J. Mac. Would the real Freddie Mac please stand up? Jenny quipped before getting confused. But Guido set this up. Guido, Freddie Mac, are any of them real? We have to assume everything we were told upstairs is a lie. Maybe the names are solid, but are they names of people in charge of our peer companies? No one was inside Freddie's office. I leaned on the door handle, but it was locked. Good thing. I would have been tempted to go inside, but every person on the floor would have seen me. I settled for looking through the window for a family picture, but the two picture frames on the oversized desk had their back to the door. The desk was angled across the corner, facing the door, and Freddie Mac would have his back to the windows nearly 800 feet above the concrete streets below. Unlike the movies, we couldn't see the reflection in the window to see what was in the pictures. The real world operated with less fidelity. We'd have to do without the information. When we stepped away, we were intercepted. Attractive, at the start of middle age. She looked like an executive. I'm Mr. Mac's secretary. Did you have an appointment? No, sorry. We had hoped to catch him. We had a meeting upstairs and thought since the opportunity presented itself, we'd take advantage. Shame he's not here. Upstairs? He had a meeting on the top floor, too. You didn't see him there? The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, but they were covered by my pink floral shirt. Didn't change the fact that this woman was in on the charade. And if it wasn't a charade, what the hell was going on? They'd already blown up one stairwell with the ability to blow up a second. Three men were dead, too, and others injured. If it was a game, it was a deadly one and something I didn't relish playing. The main elevators seemed to be out of service. We'll just take the stairs, Jenny lied. She was onto the woman, too. Jenny pointed the opposite direction that we wanted to go. Can you tell him that Guido and Philippa stopped by? She stared at me. Those aren't your names. I think we should have a private conversation, I interjected. If you'd be so kind as to come with us, we'd appreciate it. I have no intention of coming with you. Jenny moved sideways so we could bracket the woman. She looked fit. Was she also an operator or just an astute manager like Gladys? The woman retreated until she could put her back up against the windows of Freddie Mac's office. Looks like we're going to have a problem, I started. We're here to have a reasonable conversation. We're not here to make trouble. We didn't start this, whatever this is. We're only trying to leave. Let us go, and that will be the end of it. I'm afraid not. Are you counting on backup from someone nearby? I wondered. While Jenny watched, I scanned the offices, looking for anyone taking an interest in our conversation. I couldn't mark an individual, but there had to be someone. By dragging the secretary along with us, we'd force their hand. But did we want to? She had made us. If we left her alone, she would call down the thunder right on our heads. We had no choice. You're coming with us, lovely lady. I... She didn't get the chance to complete her refusal of our kind offer. Jenny rabbit punched her in the throat. The secretary clutched at her windpipe, gasping for air. I took one arm and Jenny took the other as we hurried her on the shortest route possible toward the back. The young executive we got the shirt from intercepted us. Can I ask where you're taking Miss Delaney? She's choking on a bad sandwich. We're going to get her downstairs where we'll find help. It seems your average phone doesn't work on this floor. He stayed where he was, despite our edging toward him. Maybe you can help us? I asked. The temperature seemed to be rising, or maybe I was starting to feel the heat. Despite Jenny's concerns, I could feel the first drip of sweat run down my back and into the gauze loosely taped over my wounds. Looks like we have another problem, I said out the side of my mouth. Not just one, my good man. That shirt looks horrible on you. That's at least two. I forced an uncomfortable laugh. It could be worse. The stairs could be blown up and there's no way out of here. For either of us. The recognition reflected in his eyes an instant before I had my pistol shoved into his midsection, standing close to him to hide it from prying eyes. You're going with us, too. Back up slowly, or you'll be the first to die. Well, the fourth, if we're counting. Or is it the fifth? Fourth, dear, 
They're dropping like flies, it seems. Jenny was being more antagonistic than I'd ever seen her before. She was afraid, and that made her angry. We were trapped. Every step was going to come at a price, and that price would be in blood. Chapter 6 It is hard to imagine a more stupid or more dangerous way of making decisions than by putting those decisions in the hands of people who pay no price for being wrong. Thomas Sowell I've had about enough of this, I growled in the young man's face. I don't care how good you think you are. You're about two seconds from death. I've had enough of you, too. And you know what? We're trading shirts. The young man raised an eyebrow, hesitating just long enough for me to knee him in the groin, catching him by surprise. I was braced enough to fend off his feeble counterattack. I grabbed him by the back of the collar and dragged him bodily away, even though I was starting to question the existence of a freight elevator. Outside of the 61st floor, everyone we ran into seemed to be working for one of our peers. They saw themselves as our competitors. The fact that they were trying to kill us made them more than competitors. It made them enemies. Jenny pulled the still gasping secretary toward the back. We found the break room with a surprised employee stopping mid-bite on a hoagie. Where's the freight elevator? What freight elevator? The young woman asked. You're not even sorry, are you? I knuckle-punched the man in the temple. The blown upstairs, hurry. We yanked the two nearly off their feet in our rush from the break room. We passed another room, which was labeled for housekeeping. You don't think... It was open, and inside we found racks of cleaning chemicals and the service elevator, not quite a freight elevator. I hit the young man hard, hard enough to knock him out. I locked the door behind us by punching the button in. Not the best form of protection, but it would keep outsiders from interrupting for the moment. I tapped the call button, and it lit up. Looks like we're getting out of here. I stripped off the man's shirt, tore mine free, put his on, and buttoned up the light blue houndstooth. It was a better look for me. It wasn't vanity that made me take it, but it was a combat victory, taking a prize from the vanquished foe. A ding announced the arrival of the car. Jenny and I stood aside. I pulled my pistol. The secretary fought to get free, getting enough air through her bruised throat to energize herself. Jenny had one hand on the pistol to keep it away from the woman's grasping fingers. The door opened, and two men rushed into the small space of the cleaning storage room. They didn't lead with weapons, so I lashed out at the first one and caught him with a left cross. The second man dodged to the side, heading for Jenny and the secretary. I aimed and fired. The hand cannon belched fire and thundered in the small space, nearly exploding our ears. A huge blood splatter appeared on the wall behind the man. He continued forward until he fell into the secretary and slumped to the floor. Jenny turned 180 degrees, bringing her knee into the woman's midsection. The secretary doubled over, and Jenny hammered the back of her head with the butt of the 9 millimeter. The secretary crumpled like a fitted sheet. Jenny dashed after me into the elevator. I punched the button for the ground floor. The doors closed, and it started to descend. After two floors, it slowed to a stop. Jenny and I dodged out of sight as the door slowly opened. A face ducked in quickly to look and then pulled back out. I bull rushed the man, bringing my pistol up to hit him under the chin. He started to go down, grabbing my arms to drag me with him. A second man tried to duck out of the way. I fired but missed because my opponent gripped my forearms. Jenny came through the door with her pistol raised. The second man should have known there were two of us, but he fixated on the other fight in the room. Jenny didn't hesitate. She fired twice, a double tap aimed center mass. He went down, but the lack of blood suggested he was wearing body armor. It didn't matter. A bullet fired from that close was like getting hit by a jackhammer. He'd be unable to function for a while, long enough for us to continue to the ground floor. Jenny smacked my man in the head while I was trying to break free from his grip. His fingers relaxed and he fell, unconscious. Back in. Let's get out of here. We dove back into the elevator before the doors closed, but no matter which button I pushed, it wouldn't light up. 
The door was still open because the elevator was frozen. This sucks, Jenny said what was on my mind. We'd been served a crap sandwich under the guise of trying to make peace. Maybe we need to be more dangerous than them. I think we need to start killing these people. Take care with what you say, Ian. Jenny's chin fell to her chest and she stared at the floor. She was exhausted, mentally and emotionally, from the engagement that had no end in sight. It started fast and only got faster. We'll get caught by the police and charged with being mass murderers. You are right, of course. We need to get out of here without doing any more damage. I thought for a moment. And we can't call Jimmy to get us out of this one either because we were meeting with some unsavory types to talk business. We need to leave a reason for the cops to look elsewhere. This isn't just a goal to make it out alive, because if they find us afterwards, our lives are over. This is much more, and I don't have the answer. We may have to blow up the whole building. I wouldn't recommend that. We can't kill innocent people. I was talking the plot of Die Hard, but it didn't work out for Hans Gruber, so it probably won't work out for us either. Best Christmas movie ever, Jenny said. Time to go? Let's see if the 56th floor is our lucky number. We might be below construction work. I suggest we try the south stairs. We'll check these two first. We patted them down. The first had a pistol with extra magazines. Jenny emptied the pistol and took the 9mm ammunition, almost filling her purse. My guy had a 357 Magnum. I took it and three speed loader clips. It wasn't optimal. Six shots before having to reload... In an extended firefight, a revolver wasn't a great deal of help, but in case I needed to shoot through a wall, it would come in handy. The 45's hollow points were good for soft targets like people, but would come apart when passing through solid objects. If we ran across law enforcement, we were screwed. We had killed only people who were armed. Proving that they attacked us first would be almost impossible. The only witnesses were dead, and the trail of bodies behind us suggested we were the most dangerous people in the building. We walked casually to the southern stairs to find them open. The scaffolding and construction ended on the landing halfway to the 57th floor. Jenny leaned against the door to block it while I checked the stairs carefully to avoid any booby traps. I wondered how far they could have cordoned off the upper levels of the building. How could they do that unless only our enemies populated the upper floors? That would be expensive. There were much easier ways to remove competitors, like in the parking garage after we arrived. They knew exactly where our vehicle was. It made no sense to me. Maybe they wanted to see what we were made of first. If they could have taken over the Peace Archive, how would things have turned out? The four leaders were still actors. Or were they? They were nonplussed at the rapid delivery of violence, but had been sweating. Actors might be good, but they would still show emotion when people were getting killed right in front of them. The sweat was probably that we would figure it out. The double twist. We need to get back up to the top floor, check in with our hosts. They're actors. I'm starting to think that they're not. They're coordinating this nightmare, and if we can expose them, we can walk away from all of this. How do we get upstairs? Jenny asked pointedly. It had been a convoluted route to descend a mere six flights. According to my calculations, we're trapped. I clenched my fists in frustration. Then we go down. Let's get out of here. I waved Jenny to join me the second I reached the landing. She hurried after me and put her back against the wall, watching the door behind us. The 55th floor was a mass of cubicles, just like the 54th floor. When we were on the landing above the 53rd floor... We found our next obstacle, the heavy tread of booted feet coming up the stairs. To me, it sounded like an army or a full SWAT team, maybe a brigade of firefighters. I expected the worst. Go, I whispered harshly, slashing my hand toward the door at the level behind us. Jenny shot through without checking first. I bolted after her, but this was a cubicle farm filled with people. The din of them all talking simultaneously was like walking into a wave on the beach. Jenny straightened to block sight of me coming through the door, but she made it look casual. I thought I looked nonchalant. 
I tended to be the worst judge of how I looked. I liked to think I was confident. The world looked different to one who sought to master its nuances. Those who rode the rapids were subject to the river's whims. We continued to react. We need to get to the top floor. Service elevator? Jenny suggested. Exactly. Maybe the operation down here will override the lockout on the 58th. We passed the bank of regular elevators. The call screen flashed out of order. Begs the question, are they broken or just locked out? Jenny wondered. Where would the elevator control center be? If authorities are already here or reinforcements for our four fellow organizations, then how many of our people are we willing to sacrifice on our behalf? It was a hard question that I already knew the answer to. I called Gladys. Stand down the additional help. The situation has changed. You've been a great help, Gladys. We'll call back when we have more clarity. I hung up once Gladys confirmed she'd heard the message. We're cut off, Jenny whispered. We were cut off before, but now we're not putting anyone else at risk. I briefly side-hugged Miss Jenny. Now, let's get this thing done. There are four people who used to be on the top floor who have a lot to answer for. Chapter 7 Yesterday is not ours to recover, but tomorrow is ours to win or lose. Lyndon B. Johnson We never made it to the cleaning room with the service elevator. It's about time you got here, a pencil-necked manager said to us. The elevator is out. The stairs were blocked on one side. It was rather tortuous getting here, but we're glad to have made it, I replied, having no idea what the man wanted from us. Your cubicles are over there, with logins and everything you need to get started. He pointed in a general direction, looking us up and down, and hurried away. What do we do? Jenny whispered. We better log in and get started. If we can be who they were expecting, then we can fly under the radar until the elevators return to function. The four upstairs will have to wait. And yes, I understand that they may escape. Hide in plain sight. I whispered. Maybe they'll assume we've exited the building by now, Jenny said hopefully. I wasn't so sure, but if we could hide in a crowd, maybe there was hope to get out of this. We walked quickly in the direction the manager had indicated until we found the two empty cubicles. Jenny took one and I the other, the one with its back toward the windows. I figured a threat would come from the other direction. We found the yellow stickies attached to the monitor with logins and passwords handwritten. Mine was guest 1 rockstein 50 4, and the password was guest 1 rockstein don't write this down. Jenny and I made faces at each other. I assumed she was guest 2. It didn't matter. We found the instructions for our positions when we logged in. I skimmed mine at first, but decided I'd better put on a good face. It was absolutely the most boring crap I could ever think of. Match account numbers and names between two incompatible systems. That was it. I scrolled the lists. There were thousands of entries. Jenny looked at me with wide eyes and mouth open. She turned around and kicked off to roll her chair across the aisle to get to my cubicle. She studied my list. These look the same. You start with A, and I'll start with Z. Somewhere around M, we should meet for glorious champagne and sex. She punched me in the shoulder before rolling into the aisle. She scanned the work area before leaning in my direction and whispering, I see dead people. Stop it. You'll make me pee myself. I did my best to stifle a laugh. There was no way I wanted to get fired from a job I was never hired for in the first place. I had my standards to uphold. We better get to it. We have a couple hours until lunch. Can we get it done by then? Jenny shrugged. She seemed to be less enthused about the job than I, but we both dug in, sorting and matching. The job was easier with two monitors. I established a rhythm in the copy-paste to deliver the data from one screen and system into the second screen by account number. It could have been the most mind-numbing work I'd ever done. 
which meant it gave me time to think. The floor was a den of activity, but no one came our way, and most importantly, we blended in. We were in a difficult situation, still reacting. We had no idea where the other operators were and who they worked for. Were the heads of the organizations here, or were they stand-ins? I figured at least Freddie Mac was the real person, because his people were in place on the 58th floor. He could put individual infiltrators on each floor, but he couldn't maintain the tens of millions of annual dollars it cost to fill the top floors of the tower. Where were the McManus brothers for whom the tower was named? So many questions. Some didn't matter. Others were critical to our survival. The young manager came by to check on our work. Making sure we're earning our keep, I asked. Just like to make sure my employees aren't goofing off. You know the deal. Give them an inch and they think they're rulers. It's madness. Employees need an alpha male to keep them in line. He jammed his fists into his hips. Jenny could have broken him in half without breaking a sweat. I couldn't let it go. Do you really think that? I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. I turned in my seat and crossed my arms. I think we're about halfway finished with our tasks, but I suggest you stow that intimidating alpha male personality. All you have to do is ask and make sure the employees agree on the job that needs to be done. When people have the same vision, it's amazing what they can do. Micromanaging or trying to intimidate them is the least effective way to get the job done. I stood and waved across the sea of cubicles. You know who knows how best to do their jobs? Don't say they do. You know the right answer, but deny it. Ask them what they need to do their jobs better. They'll tell you. Make sure they have a goal they can reach each day and leave them alone. You'll get the job done and you won't be alpha mailing all over the place. If someone has to tell you they're an alpha male, I left the last bit hanging. Here we were fighting for our lives. We'd already killed four, maybe five people that morning, and Tweedledum was trying to intimidate me. I could have splattered his head across the floor and would have been cheered for it. He only had the power of employment at his command, and little did he know, I didn't work there. You wouldn't be in this job if you didn't have a unique skill. What is it? Leadership, of course. I have an MBA from Northwestern. I stared at him. Did you attend the courses? Because I don't think they teach intimidation at Kellogg, because it's not effective. That's a good school. You should be proud of your education. You also should use that education. Who do you think you are? You are a lackey, nothing more. It's okay to be a lackey, I replied. It's not okay to remind someone of that fact. Maybe you should go now. I gestured with my chin. Get your work done and get out of here. Present your time card upon departure. He tried to loom over me. You're hiding from an army of contract killers and law enforcement, I reminded myself. No problem, Mr. Alpha. I wanted to punch him in the face so bad that my lips started to twitch. He stormed away. Jenny winked at me and mouthed the words, Good job. If I were playing a role to get close to a target, that was one thing. Hiding was a big part of my job, but only when I was driving the train. Reaction was harder and higher risk than action. I took a deep breath and turned back to my screen, soon to be lost within the copy-paste back and forth while keeping one eye on the aisle and the elevators at the end. As soon as they were operational, we'd be making a run for it. Jenny glanced around the cubicle farm, too, keeping her eyes peeled for anyone who watched them, but the people kept their heads down because they didn't want to get on the wrong side of the so-called alpha male. I wrapped up my work at N in the alphabet, and Jenny finished with M. I acted out, dusting my hands off, to find the young manager strolling toward me. How serendipitous, I called to him cheerfully. We're finished. Anything else we can do you out of before running our timesheets up the chain? I saw that you finished. A spot check suggested your work was adequate. Two hours in a cubicle, and not a single person strolled our floor. I was starting to think that we were free and clear. It was time to leave. The young manager's hesitation gave me the opening I needed. If the elevators are operational, we'll be on our way. 
I dragged a sleeve across the keyboard, mouse, and desktop. Thank you. Think about what I said. You'll be better for it. I have. It's hard to get past the lazy bastards who get jobs in here. You two are a breath of fresh air, although a bit lippy. I laughed until I ended with a nod. When you lead by intimidation, people will do the minimum possible to stop the pain. This is a house that you've built. We don't need this job. We were just trying to help. As such, we're not even going to bill you for our work. Nobody does that. We just did. I'll send an invoice if I hear you giving grief to our fellow cave dwellers. Call it an advance on your new productivity. And one more thing. I crooked a finger conspiratorially. He leaned close. I hate bureaucrats and little people. Don't make me pound you into next week. You should tuck in that shirt. It makes you look like a slob when you are clearly not, the man replied as his response to his comeuppance. Thank you for your kind words but I'll leave it out. I get hot, you see. I only cared that he didn't see the forty-five stuffed into my waistband. The elevator dinged. That's our cue, Cletus. We'll be on our way. My name's not Cletus, the young man shot back. How would we know? You never introduced yourself, Alpha Man. I tipped my finger to my brow in a mock salute. Jenny and I turned at the first intersection the instant we saw who walked through the elevator doors. It was the man and woman from the 58th floor who we'd left on the floor. They looked rough. The woman sported a swollen eye, and the man walked gingerly with a hand to his chest. I wouldn't have worried, but they were followed by two newcomers, younger and looking far more fit. Were they smarter? I didn't care about that. The two who would recognize us would soon be trolling the cubicles, followed closely by their muscle. We crouched and walked faster toward the back, where the service elevator was located. We had to wait at the last intersection for them to pass us going the other way. Once clear, we shot through on our way to the cleaning room, which we found locked. No amount of cajoling would open it. We needed to find the manager, but he would be engaged with the four newcomers. Maybe he had seen them before. Probably seen them. They might even know each other. The more I thought about it, the worse I made it seem. We followed the service hallway to the far side of the elevators, closer to the north stairs. We looked for the foursome of doom, but they weren't in sight. I walked softly into the elevator area, tapped the call button to go up, and walked away. Jenny raised an eyebrow at me. I think they're still on the top floor. The plan hasn't changed. They're scumbags and need me to tell them that. Are you going to kill them? Probably. Once the police figure out who they are, they won't dig too deeply, I wouldn't think. It's a gang hit. Let us reprobates kill each other. The elevator sounded its arrival. I waited until the doors were closing to slide across the floor and stuff my hand into the diminishing opening. The door reversed course. I moved inside and stood out of sight. Jenny followed my lead, staying low to dive in. I hammered the button to close the doors, pulling my pistol with my other hand and taking aim. Jenny saw what I did and nodded grimly. She reached into her purse and removed her 9 millimeter. The doors finished closing, and the elevator started to climb. I sighed in relief. That was one obstacle down. I'll go left when we reach the top floor, and you go right. Pistols out? Jenny asked. I thought for a moment. You're right. Tucked away, hand on the grip. There's no way they can be expecting us and I can't believe it took them two hours to get to the 54th floor. Maybe those four are the only ones left, Jenny offered. I like how you think. I braced myself as the elevator aligned with the exit doors and opened. We bolted out as soon as the doors were open far enough. I went left into an empty hallway, and Jenny went right. She stopped in the middle, covering my back while I strolled to the conference room where the four organization leaders sat with plates from a freshly delivered lunch cart. Jenny, I called over my shoulder. All eyes were on me. I removed my pistol and held it loosely by my side. Jenny joined me as I opened the door and walked in. You are digging yourselves deeper graves, I said. I'm not here to bluster or play nice. You're here to kill us. 
but you feel compelled to make some earth-shattering speech. Go ahead, Mr. Ian Bragg. Say your piece. Well, you could listen, because that's the only way you'll get out of here alive, Guido said. You guys are making my head spin. We kill you, and then the four lackeys you have on a floor-to-floor search. Then we walk out of here. That's a way, but you'll have the police climbing up your butt the second you hit the front door, Guido countered. Which makes me think the police are completely unaware of what's going on in the tower. There should be a body right there. I pointed at the spot where I had last seen one of their hitmen. But there's no evidence anyone died here. Good on you and your cleanup crew. I'm thinking the trail of bodies we left behind us has also mysteriously disappeared. That means there is no one waiting for us, since no one knows anyone has been killed. The explosion in the stairwell seems to not have phased anyone. We know, and our people know, Freddie Mac replied. Your secretary got herself punched in the head, Jenny added. Sorry about that. She glanced at Paul. Here's our offer, Guido started. There isn't enough room for all of us. We've devised a little game where the winner walks away with all the marbles. The loser gets carried away. I looked at Jenny. She shook her head. There we have it. The boss doesn't want to play your game. We're going to have to bow out. Out. That is the key word. Playing our game is the only way out of this building without wearing handcuffs, Freddie Mac explained. We control all aspects of what goes on in this building, and this is how it's going to be. I didn't feel that I had any choice but to play along. It bordered on insanity, but when it came to determining a top dog in the assassination game, a head-to-head contest was one way to do it. The worst way. How do you envision this going? I asked. Freddy continued. There are four pairs of operators. With you two... That makes five pairs vying for primacy. The last ones alive walk out of here with no one following them. Also, the last one out takes over the other's organizations as the top player. The winner may choose to keep the others as deputies or invite them to leave the country. We've agreed to these terms. You will agree too. Your confident will say yes. We can shoot our way out. With nothing but a pile of dead bodies, the police won't have much to go on. Four leaders of nefarious organizations die in a hail of bullets. They'll make a movie of your demise. I don't think they will, Guido said. Gentlemen, can you hear me? We can, a voice said from a speaker that I couldn't see. Chapter 8 You Cannot Have a Positive Life and a Negative Mind Joyce Meyer So you've got your boys scattered around the tower waiting to ambush us. I was stalling, trying to think through our next play. I wanted to get in front. Being hunted by eight operators within a confined space wasn't my idea of a good time. Whenever we have a contract, we know what the target looks like. We need to see pictures of the eight soon-to-be-dead operators. Although I wasn't a fan of bluster, I was confident that I was one of the best in this business. Going into this without that confidence would lead to our early demise. Jenny and I weren't ready to go, not by a long shot, but the others already had a significant advantage. They knew exactly where we were, while we knew nothing about them. The two who accompanied the secretary and other lackey were probably the army that ran up the stairs. It had sounded a lot worse to me. The building was mostly locked down, at least on the higher levels. How did the non-participants view it? Were they having a big lunch delivered and the employees were a captive audience? So many thoughts raced through my head that I was confusing myself. How could they do what they were doing for the biggest and deadliest paintball game on the planet? A hitman kill-off. Pictures of your boys, please. Paul's smirk made me feel dirty, like he had dominated me. Watch your face, Paul. It would be a shame if someone wiped that smile off. His lip curled into a half-snarl, but he didn't make any sudden moves. Jenny moved close to him and elbowed him in the head. I snorted. Paul almost came out of his chair, but Jenny slapped a hand on his shoulder and pushed him down. She had the leverage. It amused me to watch. She had Paul's number, and he didn't like it. Good. Sorry, that was petty and juvenile, 
but nothing like trapping two people in a building and then telling them they have to fight for their lives to get out. We have no guarantee that you'll abide by the agreement, since nothing you've told us so far has been true. Nothing. Jenny gripped her pistol tightly and bared her teeth, fighting to control her anger. I nodded vigorously. My lovely bride says it how it is. I need some reassurance that you'll abide by our agreement. You put us here, not vice versa. A minimum contract nowadays is a million dollars. There are two of us. I'll need each of you to transfer two million to a separate account we have in the Caymans. We'll match it with two million of our own for a total of ten million on the table. Once that is done, we'll know you're serious. If you're not, then we'll use the money for a legal defense fund. We'll also pay to fly your remains to your homes for final disposition. Paul twitched. He stopped drumming his fingers on the table and clenched his fists. I don't really have a dog in this fight as your organization has not encroached on Texas, but I'll tell you that theirs have. I'd like to see us under one titular head. I twisted my head like a dog trying to figure out what was going on. Titular? That means a figurehead with no real power. I would hope all of this, and our ten million dollars, represent something far more than a figurehead. How about de facto chief executive officer? I have confidence in my people, Philippa said. We're still here, a voice said over a speakerphone that I couldn't see. Good. Once we have pictures of you eight, we'll get to it. You know where we are, so for purposes of starting even, let me know where each of you are. I know that information is only good for right now. The second we hang up, people will move. That's how we operate. For the record, if you guys are the best from each of these organizations, I don't want to kill you. This business is hard, and it's a major pain to find people who can be good at it. Join me, and let's end this right now. No one else needs to die today. Guido snickered. Not going to happen. Only the weak negotiate, the voice said. I'm on the 59th floor, and my partner in crime is on the 58th. We'll be seeing you. A click signaled that this individual had left the conversation. 58th and 56th, another voice said. Can't wait to meet you. 61st and 58th, a third voice added. Is there a big party on the 58th floor? I asked. That's right. That's where Freddie Mac has his offices. The whole floor is filled with your people. 58th and 54th. 54th. That was the lowest we'd gone. The operators showed up right when we were leaving. There had been more than one. Now that we know who is where, we need to see the pictures. I tapped the table with my index finger. The sooner we saw who we were facing, the sooner we could head out. This wasn't going to get easier with a delay. Guido tapped his phone until a picture appeared. He showed it to me. I'm looking for two. He shook his head. I only have this one. Do you have pictures of all your operators? We didn't have pictures of any of our operators. But I wasn't the one who set up this goat rope. We've agreed on the rules. I reiterated, we've agreed on the prize, and it's a big one indeed. The deck is stacked in your favor. The easiest answer is that we finish you four, then call back your operators and tell them they aren't getting paid. Well, we need you all to transfer two mil right now. Get out your phones, call your accountants, and transfer the sum. And find me pictures of your people. This was taking a lot longer than I wanted. We'd lose track of the eight within minutes. We needed to move but it was already too late. Transfer the money. Bring up some pictures. We'll wait. The first place we're going is the 58th floor. Biggest bang for your buck, they say. We'll knock out four at one pop. I was simply filling their heads with disinformation. I wasn't sure how we'd go about finding our counterparts. I wanted to talk with Miss Jenny, but privately. The information we received from the group call was that the others were working independently, giving us eight individual and unique targets. We were the only ones working as a team, at least at the outset. The others might collaborate. We had no insight into any future actions and only one picture. But we'd also seen the truth. They were operating as teams, showing up in pairs wherever we encountered them. While we waited, the individuals accessed their banks. I gave them the account and transfer information. To no one's surprise, all four had banks in the Caymans, and two of them had the exact same bank that we used. The transfers went without issue. 
I stood behind Jenny to give Gladys a call to verify the deposits and confirm our inclusion of two million in the pot. I added, Whoever calls you back at the end of the day is the one who gets the ten million. She confirmed ten million transferred in. Finally, the four individuals were being straightforward. That also showed they weren't actors. They were the real deal. Eight million to the victor and the spoils of the remaining four organizations. Jenny was tense. I couldn't tell from in front, but from behind her, her neck muscles stood out. I squeezed her shoulders. They were stiff as an oak board. She tried to stretch them, but her movements were tight. That didn't bode well. We needed to be at our best, able to move quickly, respond without thinking. We trained long and hard to be functional in the few seconds of an engagement. My stomach felt queasy. Despite my speeches and external look, I wasn't confident. We had one picture. I'd shoot him on sight, but I figured we wouldn't see any of them until after they took a shot at us. I didn't like our odds. 54th floor and above. Is there a hard deck below which your people won't go? 54th. You can't get below that unless we unlock things, Guido explained. That's it, then. 54th to the roof. Our fate lies somewhere between there. Yours as well. Ours is tied to the winner. We've agreed. You've been tested and found acceptable. Acceptable would be you guys duking it out with me, mano a mano. But no, you have your people fighting this on your behalf. I looked at Jenny. Why didn't we think of having these four out to the club so we could set them up to lose? This was nearly genius. What you idiots didn't count on was us. You thought we were more like you. We didn't think of a group grope because we're not assholes, Jenny said far more candidly than I expected. I liked it. That. No pictures, I asked, but I knew the answer. One picture. The rest were unknown. Well then, describe them. Male, female, height, weight. I don't know their height and weight, Philippa retorted. You very well do. Taller than me, shorter than me, heavier than me, lighter than me. You know we're done playing. Your two million dollars suggests you want this to start. The quicker it begins, the sooner it ends. Describe them, I shouted. Guido started with a generic description of the second man. Philippa described one man and one woman, roughly. They could have been our doubles. Freddie Mac described the two individuals who emerged from the elevator with his secretary and the man whose shirt I was wearing. Paul Steyer described Laurel and Hardy, while stealing glances at Jenny to see if she was going to hit him again. I appreciated his well-founded fear. She was fed up with him and his verbal aggression. We shall bid you adieu, I said. I didn't have any other words. Nothing profound, no bluster. It was time to focus exclusively on surviving. And that meant offense was the best defense. We were done reacting. I backed toward the door, keeping my hand on the butt of my pistol in case they tried anything, but we were well beyond that. They'd already played all their cards. We were in the final phase of the operation. Jenny walked out and scanned the corridor. I backed into the corridor behind her. The door closed. Through it, I watched the four watching Jenny and me. I covered my mouth with my hand. Head toward the south stairs. We'll check the service elevator on our way. Jenny moved down the hallway, keeping her back to the solid center wall where the bank of elevators was located. This floor was much smaller than the others. There was only the sloping roof of the floor below where there could have been a massive balcony, which improved the view from the 360-degree meeting rooms. I went the opposite way as Jenny. My intent was to wrap around the rear of the central pillar and meet up in front of the cleaning area. I kept my eyes on the door to the north stairway. At the last second, I decided to try it. I walked up to it and kicked the activation bar, jumping back and aiming into the empty space beyond the open door. I maintained my aim, watching over the barrel until the door closed. With a heavy sigh of relief, I walked away. Maybe it wasn't relief. It was disappointment. I was hoping for a quick engagement. An operator behind every door. Kill them while they were getting into place. Hit them first. But there were no easy marks. These were the best, supposedly. Different than our usual targets who didn't know that someone was coming for them. 
I hurried down the corridor to find Miss Jenny wide-eyed and making jerking movements to the point of being frenetic. We need to be calm, I started. She glared at me. Right, never tell a person who's not calm to be calm. I regrouped. I haven't named the four buckaroos who have become viable targets. They are bad people and deserve what's coming to them. First we have Guido, who needs no other name. Next is Captain Shortpants. Jenny looked confused. Her movements steadied. Captain Shortpants? The Apostle Paul, who sits apart and has a distinct dislike of you. He made me mad. I think that's what he wanted, take you off your game. I think Snagglepuss can apply to our Californian. And that leaves only Freddie Mac. Guido is leading this parade, but Freddie is making it all happen. Any recommendations? The reason I gave targets ridiculous names was to dehumanize them. Killing a person wasn't easy, even if they deserved it. After having killed too many to count, the naming thing worked for me. I wasn't a psychopath who felt nothing. I felt for their victims both past and future. It was for them that we did what we did. Wealthy people paid us to remove the people who upset society. Having criminals impeding commerce or life wasn't good for everyday business. Yet, killing people didn't come naturally. All one could do was train while making the best decision about whether a target was worth pursuing. It wasn't a life I would have chosen, but it had been chosen for me. Poor Miss Jenny. She fell into the business sideways. It had been my fault. That would teach her to fall in love with someone before she knew everything there was to know. Still, she stayed by my side, leaving behind her life as a teacher. And then she became fully embroiled in my job, having had to kill people on more than one occasion. But it was people who had been trying to kill her. That was the business we were in. We found ourselves deep inside the inhumanity of it, where individuals with no animosity toward each other were still willing to kill. It was outside our norm, but this was the situation where we found ourselves. The only way we get out of this is by killing them all. What do we call Freddy? Jack in the Box. He's the creepy clown that pops up after the weasel song. Jack. And next time he raises his head, I'm going to rip it off. As soon as we've cleared the decks. 54 to the roof. Don't discount the last haven, even though it'll be in the open. Is there a helipad up there? Jenny shrugged. How would I know? I shook my head. We wouldn't know. I checked the handle of the cleaning room to find the door unlocked. Jenny raised her pistol. I kicked it open. It bounced back after opening less than a foot, having hit someone standing there. Jenny hesitated. We hadn't seen who it was. It could have been the lady servicing the meeting room. Come out with your hands up, I called from beside the door. I dropped to a knee and waited. Jenny moved from where she'd been. A bullet crashed through the door. I checked where it hit the opposite wall to backtrack and fire at that point and two feet to the right, then where the service elevator door was. Three shots. With the 45's eruption, I couldn't hear if I hit anything. Shooting blind through a door wasn't optimal. Beyond the closed door, the elevator started to buzz from being held open too long. The 357, please. I tucked the 45 into my waistband. Jenny handed me the revolver. I sent two more shots into the room before kicking the door open once more. A foot on the floor told me someone was down. I dropped to the floor and fired into the leg. The whole limb bounced as a chunk of flesh ripped free to splatter against the far wall. I crawled in to get a look. A fit man, my size. He couldn't feign being unconscious with the damage to his leg. I checked him over. A bullet wound to his throat confirmed he was dead. His upper torso blocked the elevator door. His pistol was inside the car. I picked it up, checked the space once more, and then pulled him into the cleaning room. The doors shut, and the elevator headed down. He carried a forty-four Magnum, a veritable cannon. No wonder he took the shot through the door. He had two spare speed loaders. It was a little big for my hand, so I climbed the storage rack and pushed the panel out of the way on the false ceiling. I shoved the pistol and speed loader clips out of the way. I'd let them think we were loading up on ammo and weapons. 
They have to be doing this on purpose. What do you mean? Jenny asked, not bothering to look at the body. Different calibers. Don't give anyone extra shots. One pistol with two spare mags each, except the 357, which had three speed loaders because there are only six rounds in each. 24 to 40 rounds total per person. I saw that look on your face, Ian. No, I don't want to be here or have anything to do with this. But we're here and together. Please don't worry about me. Koresh's band of misfits? Being trapped there alone was worse than this. I'm okay. Just had to get over my initial cognitive dissonance. You know what sounds good right about now? White Castle? I suggested. My thoughts exactly. Whatever you want when we get out of here. Heartburn included at no extra charge. Love me some White Castle. No fries, just burgers and no burn. I smiled at my wife. She made me better. One down, seven to go, plus four bonus targets. If two million each adds any credibility to their lies. Chapter 9 Reject your sense of injury, and the injury itself disappears. Marcus Aurelius We headed for the southern stairway. I took the lead, and Jenny watched my six o'clock, which freed me to focus on the way ahead. This was the one distinct advantage we had over the others. They were working independently, as evidenced by the myriad of floors they reported being on, if true, and now one potential team was forced to run solo. I slowly pressed in the bar on the door, but it still clicked overly loud. I held it where it was until I could brace my foot. I kicked the door open and jumped aside. Once again, I was disappointed that it was clear on the other side. I checked the crack in the door to make sure no one was hiding behind it, but there wasn't. I eased onto the landing. Next stop was the 61st floor to see if the six we'd run across earlier were still there. At least we had a baseline on that floor. We need to channel them into one area by closing off the stairways. They could be coming up behind us right now. I whispered over my shoulder. How do we block the stairs? I believe there are unused explosives in this stairway. I pointed at the non-skid sheet metal below my feet. We have the advantage because we know where they are. We don't know what the others know. That's a little disconcerting, Jenny replied. It's a lot disconcerting. Let's get down there and help ourselves to the stuff that goes boom. We can't reach it. Turns out we know where there's scaffolding. If we remove the scaffolding, then we open access to the stairs. That's a drawback. Let me rethink my plan. If we detonate what's there, we limit their mobility, makes the service elevator the only way from the lowest floor to the top. Floors 58 to 60 stay blocked, Jenny suggested. It's good to see you hitting on all cylinders, I replied. And then I was back to the matter at hand. How does the blocked stairways hurt us? No escape except by the elevator? I nodded. Anyone who wanted to ambush us would wait in the cleaning room, but there are only seven left. If they're waiting in the cleaning room, then they aren't hitting us elsewhere. The cleaning room isn't a refuge. It's a box within which one person has already died. Stay there and remain blind. Someone waiting in a cleaning room isn't an immediate threat. Back to the original plan. 61, here we come. We moved silently down the stairs. I dodged around the mid-floor landing to look down while presenting the smallest target possible. It was empty below. We hurried to the exit to the 61st floor. Unlike last time, we were coming from the south side and weren't running from an explosion. I pulled the door open and peeked around it. The hallway was clear. I stepped quickly down the hallway to where it opened up to the cubicles. I saw heads hovering over computers. We hurried down the nearest aisle, nodding to the two people we recognized. They looked at us oddly, maybe because I was wearing a different shirt. We continued without engaging them in conversation. I wanted to make sure we were alone on the floor first. One of the operators had been on the 61st. We ran across the last four having a group conversation. We sidled up close and waited. The middle-aged woman noticed us and nodded. I didn't think you'd be back. You were supposed to be heading to the ground floor. Funny how Karma had a different idea. The top of the building is blocked off. Did you see a stranger on this floor? I asked. 
No one has been here since you last visited. She shrugged with her revelation. I believed her. Could someone have been hiding in the cleaning area by the service elevator? Sure, we don't go in there, and there's no housekeeping today. We got a message earlier that it had been canceled because of the problem with the elevators. It looks like they're fixed, though. Maybe they'll stop by to empty our trash, the younger man suggested, hopefully. He remained oblivious to the machinations of those around him, those who were there to take lives. The men and women who were contract killers fighting for their lives with innocent bystanders as nothing more than obstacles and props. His naivete was refreshing. I expect not, but you may see strangers traipse through here. His look made me laugh. Strangers who aren't us. I'd appreciate a text if someone shows up. Jenny gave them her number. We changed phones with great frequency, all except the untraceable satellite phone that didn't have a data plan and didn't ping cell towers. It was invisible to both normal and advanced data searches. Who would show up? It's crazy, but there's a little game going on, like laser tag. Jenny and I are one team, and there are other teams. They may be fanatical to win, so you'll need to be careful around them, I explained. A little truth, a little lie. I didn't want to put these people in harm's way. I didn't know the consequences of collateral damage. It would be far easier to hide the death of an operator, a person who wasn't public, compared to someone who worked in the office every day. The innocent bystanders who had no business being a part of our game, although I just asked them to be on our team. If they got caught texting, what would happen? Belay my last. Don't text us. Just go about your business. If someone shows up, ignore them. And don't lie for us. They'll probably be pretty mean since the stakes are high. How high? Can we join in? I'm done with my work for today, the rail-thin young man offered. It's a big number, but no, you can't join the game because it's an exclusive club, like owner of the building exclusive. The young man was nonplussed. How did you get in? Do you own a business? It was getting uncomfortable. The less you know, the better off you'll be, I replied. And yes, we own a substantial business. Still, this is dangerous, the kind of game that rich people play. How can it be dangerous? I've played laser tag before. I hung my head. I was finished explaining. I didn't have an argument that he would buy. Jenny said, It's so dangerous that even I don't want to play. But I signed up for it because that's what this group does. The next one will probably be a scavenger hunt in Florence, Italy. But for today, we have to play. No one else can join us in this winner-takes-all. If you can't put a couple million dollars into the pot, then you had best stay away from those who can. A couple mil each? How many are playing? The young man only saw the dollar signs. Enough that it's a big number that people will do almost anything to get. The cash as well as bragging rights. You never know what the game is until you show up, and we're going to do our best to win. But this one is pretty foul. We may have to leave the club, depending... In the interim, keep your heads down and out of the business of these strangers, please. Jenny was using her teacher's voice as she explained. I found it sexy. I shook off the thoughts because we had a game to win. Jenny did her best to keep the bystanders out of the line of fire. It would keep them safer, although I wouldn't put it past the others to start a shootout with innocent civilians in the way. It was better to think the worst, like the other operators using human shields. That would be bad. We'd have to disengage in that case. I didn't want anyone else to get hurt. If they learned that, it would be our weakness and our undoing. Seven to go. Thank you. We hope to see you again. Maybe lunchtime? You said food was coming? The older woman nodded. You are welcome to join us, even though you're rich and strange. A strangely rich might be the best description. Now, she clapped her hands. Everyone back to work. You've taken a long enough break. Jenny and I waved and walked away, maintaining a good pace without looking like we were hurrying. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I asked. I doubt it, Jenny replied. We need to block off the service elevator on this level, and maybe on every level. Channelize the enemy to the stairs, maybe blow up a bunch at one time. Jenny nodded. Not what I was thinking at all. I'll be right one of these days. Neither of us looked at the other. 
We kept our eyes roaming the aisles, the corridors, and the dark spaces, looking for the little things that didn't belong. But this level seemed untouched, despite one operator's claim that he was here. We made it to the cleaning room without issue. The door was unlocked, which I found surprising. Jenny backed away while I brought the forty-five to bear. I pushed the door open slowly, using my toe. It was dark inside, total darkness because the lights were off and there were no external windows. I kicked the door open and jumped away from the opening. Anyone hiding would have been momentarily impacted by the light, but nothing happened. I blocked the door with my foot, hoping no one was inside waiting to shoot me in the foot. That would ruin my day. I reached in to hit the switch, jerking my hand back the instant the lights came on. Nothing. No movement. I wanted to fire around into the corner I couldn't see from the hallway, but I feared that I would run out of ammunition faster than I would run out of enemies. Then again, with each dead enemy, we'd get a new weapon and more ammunition, almost like in a video game. I signaled to Jenny that I would dive in. I counted down on my fingers and dove. Jenny lunged for the door as backup and to force an attacker to hesitate when they had two targets appear instead of one. I rolled to my feet inside the empty room. My chin fell to my chest. Jenny's chest heaved with the stress of room clearing. We'd had to do it in the Middle East when I was in the Marines. It was hard then, but a lot tougher now because we couldn't lead with grenades. The chrome storage racks filled with supplies would serve our purpose. What do you think? Wedge it against the wall and in front of the doors? Somebody would have to make an awful racket to come through it, as well as keeping the doors open until the elevator beeps its warning cry. It can be our hitman alarm. We emptied the shelf unit, piling most of the chemicals on the floor. The rack didn't quite wedge in tightly enough, so we had to use a box of trash can liners and dusters to fill in the gap. I thought we could wedge the rack, lower left of the door to the upper right. I was lifting when the service elevator dinged. My hand shot to my waistband of its own volition to pull the forty-five out and bring it around in front of me. Jenny stumbled backward over the chemicals and fell. The door started to open. I was trapped between the rack and the wall, halfway beneath it from where I'd been levering the unit. I aimed at the growing opening. Crap! Someone uttered from inside before hugging the wall beside the door. I had no shot. The door cycled while we waited for the other to make a mistake. When it closed, I was up in an instant, kicking off the wall to get over the rack. My weight pushed it down while the elevator continued to the 62nd floor. When my heart rate slowed, I said, Our anti-hitman trap worked. I helped Jenny to her feet. She mumbled an apology. What? We were caught with our butts hanging out. Not optimal. Let's pull this rack up and then pile the chemicals and cleaning trash in there. Together we managed to get the angle back. The service elevator started down. We abandoned what we were doing. Jenny moved to the corridor while I stayed in the room to the side of the doors, waiting for the passenger to return and expose themselves so I could put a round in them. But the elevator didn't stop at our floor. It continued to the 58th. Of course it went to the 58th floor. That was Jack in the Box's home turf. Do we go down there and take them on all at once? I asked. I say we don't, Jenny replied. I'm not in a hurry to die. We'd already been approached twice. One ambush and one surprise maneuver. How many are trying to angle for a good shot? How many are waiting for us to come to them? What is the time limit? Close of the workday. I didn't get the idea that we could wait them out, Jenny replied. I nodded. That was my thought, too. The pace of all our counterparts would get frenetic the longer this dragged on. Maybe we can be the ambushers for an hour or so. You take the north stairs, I'll take the south, and we'll listen for anyone trying to sneak in using the elevators. Stay close to the stairway door, but out of sight, where we can also see the elevators. That will probably be the safest, Jenny admitted. Let's give it a shot. I'm in no hurry to do the room clearing. That about gave me a heart attack. What do you say we sit back and see if they come to us? Jenny moved to the north stair access. She took a position opposite the side that opened, so anyone trying to look through would have to expose a good-sized target to see her. 
I did the same, angling so I could see past the elevators. I hunkered down to wait. Chapter 10 Keep your face to the sunshine, and you cannot see a shadow. Helen Keller The six employees working on the 61st floor found every excuse to check us out. The young man wanted to engage me in conversation, but I held a finger to my lips and pointed at the door. I returned to watching, ignoring him for long enough that he went away. I thought I heard something beyond the door, but I couldn't be sure. It could have been from behind me, one of the employees moving around and the sound reflecting off the door. Five, ten, and then fifteen minutes later, there was nothing else. I began to think I was imagining things, but stayed where I was, just in case. The older woman click-clacked in her heels to the elevator and pressed the call button. I waved to her. She waved back. The elevator arrived and she stepped forward to get on, but a person rushed out and grabbed her, spinning her around to hold in front of him. I stood and faced him. My size and description. I removed my pistol and took aim, but he was too far away. He balanced a pistol on the older woman's shoulder as he moved forward. A soft click sounded from behind me. I placed my back against the wall. I would have to be fast. I tensed in anticipation and looked at a point on the wall between the door and the man approaching me. I could watch both using my peripheral vision. I aimed across my body and started to depress the trigger, enough to activate it, but not enough to fire it. A head popped out and dove back in before I could finish pulling the trigger. There weren't many choices. They were closing the noose around me. I jumped to my left and jammed into the doorway. My pistol seemed to fire of its own volition the instant a face appeared. I dropped and pushed back, throwing myself across the corridor and into the wall. I turned into the aisle to find a pistol aimed at me. The explosion of a pistol shot made me wince and flinch. But he missed. I took aim over the woman's shoulder, but the man's pistol had dropped from his numb fingers. He looked at me, dumbfounded, until he fell over and crumpled to the floor. Behind him, Jenny stood with the three eighty in her hand. A small caliber that wouldn't punch through his body made it safe to fire while the innocent bystander was on the other side. A second body blocked the doorway. I pushed him onto the landing outside the door, looking up and down first to make sure it wasn't a double ambush, but it wasn't. Only the two acting in unison to get a better shot. As it was, neither had fired. Jenny and I had fired one round each frugality and efficiency. I checked the body on the landing. He carried a small caliber Russian pistol, a Tokarev, 762 by 25 millimeters. The other man carried a Russian pistol too, but a Makarov, 9 millimeter by 18 millimeter. Those weren't powerful rounds, but the pistols were deadly accurate. A well-aimed round, even a 22, could ruin someone's day. We recovered the two pistols and the expected two magazines each. The young man and the older woman gawked. You killed those people, came the incredulous cry. They're dead. I looked at both. It's far deadlier than laser tag, but it is the game all the same. We won't let them hurt you, but please, you need to stay out of our way. You killed those people, the young man repeated. They shouldn't have pointed guns at us, I said matter-of-factly. The older woman started to shake. Jenny took her arm and guided her toward the cubicles. I hoisted the man in the hallway onto my shoulder and lugged him to the cleaning room. I dropped his body on the rack, blocking the doorway. That would add some excitement to the next person attempting to access the floor via the service elevator. I hurried back into position, doing my best to watch everything, but I couldn't see the southern stairway door. I looped around behind the central area to come to the southern stairs from the other direction. The area was clear. I kicked the door open and crouched, ready to fire, but no enemy waited. No pistol barked fire at me. I waited until the door closed before returning to my position. Three down, five to go. I didn't think these best operators were very good. We should have already been dead. Why did he wait to fire while behind the woman? He could have easily killed me and then looked for Jenny, but he delayed. Why? The answer wasn't to be found on him. 
He carried nothing but his pistol and reloads. Nothing else, not even a phone. The other man didn't have a phone either. So how did they communicate with Guido using his speakerphone? I had questions and no answers. It was easier because we were no longer reacting. Even though ambushing wasn't exactly driving the train, it gave us the result we wanted, sanctioning the competition. Two at a time, and quickly. Jenny joined me. After the first on the floor above, I was worried. I feel better now. These are not nice people. I have a lot more confidence that we're going to get out of this alive. I don't want to do this, just so we're clear. Jenny half-smiled, apologetic but honest. Her green eyes sparkled at me and drew me in as they always did. I cupped her cheek with my hand. I don't want to do this either. I'm curious why Gladys agreed to the meeting, which makes me think they've gotten to her in some way, which means we may have to drop a contract on someone. I can't have our people getting threatened. Those four upstairs have a lot to answer for, and I suspect they are going to answer with their lives. I'm good with that. This is horrible. Our job is bad enough, but pitting operators against each other? It's pathetic. If we didn't need them to call off the dogs, I'd say we'd go upstairs and do them right now. Do them? Look at you. Watching too many movies. We need to expand your repertoire. I tipped my chin toward the far side of the building. Back on station, Miss Jenny. We can't let them get past us. A heavy thump of feet coming up the stairs jerked my head around. I gripped Jenny's arm to stop her from leaving and gestured for her to get behind me, which she did without question. Once close to the landing, I kicked the door open and took aim. Two men immediately put their hands up. They wore smocks with a company logo. Mac Industries. They had also been carrying a stretcher between them. It clattered to the stairs when they let go. We're the cleaners, the first man said, eyes wide and waiting. They didn't tell you we'd be around? They didn't tell us a lot. I kept my pistol aimed at them, finger on the trigger. I remembered the British agent who went by the moniker of the cleaner. He didn't name himself, but that's what others called him. There's one more in front of the service elevator on this floor and in the cleaning room next floor up. We already recovered that one. What do you do with them? I lowered my pistol. This building has a huge incinerator, he replied. Take care so you don't get yourself shot. I hope they're paying you a lot. He smiled. Enough for me to take the rest of the year off. And Buddy is moving to Florida. You ever deal with the Chicago winter? His manner became much more relaxed after I stopped pointing my pistol at him. I thank you kindly for cleaning up the messes. Have you taken care of anyone else besides these three? There was one outside the conference room on the top floor. We took care of that one too. And the one on the 58th. That's five today. It's been a busy day. But they told us to stay on until five, just in case, because it would be over by then. Definitely be over by five. I like that. Someone got killed on the 58th? That is simply horrible. I'm aghast. The two men looked at each other. I'm sorry you have gas. Maybe you should watch your diet a little better. You sound like my wife. They got a good laugh from the man. I wished them on their merry way and backed out of the stairway. Sounds like your wife? Jenny stared at me. It was funny as hell and you know it. Not because it's true, even though it is, but because it's funny. The funniest things have a grain of truth. I thought my explanation was awesome. I jumped when the door opened, raising my pistol without thinking. The man stopped. He couldn't put his hands up because he was carrying the front of the stretcher. We just went through this, he said tensely. Sorry, I hate surprises and I can't relax my guard. You know, I don't want to be the next body you clean. All things being equal, you won't be. I don't see you on this stretcher at all. You're pretty wily, and you already took care of four of them. I like your odds. I have odds? The boys are betting. You are three to one. I didn't know who the boys were, but I liked that he was confident about our chances. Have you seen the others? Hell, I never saw you until you shoved your gun in my face. I nodded. Don't let me hold you up. I stepped back to clear the way. Once they were gone, I turned to Jenny. A bonus person died. Was he one of ours or someone different? I think we have to assume there are five remaining, at least. Why, at least? Do you trust those people upstairs? Jenny snorted. Not as far as I can throw them. Exactly. 
We keep going until no one else is coming after us. Jenny nodded and waved over her shoulder as she returned to the other stairwell. We would wait a while longer before taking the fight to the other floors. Who would run out of patience first? We had until five in the afternoon. I checked the time on the clock on the wall. Noon. We had five hours and at least five targets. We had plenty of time to be passive as well as aggressive. It was a game of chess, not checkers. And just like chess, the one who made the first mistake was the one who would lose. As Wyatt Earp famously said, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. We were going to be the smoothest operators in the building. It helped to be fast, but better to be faster with the mind. I felt like we were outthinking our opponents, even though it seemed like we were reacting quicker than them, firing quicker and more accurately. Jenny took her position on the far side of the floor. I settled onto the thin carpet, out of sight and out of mind. We'd wait until we couldn't wait anymore. After fifteen minutes, the older woman approached me. The experience with the operator had left her shaken, and she had not recovered. It would take an untold number of therapy sessions before she'd be back to a new normal. What were those men with the stretcher doing? Carrying away the injured to get help, I answered. But they weren't injured, she argued. No. I wasn't going to lie to her. We needed allies, even ones who had been traumatized. I hoped she saw us as protectors. If we needed help, I would like to count on the good few of the 61st floor. She nodded. It's a deadly game that we're signed up for. It's better that we do this here, where stalwart people like yourself can tolerate what would be gang warfare out there. I pointed with my head toward the windows. There's no need for people to panic. Despite the seeming randomness of the violence, it is not. You people are killing each other using guns that you shouldn't have, she said in a monotone, as if thinking to herself. You know what they say, if it's criminal to own a gun, only criminals will have guns. We're not criminals. We've been thrust into a situation where we're fighting for our lives. We're not ones to give up. So much for telling her the truth, but she didn't need to know everything. I see that. I'm going to go sit down now. If someone is hiding a bottle of whiskey or something, it probably wouldn't hurt to take a drink or two. It'll smooth off today's rough edges. The elevator dinged. I jumped to my feet and put myself in front of the older woman. A catering cart appeared with two women pushing it. Lunch had arrived. I wasn't sure anyone on the floor was hungry, anyone besides Jenny and me. I was famished. Are you hungry? I asked the older woman. She shook her head and rested a hand on my shoulder for a moment before heading to her desk. The ladies moved the cart toward the break room. The young man ambled toward it, waiting for the women to leave before entering. Hey, I called to him halfway across the floor. He jerked his head around. I crooked a finger at him. He looked around to make sure I was talking to him. Once he realized that I was, he came to me. Maybe you should ask the others if they'd like something, I suggested. Why? Everyone saw the cart arrive. I pointed to myself. The youngest and fittest don't get to eat first. Also, the most senior in rank always eats last. But in this case, why don't you let the others go ahead of you? The young man sneered. Is this some macho garbage? Welcome to the 21st century, Pops. I'm going to say what your friends have probably told you. You make it hard to like you. Everyone is equal here. He straightened to his full height, which was still shorter than me. Team, my good man. Building a team means that the members look out for each other, regardless of rank or position or gender. Make sure everyone knows it's here. Maybe give them a preview of what's on the cart. Who likes what? Be a team player. You'll like how it feels. There aren't very many deviled eggs, he replied. You'll make do if you don't get one. I stared him down until he could feel he was being petty and selfish. If you want one that badly, ask the others. I bet you'll find out that they're happy sharing. Team, if things get hot in here, you're going to have to count on one another. If they get hot, it'll be because of you and your woman. The way he said woman sounded as if he meant it as a pejorative. I didn't feel the need to lay into him. You're right. We'll do everything we can to protect you because they're coming after us. There's no doubt about that. It reinforces the fact that you might get caught in the crossfire. Looking out for each other is important, 
Start now, and it'll come naturally if your world ever catches on fire. They're going to burn the building down? He asked incredulously. It's just a saying. You see who your real friends are during the darkest crises. They may not give you money or things, but they'll give you their time. That is the most valuable thing a person has to offer. You're a strange man, the young man said. I don't have many friends, but the ones I do have are incomparable. My closest friend is on the other side of this floor. It pains me for her to be in harm's way like this. She shot that man dead. I don't think you should worry. He walked slowly away with his head bowed deep in thought. It was the most intelligent thing he said. We trained hard, so neither of us had to worry if we were delivered into a physical challenge. We were ready. It also reinforced that I needed to build a shooting range in the basements of our two homes. We needed to be flawless with our aim. Smooth is fast. I double-checked the pistol. Everything was where I was most comfortable with. The thumb safety to click off or on. I had already swapped magazines, leaving a round chambered during the change. That left me with two rounds in one magazine that I carried in my pocket next to a full magazine. There were only five left. I had 14 rounds for the 45. That should be enough. I also had the 357, along with two Russian pistols and the 44 Magnum. I didn't want to break out the cannon since it was too heavy to carry around. It was also a revolver and on a different floor. I found that I liked the 45 that I had acquired from Freddie Mac. It was a nice weapon. Smooth. We ditched the Russian pistols. They added no value above what we already carried. The young man went from cubicle to cubicle to invite the workers to the break room for lunch. They smiled and thanked him, even the older woman. Together, they walked to the back of the floor. He gave me two thumbs up. Sometimes, the young needed a different way to look at the world. Not everyone got a trophy. Not everyone learned the right lessons about good karma. He waved for me to join them. I pointed at the door. We have to do this thing first, but if you could bring me one of those deviled eggs. I left it hanging. I'm just kidding. I'll take a sandwich if there's something left over, but make sure your group is taken care of first. We weren't on the guest list, so they didn't plan for us. I would wave off anything for me to make sure Miss Jenny got something. They disappeared into their break room. Soon they were laughing and enjoying themselves, despite what they'd seen. Humanity was resilient. It was how we survived. We had the ability to minimize the past in favor of a more optimistic future while focusing our minds on the present. The elevator dinged once more, and I was instantly galvanized to action. I rushed to a better location from which to engage an intruder. A woman stepped out. She wore a business outfit, something that wouldn't be easy to move in. It made me question if she was our one female operator. I waited. She looked left and right before deciding to walk in Jenny's direction. Excuse me, I said loudly enough to draw her attention. I tucked my pistol into the back of my waistband. Chapter 11 Strive not to be a success, but rather to be of value. Albert Einstein The woman looked my way and smiled. I caught a movement beyond her, but didn't change my focus. Jenny had shown me she was ready to engage. I couldn't see which weapon she had in her hand, but she carried something. I'm looking for Shepard and Associates. I was at a loss. I had no idea what companies worked on this floor. I thought there was only one, since it was cubicles and open offices. I looked around, and there it was. On the wall behind the woman's head, across from the elevators, was a sign that said, O'Rourke Realty Group. Not on this floor. O'Rourke is here. You might want to try the next one down, I added helpfully. I wasn't moving. I watched her hands closely while smiling. She wasn't anywhere near as tall as Miss Jenny. I expected the description had been fake. The sharpness of her eye marked her as a professional. But a professional what? I wasn't going to take the shot without knowing for sure. No collateral damage. It was what made us different. The weight grew uncomfortable as she stood there. I wasn't going to turn my back on her. She nodded and returned to the elevator to punch the call button. She looked to her right and saw Jenny leaning against the wall with her hand tucked inside her purse. Good morning. I'm sorry, good afternoon. Time has gotten away from me, it seems, the woman said to Jenny. My hand itched to take my pistol and kill her. 
but I wasn't certain. I wouldn't forget her face. If we came across her again, she would die. It might be best if you meet with Shepard on a different day. Today is not the best day to conduct business in the tower. It will be much healthier if you leave. Many people are sick, and the disease is virulent. You seem okay. I think we're on the good side of it. Heed my words, ma'am. Take your leave of this building. It could very well save your life. She nodded again as the elevator arrived. Maybe I'll take your advice. My employers have been less than forthcoming regarding the prosecution of this contract. She was an operator. I didn't pull my pistol and kill her. My plans for her changed thanks to her honesty. I gave her the respect she'd just earned. If we were to pick up four new organizations, we'd need someone to manage the L.A. operation since Princess Lovechunks was not going to survive the day. She stepped into the elevator. I hope we'll have a real conversation one day, I called after her as the doors closed. Jenny joined me as we watched the elevator travel to the 56th floor before it stopped. Looks like you didn't convince her, Jenny suggested. I was disappointed. I had high hopes that we'd been able to convince her it wasn't worth her while to pursue us. What do you say we head down to the 56th and take care of business? I pointed toward the southern stairs where we had a straight shot to the scaffolding in place below the 58th. The north stairs were blocked to probably the 58th. The twisted wreckage of the stairs probably ended above there. The only challenge was that we had to cross from the south to the north stairway on the 58th floor, the place Jack in the Box called home. Maybe we can cross on the 59th, I suggested. Jenny shook her head. That stairwell has to be trashed from the explosion. It was only one floor down from the worst of it. I knew she was right. I'm pretty sure I don't want to go to the 58th floor. The elevator the woman had taken headed downward after the brief stop, beyond the 54th. If the woman was on it, we'd reduced the odds against us. I didn't know what to think. We've already killed six and injured another four. There's no way they put only eight against us. They have their primary operators and secondary. I'm not sure how guys like the one I took the shirt from or Jack in the Box's secretary fit into the equation, but I think they're secondary actors. We're back to not knowing how many operators are gunning for us, Jenny said, returning to her defeated voice. She was cycling from heightened awareness through depression and back to a state of agitated hyperactivity. I was sure I wasn't helping her maintain a steady psychological state with my out loud thinking. Killing people wholesale wasn't anything I'd ever done. We'd already killed too many on this one day. To an outside observer, that bordered on the psychotic. Then again, Jenny and I had our legal training for denying everything. Make the prosecutor come up with the evidence. Deny, deny, deny. There was no reason to provide any answers at all to questions. The right against self-incrimination provided for constitutionally protected silence. We didn't have to prove we were innocent. It was the beauty of the legal system for those who ran close to the edge. Admit nothing, deny everything. Even though we ran over the edge, the government tacitly approved what we did because they hired us too. Which brought me back to no collateral damage. Killing innocent people would take us off the vice president's speed dial. We keep doing what we're doing until five in the afternoon. Then we see if the top floor cabal is still around. If it is, we deliver the bad news that they're done. As much as I'd like, we can't just terminate them. I was blustering before. I hate to say that we need them to transition control of their agencies, even if they remain the nominal heads. But we'll have an open contract on them if they run afoul of the Peace Archive. You mean if they make us angry, Jenny clarified. Well, angrier than they've already made us. If we've killed six and injured four, how many are left? At least five, and that woman was one of them. I nodded to the bank of elevators. The good news is that the elevators work again and we'll travel to the ground floor. They'll know if we try to leave, Jenny replied. They seem to know a lot. Are we tagged somehow? I wondered. I checked my shirt while Jenny went through her clothes. Next was our weapons. I didn't have the tools I needed to remove the hand grips or do anything besides a simple breakdown. They could have had tracking devices and we wouldn't find them. Remember walking through crunchy stuff in the parking garage? I asked. Jenny frowned and leaned against the wall to take off her shoes. She didn't wear high heels. Jenny was about performance, 
so her shoes were more along the lines of what the police would wear, black leather, but with an insole and a tread made for running. It was almost the same for me. I wore desert combat boots because they were more comfortable while allowing me to move as I needed. They weren't standard corporate exec gear. She showed me the sole of her shoe. Embedded were small squares of the type that would activate an RFID. She pulled them out one by one. They were rubber-coated so they wouldn't click on the floors that weren't carpeted. I had the same in the soles of my boots. I removed them all and put them in my pocket. You're not going to toss them? I think we can use them as a diversion when the time is right, like when we're going to leave the floor. We pushed them through the door to the stairs so we can take the elevator. None of the operators we ran into were carrying a phone or any kind of smart device, Jenny noted. So how are they getting the information? One person from each pair must have a phone because they called into the conference room upstairs. I heard four distinct voices and four clicks when they ended the calls. What are they doing with their phones? Are they checking in with the people upstairs before they move to confirm our location? I shrugged. We can't be sure unless we ask. The woman seemed to know without a doubt that we were on the 61st floor, so they're getting the information. I say we toss the RFIDs through the door to the northern stairway. Then we take the southern stairs. Although the elevator sounds safe, we're trapped inside of it. When the door opens, we have a couple seconds to act before we have to fight to keep it open. If anyone is out there... We're in a firefight for our lives, with our backs literally against the wall and nowhere to hide. The southern stairs, then, while they try to intercept us on the northern side before we get to their bosses. Jenny finished my thought. Southern stairs it was, once we thought through the scenarios. Removing the RFID put us ahead of the game, at least for a short while. Let's not make it easy on them. I found a tape dispenser on a desk and cut a couple lengths. We put the little tags on them. I checked the northern door. The structural damage wasn't as bad as I remembered, but the stairs down were still impassable. I taped the tags under the upward steps in a place where no one would see them because no one was coming from below. We left the stairwell and hurried to the far side of the floor. Jenny stayed back while I nudged the door open with my toe. Nothing. I crept through with Jenny right behind me, constantly checking over her shoulder. Lunch was ongoing, so no one had seen us leave since they were still in the break room, enjoying the meal and each other's company. We hadn't gotten anything to eat. We'd manage. White Castle is sounding better and better. Jenny shook her head. You always think White Castle sounds good. We could have gotten it on Long Island. We didn't have to wait until Chicago. First, no one goes to Long Island from the Hamptons if they don't absolutely have to. And second, it's the whole aura of driving home, eating White Castles while stuck in traffic, having ice cream when we get home, before some naked hot tub. Get your mind off naked hot tub, otherwise we might not get out of here. I'll make you a deal. As much naked hot tub as you want, if you get us out of here. You have a magical way about you that makes me better at everything. Jenny laughed. Focus! I looked down the stairs, but could only see one floor down. There was nothing. I gestured for Jenny to follow, but pounding feet froze us in our tracks. We stepped back and crouched. Sixty-second floor! Hurry! We have to beat them there! A man's voice sounded from below. I took aim at the inevitable operators racing to intercept us, using the bad information we had given them. Jenny crouched next to me, aiming her nine-millimeter down the stairs. I'll take the one on the right, I whispered. Left for me, she said to confirm the plan. The two hit the landing below the 61st floor and didn't slow. The one on the right was in the lead. I waited until the light of recognition flashed in his eyes. He carried his pistol in his right hand, but hadn't brought it up when I fired. Jenny fired an instant after me. I popped to my feet and jumped to the rail. I aimed at his head and fired again. I lined up the second target and finished him, too. We descended to the bodies to secure their pistols. I expected two more odd calibers, but they were both 9 millimeters. The magazines were different from Jenny's weapon, but that didn't matter. She was loaded up with ammunition, at least 60 more rounds. She stuffed the magazines in her purse, which filled it. She had to carry the pistol in her hand. I also carried mine as we headed down. I had every intention of going to the 58th floor. That was where the action was. There could be only three left, or a lot more. It was a little afternoon. 
We had as much time as we needed. Being in a hurry wouldn't benefit us, but the 58th floor was where we'd get more answers. I wanted to subvert the operators, get them on our side without having to kill anyone else. Are you going to pitch the operators? Jenny knew what I was thinking. I would swear she could hear my thoughts, even after getting her ears blasted by firing our weapons in an enclosed space. I am. We need to stop killing each other. I looked back at the two bodies on the stairs. What a waste. We continued downward past the 60th floor, which we had not yet visited, and then the 59th. We stopped at the 58th. No one had removed the explosives under the stairs to the 60th floor, and it seemed that the other operators knew that the tripwire was no longer stretched across. Intelligence about our actions had been passed to the others. How would they deal with us without having the upper hand? Especially since five of their number had already died, even with their advantage. To be fair, we used that advantage to lure the last two into a trap. If we acted quickly enough, we'd be able to take care of the others before they figured out that we knew of their subterfuge. I hate them, I pointed up the stairs. They'll get theirs when the time is right. First, we have a few more operators to neutralize. Back us into a corner, will you? I growled like an animal. I was making myself angry, too angry. I leaned against the railing to steady myself. Jenny waited. She knew what I was doing. I needed to remove the emotions from it. I couldn't hate them. I couldn't be angry with them. I had to outthink them, and that took a clear mind. 58th floor. Jack in the Box's office is kitty-cornered away from the north stairs, but closer to the south stairs. Is that where we want to go? We have a clear line of sight, and no one can sneak up behind us. I wonder if the secretary and our pink floral man are back in the office after their trial from earlier. You mean the black eyes they should be sporting? Maybe they'll be swollen shut and they can't see. I'd like that. Stay two steps back and to the right. I'll cover the left half of the room. You have the right and behind us. There's not much to the right. You're my backup if I go down. Everyone on this floor is considered hostile, but not an operator. We don't take anyone off the list. Not here. We shoot anyone who is shooting at us. Making yourself a target isn't the best strategy. Jenny poked me with her finger. But it'll bring them into the open. Stay away from me and don't let your guard down. Roger. Jenny usually didn't give me a verbal affirmation, but I was looking ahead, not at her. My focus was where it needed to be. I continued into the hallway once I confirmed no one was waiting for us behind the door, which I didn't expect there to be. They couldn't already be onto the fact we were no longer tagged. Our shoes, of all things. I shook it off and strode forward. I walked into the cubicle farm like I owned the place. I continued straight to Jack in the Box's office and tried the door. It was still locked. The hinges were on my side. If I hit it with a shoulder... It'd be like swimming against the tide. I hammered at the upper hinge with the butt of my pistol. It came free easily. I knocked out the bottom hinge and pulled the door off. It slammed to the deck. The door was much heavier than it should have been. The glass partition lining the office was at least an inch thick. I entered Jack's office. Once Jenny was inside, I told her what I thought. Bulletproof glass. She stepped to the side and watched while I muscled the heavy door into place. It blocked 90% of the opening, but there was a gap. Heads popped out of the cubicles to watch us. I looked for anyone who might have been an operator. There was no standard, but the many operators I had dealt with had a certain sharpness of eye, a readiness to aim, and a twitch to act. I looked for those cues, but a group of people watching us watching them wasn't as enlightening as I would have liked. What do we do now? Jenny asked. We wait for the operators to show themselves. Out of all the places we could hide, this is probably the safest and has the best view. We can see who's coming. We both checked our weapons. Jenny inserted a new magazine. Jenny watched while I wandered to the desk. The picture frames showed our man Jack with fish. One was a northern pike and the other was a salmon. No spouse and no kids. He didn't wear a wedding ring. He's married. I guessed, but had no proof. At the window, I looked down on the city and the people who were small as ants. They were as oblivious to our problems as we were to theirs. Chapter 12 Success depends upon previous preparation. 
and without such preparation, there is sure to be failure. Confucius Are they lining up to look at us like animals in a zoo? The secretary is back, and oh boy, does she have a nice shiner. A black eye covered the right side of her face. It wasn't as swollen as it could have been. That suggested she'd iced it. You're here, she said from outside the door that was balanced to cover the opening. We liked it so much on our first trip that we thought we'd try it again. Shooting people, killing people, punching people. The employees who work for Freddie J. Mac bring out the best in us, I said. You, of all people, should know that. I know that you are extremely violent and can't be reasoned with. You need to leave Mr. Mac's office or I will call security. Then you need to call security. Better yet, get Freddy down here. We'd like to talk with him. I don't think I'll do that. She waved her hand and the young executive, who also sported a heavy bruise on his face, nodded and returned to his office. I want to punch you in the head again so bad, Jenny said to her. I won't let you get close enough for that, dear, the woman said in her patronizing tone. In due time, Jenny said softly. In the meantime, why don't you send your boys after us? We can knock them down one by one. Then we all get to go home. Home is the last place I want to go. I prefer it here, the woman replied. You need to get a life, Jenny countered. What a sad existence you lead. Mac the knife has let you down and you remain loyal. So sad, don't you think, lover? I would be devastated by the betrayal. I'd go home and order a pizza or two, I offered. I don't like pizza, the woman replied. So weak, Jenny said. I feel sorry for you. I still want to punch you, but now I want to do it out of pity. You people are professionals? That's hard to believe unless your profession is circus performers. She was attempting to delay us. Looking past her, people were casually leaving their cubicles and heading to the elevators. They disappeared in small groups until there were only a few left. You're good. You should probably come work for us, I suggested. Hold on. Jenny glared at me over her shoulder. Sorry, misplaced loyalty secretary woman. I may have been hasty. I must retract my offer. You are not welcome to join our company. Thank you. Jenny held up one thumb to the side where I could see. I pulled my pistol out and examined it, four rounds in the magazine and one in the chamber. I dropped the magazine and ejected the round into my hand. The barrel looked clean enough. I wouldn't have to do anything to keep firing. I fed the round into the magazine and slapped it home. I released the slide. It stripped around and sent it into the breech. I held the pistol up for all to see. I'm good, I told Jenny after putting on a show for the secretary. She had to know weapons. Her job was not one for the faint of heart. I didn't need to show off the 357 Magnum. All we had to do was get back up to the 62nd floor. That wasn't going to happen until the operators were dealt with. We put ourselves in a position where they had to come to us. Maybe you can have your boys come where we can off them one by one and end this day of fun and games. I flicked my fingers at her to go away. She crossed her arms and looked down her nose at me. I got that enough when I was in school, so you can save it, because now I don't have to tolerate a school marm. Back then, they had some authority over me. You? You have none. Go away. She continued to stand where she was. I aimed through the space in the doorway and fired, shattering her computer. The monitor puffed a tendril of black smoke that drifted into the air. The secretary jumped. Go away, I reiterated. She stormed off. She was never going to be an ally. Let her antagonize Jack in the Box until he's forced to take action. Send them to us. Attacking an enemy in an entrenched position isn't what operators do. We find weaknesses and exploit them. Time constraints are an artificial construct as well. Why five in the afternoon? Jenny shook her head. The cleaners seemed adamant about the time. I expect we'll learn why at some point. We settled into the chairs and waited. The cubicles and small offices had been cleared except for three people who watched us individually from three unique angles. What if they're getting a bigger gun that can shoot through this glass? Jenny asked. Then we're screwed. For some reason, I feel like we have everything we're going to get. I don't see anyone pulling out a 50 cal sniper rifle to shoot us from a 100 feet away. That would blow out the glass behind us, too. 
Summoning the authorities isn't high on their to-do list, and glass falling in the street below the tower would bring unwanted attention. The young executive returned after 15 minutes. We could see him coming before he arrived because of his shirt. The pink floral print stood out like neon green on a construction site. I absentmindedly stroked the light blue shirt I had taken from him. It was a nice shirt with a good fit. Probably cost him good money. Hey, I shouted. Get me another shirt and you can have this one back. And no, I don't want that pink one. It would vault you into the fast-paced world of high fashion, a place you clearly have never been, the young man shouted back. Your blue jeans and wife-beater muscle shirts would look out of place. I'm sorry, I don't have any more shirts that might fit with your fashion sense. Have I ever worn a tank top? A shirt most unseemly named the wife-beater? I asked Jenny. She laughed and shook her head. There we have it, Jagoff. I am a slave to corporate executive fashion. If only I could put on my suit jacket and fedora that I left in our car. You wouldn't mind if we went to the garage, would you? He looked sideways at someone out of view. After a few moments, he answered, Not my call. It was good that he knew his limitations. Someone higher than him was pulling the strings. Way higher. It had to be Freddie Mac and the gang of four. Will they capitulate if we win? According to my numbers, we're most of the way there. On Freddie's desk was a landline. I checked through the phone numbers on it to find the Skyline 2 conference room, the one we had been summoned to hours earlier. I punched the number in and waited. I hear you've taken over my office, Freddie, a.k.a. Jack in the Box, answered. You're down five of your eight people. Do you really want us to kill the other three? You're going to have to send them to us because we're perfectly comfortable in here. You have a nice rubber tree in case I need to relieve myself. Great visibility. And that bulletproof glass? Nice touch, Freddy. The line clicked over to mute, but was still active. I hope they decide to end this, Jenny said. Me too, lover. We proved ourselves and then some. I don't see the need to kill anyone else. We will if we have to, but that doesn't do favors for any of our organizations. I already feel like I need a shower. That's because you're sweating, even though I told you not to. Ordering one not to sweat isn't as effective as one would hope. I also have given that order. My body has defied me. You can probably pull those bandages off my back. We think you should come back upstairs and talk with us, came from the phone. We think you should come down here. You don't have a target on your backs, so we'll defer on your gracious offer for us to stand in the open. I'm not sure I could have dripped any more sarcasm on top of my rejection. Crass as usual, Paul, a.k.a. Captain Shortpants, added. I'd rather be crass than a man who can't be trusted. I wasn't amused by the gang of four. You guys give our business a bad name. I'll be happy to lead your organizations to a better place. See, we still have a little side bet that you're not going to make it past the final three. Send them down. We'll shoot it out and be done. We're not leaving this office. At five, the police will arrive and scour the building looking for you if the contest has not been resolved. I smacked my lips and waited. I wasn't raising to the bait. We'd be well gone before five if I had my way. I usually didn't get my way. Come on down and let's discuss this in the nicest office in the building. My compliments, Freddy. You have good taste. Too bad that doesn't extend to the people you've hired. How long have you been planning this? Spur of the moment, Freddy replied. Put princess love chunks on, I said. I mean, Philippa. What? came the terse reply. Your operator left you. I'll deal with her separately, the woman replied. What I hear you saying is that there aren't three operators left, but only two. No swapsies, Jenny mouthed. Swapsies? Indeed, we miscounted. You've been very active. Surprisingly so. You expected the upstart newcomers to roll over for the old hands? Guess what didn't happen? I can't believe how wrong you were in your judgment of me and Miss Jenny. Wherever you got your information from, you should probably not use that source again. Good point. You two have maintained a low profile. We should have expected what little we found wouldn't necessarily be correct. I laughed out loud. You guys hired Babs Jekyll, that New York City reporter, she was a knothead, but she did us a solid by misleading you. 
I'll thank her if I see her again. You seem to have an answer for everything, a snide, sarcastic answer. If you were the example of what it means to be classy, then I'll remain snide and crass. Come down here if you want to talk with Jenny and me. I hung up. My hatred of those people is justified. They don't even make me feel bad about hating them. I feel bad about killing their operators. But if they're anything like the leadership, then they deserve each other and deserve the same fate. Miss Jenny has spoken. I hammered a fist into my hand. She smiled without humor. This day had been hard and was getting harder. I hadn't been sure they would abide by the terms of their own deal, but with each passing moment, they assured us that they only had one goal, and that was to see us dead. Fifteen minutes became thirty minutes. Those who worked on the floor never returned. Only the three in the cubicles and the young executive with the pink floral shirt. He had retreated to his office, where he was either on his phone or on his computer. At least one of them is working, I muttered. I think those other three are operators, waiting for us to make a mistake. I know you always prefer to act rather than react, but can we get ahead of them, put them on their heels somehow? Karate for defense only, I said. You watch too much television, Jenny replied. I don't watch hardly any television. I'm shocked. It's as if you don't know me. Then again, you did bribe me with naked hot tubs, so I guess you know as much about me as you need, like my weaknesses. I feel like I should have some defense against it, but find myself completely disarmed. I noticed movement. I nodded toward the cubicles. Don't look, but we have the three conducting a little confab, heads down and whispering. Maybe we are going to get some kind of action. Get your thunder stick ready. Jenny blocked their view with her body as she checked her 9mm. She'd already swapped magazines. She had one round in the chamber. She was ready. Let me have that 357. Jenny dug it out of her purse and handed it to me. I tucked the revolver into my waistband and kept the 45 in my hand. We stayed clear of the gap between the door and the frame. The three backed out of the cubicles and down the aisle until they disappeared around the wall standing in front of the elevators. That left us alone with the young executive, but only for five minutes. He received a call, which lasted barely five seconds, then immediately stood and left. Do we head for the stairs? Jenny asked. I think the gang of four is on their way. They don't want their people to see them. The elevator dinged, and right on cue, the four walked off. They followed Jack in the Box since we were in his office. I slid the door far enough out of the way that they could get through, but no farther. We waited with pistols in hand. You won't need those, Guido said. You've been nothing but duplicitous since you first opened your mouth. You'll have to excuse us if we keep our weapons out and trained on you for more lies and more backstabbing and you die. We're done playing games. You need us to get out of here, Jack in the Box said. Freddy, if I didn't know better, I'd say you're a lying pile of crap. Your cleaners are being paid to make sure there is no evidence. You four will go into the incinerator, just like everyone else who has lost their lives today. Loyalty in this business goes to those who pay the bills. We have $8 million of your money to pay off everyone involved and bring them on board with our organization. I hate to say it, but I think you've shown your hand and it's not going to win. Princess Love Chunks? I ought to sick my entire organization on you. Philippa looked less than amused. I chuckled softly. It's easier to kill you if you have a ridiculous name. I won't shoot someone I like, but that doesn't apply to any of you. Guido, Princess Love Chunks, Captain Short Pants, and Jack in the Box. For the record, your first name was Snagglepuss. I'm not sure that makes anything better, Philippa replied. The others sneered and scowled. The looks on your faces. Jenny openly laughed at them, as if they'd opened a can and phony snakes had popped out. Chapter 13 Invincibility lies in the defense, the possibility of victory in the attack. Sun Tzu We've had about enough of you, too, Paul said, glaring at Jenny and subconsciously rubbing the back of his head. She winked at him. Jenny was fed up, too. I wanted to shoot him, but she wasn't that fed up. She was a good person. I resorted to violence more quickly than she did, 
although she had already hit him in the head twice. I might have been a bad influence on her. We have a new proposal. We'll call off the game, but you'll partition your organization, allocating assets that are located in our areas. So you've changed nothing. Here's a new proposal. I return your two million to each of you as a buyout. You go away, and we take over your four organizations. Freddy spread his arms to take in the entire 58th floor. This is worth far more than two million. I'm sorry. I meant two million and you walk away with your lives. I aimed at Freddie Mac's groin. You may live, but you won't walk away. What's it going to be? It didn't take the four any time at all to come to the conclusion I wanted to hear. Two million, profit on the current contracts, and we retire. We'll discuss the profit part. I'm not taking additional risk without a financial incentive. You'll turn over all your information to Gladys. I'm sure you know who she is. Sure, Guido replied too quickly. Get your last operators in here so we can see them. We're expecting three because that's how many were watching us, but we know there are more. Send them to us for a quick conversation. And I want the woman's name and number. She was the only one who seemed to have her wits about her. The best operators know when to wave off the contract. Sure, Guido agreed once more, even though the woman wasn't his operator. Philippa? I asked. Sure, she's all yours. All of them are ours. They'll be brought into our system, I said. It bothered me that they agreed too easily. Of course, you'll get your two mil after the transition is complete. The train had already left the station. They were in full whatever mode, agreeing with everything we said. I need you all to write it down. Your confessions that you run organizations of paid killers. Legible handwriting, please. And don't forget to sign your names, your real names, not that dreck you're using for public consumption. Finally, I'd pushed them to a point they hadn't considered, judging by the looks of disbelief on their faces. I continued, What? You expect me to trust you after all the lies you've told us? I will have leverage over you, and then you're going to have to trust me. I think the strangest thing is that you will, because you know we've been straight with you from the outset. You think us naive, maybe even pretenders, but you know that our word is good. If we say we won't use this unless you break the deal, we won't. There you are. I'm sure Freddie J. Mac Knuckle Draggers Incorporated has pads of paper in the desk drawers. Grab them and start writing. I waved indiscriminately with my pistol, finger off the trigger. They didn't look at me, but at my weapon, which I had taken from the first interloper, who was using blanks, even though we also carried live ammunition. We hadn't killed him, I remembered. I thought we had. The cleaners said they took him away. It made me wonder if the so-called leaders of the organizations killed him after we left. Failure wasn't acceptable in our line of work. I thought about leaving the forty-five in Jack in the Box's desk drawer, but it hadn't been his. Then again, I had no intention of walking into downtown Chicago with a concealed pistol. They had laws to punish honest citizens like me. I raised an eyebrow at my own claim. We'd only killed seven people today. I really don't want to kill anyone else. It's been a full day. I waved again toward the cubicles. For the first time that day, I felt like these four were finally dancing to the beat of our drum. They looked at each other, but none of them moved toward the cubicles. I said, right! I pointed my pistol at the one we had named Princess Love Chunks. Ladies first. You wouldn't shoot me because you are decent people. I'm unarmed. She held her arms out. Her purse dangled from her wrist. I brought my pistol up, aimed and fired in less than a single heartbeat. The round ripped through her expensive Gucci purse, tearing it in half. The contents fell to the floor. A shredded wallet, makeup, lipstick, and a slim folding pocket knife with a three or four inch blade. She flinched at the impact. The others dove to the side. I think you underestimate the loathing I have for each of you. I stabbed the pistol barrel at the nearest cubicle. Philippa Luisa San Bernardino showed a spark behind her eyes. Fear followed by hatred. She would be a problem. They would all be problems until we could ensure they were out of the business. She stooped to pick up her things, letting the wallet that was torn on one side dangle from her fingertips. She looked at me. You're going to pay for that. Already have by being the pawn in your live-action game. 
Take it out of the two million you'll get back when you're playing in my game. She sat at the nearest cubicle and riffled the drawers until she found a notebook and pen. She tore a page out and started writing. The rest of you, too. They had straightened up. Their mouths worked as if they wanted to say something, but none of them made a sound. They sat where we could see them and followed Philippa's lead. The secretary returned. She strolled down the aisle, watching me the entire time. When she reached the cubicle with her boss, she stopped. He handed her the pen. She declined, opting to continue to her desk where she removed a yellow legal pad with most of the pages flipped over and a custom waterman pen. He dictated very close to us while I glanced from face to face, watching the others. To whom it may concern, that filth known as Ian Bragg has caused me to make this statement of my own free will. I run an organization of paid assassins called Chicago Industries. We're responsible for over 100 deaths in this city. I ordered all of them at the request of our clients, list to be provided separately should any legal trouble accrue from this letter. My clients will not accept their names being associated with Chicago Industries, but we have the payment information. As such, this letter probably won't be any good when it comes to making allegations against me, since it's coerced and I'm making it up so Ian and Jenny Bragg don't kill me. Love, Freddie J. Mack. I expected as much. The truth hurts. A hundred, that's a big number. We'll be happy to absorb your group into ours. Congratulations on your retirement, Freddie. In this business, retirement means something completely different, Freddie countered. But it doesn't have to. You'll be retired in the normal sense of the word. I recommend the Caribbean, a non-extradition country like St. Martin. You'd have to bone up on your French, but at least they won't be sending you back here to stand trial for your crimes against humanity. Of course you would know the non-extradition countries, Captain Shortpants added. He wasn't one with original thoughts. He came across as a bitter soul. Write your confession. I once again pointed with my weapon. Jenny and I hadn't exposed more than half of our bodies in the doorway. With the four seated or off to the side, I could see where we might provide tempting targets. But besides them and the secretary, there was no one left on the floor. At least not where we could see them. I suspected they were listening, since the secretary returned right when Freddie Mac had to write something. Jenny started to fidget. She was growing more anxious with each passing second. Hey, I said to get her attention. When she looked at me, I glanced down at her pistol where she was nervously stroking the trigger. Damn it, she mumbled, immediately straightening her finger outside the trigger guard and renewing her vigil watching the secretary and Freddie Mac. Jack in the box signed the sheet the secretary had written and held it out. Jenny stepped back. Put it on the floor and move away, Jenny ordered. Freddy flicked it toward her and let it drift to the floor. He held up his hands while he stepped back. The others brought their short notes to the office and dropped them toward the doorway. They backed up obediently. I raised my pistol and assumed my firing stance. What is this? Freddy demanded. Jenny dragged the papers in with her toe around the corner where she could bend over and pick them up. She read through each of them before nodding to me. Although their penmanship is deplorable and wouldn't have passed my eighth grade, their statements are sufficient. Neither of us was a lawyer, but we knew a good lawyer who happened to be on the Peace Archive's payroll. Take a picture and send them to Anastasia. Get her take on them. What are you doing? Guido stepped up. That's not to be shed unless we double-cross you. If we have them in our possession here, that would make your duplicity inevitable. But in the hands of our legal counsel, you'll be more compliant since your demise is barely a phone call away. Jenny finished messaging the images to Anastasia Stacy Milford, Esquire. Jenny's phone immediately rang. I couldn't hear what Stacy said, but Jenny's answer was clear. Those are the statements attesting to their positions as heads of illegal organizations, because they've been holding us hostage here for the past four hours. We think we've convinced them to let us go, and they are going to turn their organizations over to our control. That was the cost of their complete and utter failure. Jenny laughed and nodded. That's right. We beat them like ugly clown dolls. Jenny hung up and stuffed the phone into her purse. She has the documents and will store them securely, labeled for transmission to the FBI should anything happen to her or us. Guido was the first to flop into a chair. He held his head in his hands with his elbows on his knees. 
Paul sidled up next to Guido to rest his hand on the other man's back, who shrugged off the friendly gesture with an angry jerk. Philippa crossed her arms and sulked. Freddy leaned against his secretary's desk. He also crossed his arms and watched Jenny and me while we watched him. You finally see reason. Thanks for that. We'll be on our way. Your people can continue their business while you can make your arrangements for your retirement. Simple as that. Don't betray our trust, and you won't find yourselves on the wrong end of a hit. You keep threatening us, Freddy said. I stopped him before he could say any more. It's leverage and a promise of action that we've shown we can back up. Stop trying to play us, and you'll stop getting played. I enjoyed my turn of phrase. It wasn't lyrically profound, but it made my point in an impressive way. Jenny tucked the sheets into her purse. I think it's time to go, I said, and stepped into the doorway. I scanned the cubicles for anyone who may have been hiding, but saw no one. Thanks to the cleaners, we could go to our vehicle in the parking garage. The authorities wouldn't be waiting for us. Thanks to our leverage being in Stacy's hands, the gang of four shouldn't be coming after us either. Our day was looking up. We strolled out. You're going to escort us, of course, I told the four. We are not, Guido replied. Come on, Freddy. I think you can take us by yourself, since you have the influence in this building. You too, I gestured toward the secretary. She sighed. Jenny nudged her with the 9 millimeter. Despite her act, she wasn't used to weapons being flaunted. At this point in our day, the pistols seemed like natural extensions of our arms. Jack in the box and his number two led the way while we followed. We kept an eye on those left behind. Guido? Captain Shortpants? Princess Love Chunks? I said as I passed, tapping my brow with my pistol for each person. Crass and uncultured, Paul stated. You people have a lot to learn. I laughed at him, only to find, when I looked back, the elevators blocked by at least a dozen people who worked on the 58th floor. Chapter 14 I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to always reach my destination. Jimmy Dean Tell them they need to let us pass, and while you're at it, You'll want to tell them that you're retiring and we'll be their new bosses, I whispered harshly at the man in front of me. I'm not so sure I want to retire from this business. You see, Chicago Industries isn't the most lucrative of my businesses. I'll give it up and your two mil if you let me keep this part of the business. I looked at Jenny. She shrugged. I'm good with that. We don't want this part of your business. We only want what you agreed to keeping your people off our backs, and that means this mob, too. We'll handle the contracts for your client-directed business. He flicked his fingers at the crowd. It's all right. We're still in business. Get back to work. Bonuses for everyone for today, as soon as I get back. He's coming back. We're not going to do anything to him, I promised. The people were reluctant to clear away. Don't make this weird, I said. Jack in the box waved once more, and they slowly moved down the hallway. One of them punched the elevator call button. A car arrived almost immediately. I stayed behind Freddie Mac until I was sure the car was empty. The four of us entered. Jenny backed in, fully engaged in her role as tail-end Charlie. I punched the button for the fourth level below ground, the parking garage. Much to my surprise, we went all the way to the garage without stopping. The doors opened, and the four of us stepped out. No one waiting for us. That's how you earn my trust, Freddy Mac. Do what you say you're going to do. I jammed my arm in between the doors and held the elevator while the secretary and Freddy reboarded. We'll be in touch. I let the door go, and it closed. I had nothing impactful to add. I'd already said my piece. Jenny put her pistol in her purse. I shook my head. We need to get rid of these. Just the pistols. Keep the ammo, because I don't want to waste the time to wipe off every shell. It's not as illegal to have ammunition. We unloaded the pistols and wiped them down, then tossed them in a garbage can. We made our way to our Jeep Grand Cherokee. I didn't use the remote to unlock it. I hit the deck and crawled around to look underneath the frame. Jenny handed me her phone with the light activated. I scanned 100% of the area beneath the Jeep. 
I couldn't see into the engine compartment. I unlocked the door with the key and carefully opened it. It took another two minutes checking under the dash before I popped the hood. I winced with each click and thunk. I dropped the hood to secure it. Are we good to go? Jenny asked. I think so. Let's see if the road is open. The jeep started and ran strong as it always did. I eased out of the parking spot and rolled at five miles per hour up the ramps. The circling feeling was always disconcerting. We had four levels to climb. That was 32 turns where we could find an unwelcome surprise. We idled upward. No cars were moving out of the garage, but it was early afternoon. Or Freddy wielded as much influence as he implied. We didn't have to pay as we had been given a VIP pass. We inserted it into the slot and the barrier lifted. I don't like this, I said. That they kept their word? Jenny asked. That's just it. They didn't. They're planning something. Get Gladys on the line. I handed my phone to Jenny, and she dialed the number from memory. Gladys answered on the first ring. Jenny held the phone to my ear. Gladys, just answer yes or no. Are they holding your family hostage? Yes, came the quick answer. We'll take care of it immediately, if you agree. Yes. I nodded for Jenny to end the call. How did you ever come up with that? Gladys wouldn't have agreed to that meeting if she wasn't under pressure. They had to have her family. It was the only way. We knew where Gladys lived because she had invited us over to watch the big game, Packers versus the Bears. I didn't see the allure, but it was the only time we ever got to see her with her hair down, so to speak. There was lots of food of the kind I loved but wouldn't treat myself to because being in shape was something I demanded of myself. Jenny, too. We ate healthy and well except for the odd meal while traveling. Find us the nearest White Castle. I could go for a bathroom break. I was getting close to defiling Freddy's rubber tree. Jenny perked up. Me too. She tapped away at her cell phone. I continued on a street away from the tower, driving with traffic. I seemed to be the only one who wasn't weaving in and out, but I refused to drive like that. The restaurant was farther away than I wanted, but still on the way to North Chicago, where Gladys had her home. She didn't live too far from the club, but slightly in the lower rent district. We had a house right on the club's private golf course, with security and the amenities of a subdivision that catered exclusively to the rich. How much time are we going to spend in the house here? I have to say, I prefer the one in the Hamptons. It's because it's right on the ocean. Even with the frequent weather changes, it's a nice place. Plus, we bought it ourselves instead of being given it, like the one here. Given. Interesting word. I think passed down from the previous owner, as we'll pass it to the next owner of the club when we find someone with the right hands to take over from us. When will that be, Ian? Jenny asked more sharply than I was prepared to hear. I didn't have a date in mind. I'd been having fun, right up until the ambush in the tower and getting demonized by our counterparts. We're the good guys. As long as the vice president trusts us and counts on us, I think we'll have to remain in the business. He's not working with our company. He only works with us. Jenny's head dropped and she stared at her lap. I nudged her. Being in business with me isn't all it's cracked up to be. You ordered sloppy barbecue to win me over. You seduced me. She brightened. She pointed for me to take a left at the next intersection. You seduced me, Mr. Smooth-Talking Man. I told you not to have that third drink. If I remember correctly, I wouldn't buy it for you. Two drinks and you were trying to be my second skin. I could barely keep my clothes on with all your pawing. I nudged her again since I was needling. She hadn't pawed me at all. We were well-mannered. I hadn't gone back to my room, which oddly was next to Miss Jenny's. I had to surveil Jimmy's house first. The good stuff came later, and I was done. Jenny was like no one I had ever experienced before. Hitmen weren't supposed to fall in love, but my morals were different. I would never be a James Bond type with a different woman every night. I only wanted one. You have corrupted me beyond all recognition of my former self, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I shook my head. I fear that Naked Hot Tub will have to wait. We'll have more work than just clearing Gladys's home of intruders. I think we're going to have to go after each of our counterparts and put them in their place. The fact that they leveraged Gladys to get to us doesn't sit well with me. 
Are we going to hit them? They need to be out of this business, but I don't know how to take over their organizations without their cooperation. I think we need to lean on them real hard. Torture? Jenny was appalled. I don't want to do that, although they'd be a little more pliable if they were missing a leg or a few fingers. Don't even joke like that, Jenny replied. You're not going to torture anyone. Either we remove bad people from the world, or they aren't bad enough. A truth missile delivered at hypersonic speed. It sounded like I was trying to convince myself. Over the years, Jenny hadn't missed a thing. That is better than I could say it. We'll need to look at each one. We have four targets who deserve personal attention. We can't bid it to our operators. We'll have to track these four to wherever they will be found. We'll put Gladys on it. She'll want payback once we've cleared her house. Maybe we could have kept one of the pistols, Jenny said. We never keep the evidence, no matter what. We can't have anything that ties us from one event to another. We'll be fine. The good news is that we have a lot of bullets. That's the good news? She couldn't follow my logic, probably because I didn't have any. We weren't completely without punch. With pliers to remove the bullets, we could dump enough gunpowder to make a big bang. It could be the start of a series of fireworks culminating in the deaths of those they were meant to distract. We aren't toothless. Bullets can ruin someone's day, although before you mention it, I'll concede that they would be a shade more effective if fired from a gun. I spotted the telltale sign. White Castle. You are a strange man, Jenny said. We both wanted to hit the bathroom and grab something to eat. We wouldn't take very long. Gladys's family was waiting on us. I didn't know if the gang of four would call their people off before we got there. If they did, that would be someone else we needed to hunt down. I started to feel like a vigilante, hunting down and eliminating those who had wronged us. Chapter 15 Victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. Sun Tzu Gladys lived in a middle-class neighborhood in a cookie-cutter house that looked like all the other houses in the subdivision. The roads didn't follow cardinal directions, but meandered enough to give the feeling of rolling hills. It also kept the casual guest from seeing how extensive the subdivision was. I'll drive past her house, take a good look. We'll park on the next block and walk back. I'm all eyes, Jenny replied. I slowed as we approached Gladys's house. I kept my eyes straight ahead driving like a normal person would in a subdivision when they are going home. We sped up briefly and coasted until we found a gap between houses and driveways. We pulled in and shut the vehicle down. I'd tell you to stay here, but we need to check both front and back, and the backyard butts up against the neighbors on three sides. I'm not sure how we get a look since Gladys and her neighbors have fences. I remember. Jenny pursed her lips and whistled. If it's fenced on all sides, do we need to check the back? Maybe not. The only access is from the front, but they would expect infiltration from the least accessible route. That makes no sense. It does if you think like the one trying to get into a place they're trying to keep you out of, as in, no one uses the front door. Tells me we want to use the front door, Jenny said. But they'll watch that first. We can't be seen by the neighbors either. Did you see Gladys's security system last time we were here? Jenny shrugged and smirked. Why would I look at a security system at a friend's house? I gestured toward the house. Because you might need to know for times like this. Always paranoid, Jenny commented. I wish you would have been just as wary for the meeting in the tower. I nodded. Not my finest moment. I can't think about that now since it makes me angrier with each rethink. Sorry. Gladys's house, shall we? Stroll down there and head in the front door? I thought for a moment. I think it's time for Gladys to come home. I dialed our chief of staff's number. You've had a full day. Take the rest of the day off. Go home and relax. I think I'll do that. Thank you, Gladys replied. We wait, I said. When Gladys gets here, we walk in the garage with her and let her close the door behind us. We'll let ourselves in through the kitchen in about ten minutes, we'll stroll back and hang out between the two houses. I hope the neighbors don't call the cops on us. We can hope for that. We weren't going into this with a great deal of confidence. 
We had Gladys's support if the neighbors got wind, but they probably weren't home. Most in this area worked, needing both parents' incomes to afford the home. There weren't many children out and about. It was still too early for school or work to end. It was the middle of the afternoon. I think we'll be good. I turned on the aux player and dialed up my media stick where I had all the Rush albums. I played the first two songs on the Hold Your Fire album, Force 10 and Time Stand Still. Once they were over, we left the Jeep and strolled up the street. When we reached the home before Gladys's, we dodged into the yard and waited at the corner of their house, a few steps from Gladys's garage. We wedged ourselves into a bush. It was only two more minutes before Gladys arrived. Judging by her revving engine and speed, we had probably looked suspicious during our slow drive through the neighborhood. The residents drove through at a high rate of speed. I doubted anyone let their kids play in the street. It would have been like Death Race 2000 out there. The garage door started to rise. Jenny and I waited until the car was in the garage. We rushed across the short space between the two houses and inside before the door started down. We crouched beside the passenger side of the car. Gladys stepped out. I held a finger to my lips. She nodded slightly, closed her door, and walked around the front of the car, up a single step, and into the house. We waited until she closed the door behind her before we rose. I looked for anything I could use as a weapon, but it was a small garage with few tools. A short bench had what was needed to wrap presents. The scissors weren't any good, but the box cutter held promise. It would make for a messy kill, but it was better than nothing. I pressed my ear against the door. I could hear a loud voice, Gladys giving someone the big hairy what for. She had had enough, and it was time for them to go. Them. There was more than one. They were in the kitchen, a man's voice. Her husband had died of cancer, leaving her with two teenagers. They were the family that had been threatened. How many was the question that needed an answer? What was the right number? Could two ride herd on teenagers, or would they need more to make sure they didn't contact their friends? Gladys had become fed up. No wonder she gave them a piece of her mind the second she arrived home. I pressed my ear against the door to gain insight into where the operators were and how many were inside. I visualized the floor plan. It was open, with the kitchen looking out into the living room and dining room. The bedrooms were in the back, lined up one after another. It wasn't anything I would like, but it wasn't my house. It was what Gladys bought with her husband's life insurance. She was close to her children, whereas parents usually wanted space between their bedroom and the kids' rooms. Three bedrooms and two bathrooms spread throughout 2,000 square feet. There weren't many places to hide. The kitchen door could be seen from almost anywhere in the house. We couldn't get in without someone seeing. We would have to wait until everyone went to sleep. I continued to listen. Small talk, no talk, television. Gladys yelled at someone to get out of her kitchen. A pan clanked. Hey, why'd you leave the door unlocked? A gruff voice enunciated clearly. Screw you, I'm upset. I've been upset since you arrived. Surprise? A heavy tread pounded across the kitchen. Go time, I said to Jenny. I timed it, close, hand reaching for the lock. I turned the knob and rammed it hard with my shoulder. It jumped open six inches before it slammed into his hand. I drove with my legs to push the door into his body, clearing space to get through. It caught him off guard. His fingers jammed and his hand curled. He bounced back from the door but stayed upright. Through the door and into the attack. I sent the heel of my hand toward his chin, but he turned aside, making it only a glancing blow. I followed through with a left jab to the side of his head. He charged into me, but not with his full momentum as he was still off balance. I caught him on my hip, lifted, and turned to throw him into the refrigerator. Jenny hit him before he landed on the floor. She caught him hard with a right cross. I hadn't expected her to clean up the fight, but it helped. The kitchen was clear. I glanced across the living room but saw no one. How many and where? I demanded from Gladys. Only one more, in the bathroom. It gave me a brief respite. I stepped forward, leaned back, and kicked the man on the floor in the head with everything I had. I limped to the back hallway and waited outside the bathroom. Jenny followed me. My hand hovered over the knob, waiting for it to turn. I planned to use the same maneuver as when I entered the kitchen. 
The water ran and then shut off. I crouched to get better leverage. The knob turned. When the door cracked open, I rammed into it. The man stumbled backward and fell over the toilet. I surged inside and caught him by his ears, slamming the back of his head into the tub ledge. He was twisted sideways because of the toilet, but he knew this was life or death. He tried to kick me while snapping his teeth at my forearm. He balled a fist and hit me in the abs. I hammered his neck into the tub ledge and pushed off, raising my leg to come down on his throat with my knee. His tongue thrust from his mouth as he gagged and gasped for breath. I pressed down, letting my weight rest on his throat with the back of his head stuck in the tub. He punched at my leg and grasped my pant leg, pulling and jerking. I realized he was trying to hit me in the groin. I grabbed his wrist and held tightly. Jenny kicked him in the leg to keep him from getting his foot under him. His efforts quickly faded and weakened until he stopped altogether. I stayed on his throat until I was sure he was more than passed out. His eyes and mouth remained open, hoping for one last respite. Just like the man who held Jenny hostage in Vegas, this wasn't our business, and anyone who would accept such a job was the lowest form of life. I was angry, and that didn't bode well for my enemies in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. This man hadn't had a chance. I gripped under his arms and dragged him to the kitchen after the initial fumble to get him out of the bathroom. Gladys nodded to Jenny and me, her lips white from pressing together so hard. She shook with an anger I'd never seen her display. That helped me to calm down. She lined up and kicked the man on the floor in the head. He groaned and rolled to his side, half conscious. Take it easy, Gladys. We need him to answer a few questions. We want to know where their orders came from, or rather, who they came from. I understand. She kicked him in the thigh and left to check on her children. A banging on the door distracted me from watching the man struggle to consciousness. Jenny gestured and hurried to the bedroom hallway. I tossed a glass of water into the man's face, but he didn't sputter and come to like I expected. He continued to groan, but remained on his side in nearly a fetal position. A crash sounded from the back. Need me? I called out. No answer. I bolted for the hallway to find Gladys hugging her youngest, and the door frame shattered from where a hasp and lock had been installed. The other door had a similar setup. Let me find the keys, I said. Tell Connor to relax. We'll have it open in just a couple. I returned to the kitchen to find the first man gone. The front door was open. I ran out. Tires squealed as he burned a donut in the middle of the road and raced off. He hadn't been as injured as we thought. He must have had a skull made of cast iron. I closed the front door and searched the second man's pockets. Thankfully, he was still dead, and he had keys in his pocket. I returned to Connor's bedroom door and got it on the second try, removing the lock and opening the hasp. I stepped aside for Gladys. She hugged her son. Her daughter, Chrysalis, moved in to wrap her up from behind, and she started to cry. We excused ourselves silently and returned to the kitchen. The kill had been clean. There was no blood and no soiled trousers, a usual byproduct of strangulation. He'd just used the bathroom. I hoisted him to my shoulder and carried him to the garage, where I put him in the trunk of Gladys's car. Find a number from Mac Industries and then for their cleaners. We have another job for them tonight. Jenny used her phone to start searching. I closed the trunk on the body. We needed to get rid of it quickly before it started to decompose but I wanted to hand that over to the professionals. I also wanted to send a message to whoever hired them that we had changed the rules. I thought I had been clear with the gang of four, which made me wonder why they hadn't called off their men once we cleared the tower. Were they trying for a different angle? Gladys would have the answer once she was free to talk. In the kitchen, we looked through the refrigerator and saw what we thought Gladys intended to make for dinner, so we started cooking. If they weren't going for BLTs, bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches, then their previous menu was going to be superseded. The sizzle of bacon brought the three into the living room. Gladys held them tightly to her sides. BLTs for dinner, I said. Jenny waved the knife while slicing the tomatoes nice and thin. We need to get better knives. These hold a nice edge. We eat out too much, I replied, delivering my usual first answer of no. Not in the Hamptons. 
I'm getting them, Jenny countered. If your mind was made up, why did you ask? I didn't ask. Jenny smiled at me and then turned to Gladys and her kids. Toasted or not? And mayo? Toasted with mayo, Gladys confirmed. We finished the quick meal prep and set out everything on the small dining table. I can't thank you enough, Gladys said. Give yourself a hundred grand bonus. You shouldn't have been dragged into this, I said. Jenny and I weren't eating. The thing with eating too many hamburgers was that they stayed with you. You're too kind and generous. Gladys took a small bite. You can move in with us if you want. That house is empty way too much. I thought your lawyer moved into the guest house. Gladys took another small bite. Did she? I couldn't remember. It had been too long. We'd been working contracts from afar, burning up the cell phone's battery day after day and overworking the VPN for our computer, which we bricked before we left New York. I'd have to get another computer before I could do any work. Yes, Gladys confirmed. You are still welcome. We can get a hotel. No, this is my home, our home. Then get cutting-edge security installed. Something with a little oomph, you know. 10,000 volts and a security company ready to come on a moment's notice. Charge it to the club. I think we're doing well enough to afford it. Jenny looked at me. Aren't we? I asked. Gladys rested her hand on my arm. We're doing just fine, but you should show your faces around there a little more often. More truth bombs. You people are harshing my buzz. Where did you learn to talk like that? Jenny looked sideways at me. I'm hip. I'm groovy, I replied. Groovy? Jenny looked at the family, but they weren't entertained. They were still in shock. Gladys was handling it better than the kids. At least there was no longer a dead body in the bathroom or on the kitchen floor. Jenny continued searching and couldn't find a number for Mac Industries. Call Jack in the box's office. I put on my game face. Jenny tapped the numbers. It started to ring and Jenny handed me the phone. Freddie J. Mac, came the answering voice. Freddie, Ian Bragg here. We just expelled two of your boys from the home of my chief of staff. This is not a game you want to play with me. I have no idea what you're talking about, Freddie replied. You left in such a rush, we weren't sure where you were going or what you were going to do. Honestly, you're hard to work with. You still want to dissemble? How about you send your cleaners my way, or we'll come to them. The money will make it worth their while. What did you do, Ian? Freddie said, agonizingly slowly and in an infuriatingly condescending tone. He was trying to get under my skin, but I wasn't going to let him. I took my time answering. If it wasn't you, then one of the others leveraged our chief of staff by taking her family hostage. That kind of direct action isn't going to work for me. Being argumentative and sarcastic is one thing, but threatening our chief of staff has crossed a line. You say it wasn't you? Fine. Send me your cleaners or arrange a meetup, and together we can clean up some of the mess your fellows have made. It sounds like you're the one making the mess, Ian. I don't think I'll send my people. I don't want to get involved in your sordid business. Nice try, Freddy. You'll be hearing from us. I ended the call. Do we have a chance? He has all the cards when it comes to this town. He does not, Gladys interjected. Say the word and I'll take an active role in helping you resolve this situation. You are not an operator, I replied. Gladys shook her head. I'm not trying to be one, but you know what I do have? The contact information for every operator within a hundred miles. Give me a little budget to work with and I'll reduce our exposure. Your budget is eight million. You can get to work right now if it suits you. Do you need anyone to stay here with you? That'll be part of the package. I'll hire a short-term security company first and foremost, and then we'll take care of what's in the trunk of my car. That takes a load off our shoulders. We're going to the office where we'll start building our engagement packages. The gang of four isn't going to get away with this. Gladys zoomed in for hugs. I never took her for the emotional sort, but this was her family. Everyone had their weak spots. Mine was Miss Jenny. I wouldn't let her out of my sight until this was over. Chapter 16 To the mind that is still, the whole universe surrenders. Lao Tzu We drove straight to the club, where we received a hero's welcome, 
although not for the business at Gladys's house, but for showing up with bonuses for all staff. I should say promises of bonuses. We'd deliver the particulars once Jenny and I had the financials in front of us. It made me smile. Look at me, a business guy. The fact that we'd killed seven people earlier in the day was ancient history. The club was our business, a place for members to socialize, network, play a game of cards, get a drink, play tennis or golf, and simply escape from the rat race. People who made the kind of money needed for membership were either sporting family money or neck deep in the business world. We walked through, shaking hands and sharing kind words with members and staff alike. I didn't know why we were so popular. We were poor people from the other side of the tracks who had stumbled into leadership of the club. Pure dumb luck. It wasn't how you got in the door that mattered, but what you did once there. We did our best. We wanted nothing from the members, but they sought us out for our special services. And that's where we flourished. The club also served a mean fettuccine Alfredo, and pretty much every other dish on the menu was great. The best bartender I'd ever met worked for us. He knew everything. We extricated ourselves from the good people in the central area of the building to make our way to the sitting room bar where Mark was happily working. His real name was Prince Markle. It wasn't anything to joke about, but I always had something on the tip of my tongue. I resisted on most days. I shook his hand and looked around to make sure we were alone. What are you hearing from the community? He smiled and nodded. I wondered when you'd be in. Word on the street is that you've angered the wrong people by being too good at what you do. Jenny and I made faces at each other. I snort laughed and then rotated my neck to loosen my muscles. The race to mediocrity far exceeds the race for superior service. Punish those in the lead rather than improve your pace. That's it, Mark agreed. He pulled a half pint of the current dark beer on tap for me. Jenny called for her usual, a grasshopper. It was an ice cream drink with mint and alcohol. She'd grown fond of them, but only at this bar and only made by Mark. He went heavy on the ice cream and light on the creme de menthe. Any names of competitors that we should be concerned about? All the names. I suspect you know who they are. New York, Chicago, L.A., and Houston. We do. I studied the woodwork on the bar while sipping my beer. It was cold and smooth with a hint of chocolate and a cream head. I saluted Mark with my glass. Thanks for the info. We've got some work to do. To stay at the top? Mark asked. Never mind, that's not my business. I'll tell you that we will never accept mediocrity, no matter who pushes us. All members had a certain amount to spend in the club each month. It was a benefit of the ten grand a month dues. But for that, they pretty much drank and ate for free every day if they so desired. The staff was paid far more than a living wage. Tips were gravy on the main course. I dropped two hundred dollar bills on the bar. Keep doing what you do, Mark. We are better with you on board. Oh, we're giving bonuses to all staff as soon as I can get into our accounting. I heard, Mark winked. I only said it five minutes ago. You are rock stars to us. It's our pleasure to share the good words you share with us. Money talks and BS walks, I replied. I stood, grabbed my drink, and saluted once more before heading out. We needed to go upstairs and build folders on the targets. I contemplated contracting the hits, but knew it was probably best for Jenny and me to handle them personally. I had promised the gang of four, and it was a promise I intended to keep. Once in our office, we closed the door and got to work. When we came up for air, four hours had passed, and it was well into the evening. I called Gladys, but the only thing she would say was that it was taken care of. That was all I needed to hear. But then she added, I'm coming in. Don't leave your kids there. Work can wait. They're coming with me. It's dinner time. Didn't they just eat? To me, we had just left her house after making sandwiches. It's been four hours and they're teenagers, Gladys explained. On my way. She hung up. If she wanted to come to work, that was her business. I had no idea what hours she kept. As long as the business ran like it was supposed to, it didn't matter if butts were in seats at set hours. Even if it wasn't working, then it would have been incumbent upon us to set better goals for each position. We didn't need to do that since Gladys handled it, and judging by how happy the employees were, everything was going swimmingly. 
don't fix it if it isn't broken. Dinner, lover? And then we might still be able to swing naked hot tub. Right after we eat, aren't we supposed to wait a couple hours so we don't get cramps? That's pretty funny. I vow to not overeat so we can immediately enjoy the benefits of each other's company. Immediately, as in right now and in a hurry. Jenny replied, Today has been an exceptionally hard day. I had difficulty concentrating on the search. I'm not sure I made it very far. I buried myself in it to forget what happened. It makes me seethe when I think about it, so I have to turn it off. I think I made great progress. I've sent a note to one of our operators in New York City to query about Guido. I expect he'll be able to find something locally. As for Jack in the Box and Princess Love Chunks, their information here is extremely interesting. Seems like Freddy has a live-in girlfriend. Let me guess. Philippa Luisa San Bernardino. Goes by a different name, Maria Conchita, but the picture sure looks the same. Freddy and Maria sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. How old are you? I'm groovy years old, and you're 29. I am 29, Jenny replied indignantly. I knew that. It was meant to be a compliment, and now she was perturbed. I needed to listen to more podcasts on being married to help me stay out of sticky situations like this. You are beautiful, and I love you. Really? She didn't sound impressed. Distracted yet? Enough, Jenny admitted. Let's get something to eat. She was doing it for my benefit. I was hungry despite my earlier feast. Jenny wasn't. Maybe she'd get a salad, something light, or another grasshopper. The restaurant was quiet. We were ushered into a private table in an alcove, the same one we always had, no matter how busy the restaurant was. It was good to be the boss, although I told them to use the table for the good of the restaurant. They never did because it was our table, special with the jammer around it. They did what they had to do. Just like us. We'll bring you what's best, Timothy, our usual waiter said. He didn't take our order. He simply disappeared. He does that, I said, even though he'd never done that. Jenny looked sideways at me. She scooted her chair close so she could rest her head on my shoulder. I hugged her to me and kissed the top of her head while caressing her hair. It has been a hard day, Jenny whispered. I wasn't immune to killing people, but I was more used to it. Jenny had sanctioned a few, but it always came at a cost under the most extreme circumstances, as in they had been trying to kill her. Every time, except for today when she'd fired first. We returned home after dinner. It was only a two-minute drive from the club to our place positioned on the seventh hole. The lights were on in the guest house. Stacy was home. We drove into the garage. By the time we got out, we found our lawyer wearing a bathrobe and watching us. Is there anything I need to be aware of? She asked. She already knew, but wanted to hear it from us. You better come over. I'll make coffee. We sat on the overstuffed couches of the front room and walked through the day we had. At the end, Stacy chewed on her lip. When she spoke, it was in a quiet voice. You were ambushed and had to fight for your lives only to find that you continued to be the target of the attacks. It seems simple to me. The gang of four, as you call them, have invited themselves out of the business, leaving only you. But it's not just us. Those four are still out there, and we don't know for sure who put the goons on Gladys. Is there any doubt it was one of the four? None, I answered. Were their actions coordinated, as in they were doing everything as if they were only one entity? Yes. They filled the tower with operators from each of their organizations. I saw where she was going, her mind following a legal train that she could prove in court. Not that this could ever go to court, but we were trying the case ourselves. We were convicting the gang of four. Then they get treated as if they are one entity. You have to expel all of them. Usually, Stacy waffled far more in her advice. Not this time. She was clear. The conclusion was the same one I had already come to. That's the plan. We'll start right here in Chicago, then Houston, and finish in New York City, assuming everyone goes home except the happy couple. Stacy nodded. I'm still working on the real estate transaction in the Hamptons. It's a bit convoluted since the money came from the Caymans. 
it could lead to an audit. Then you and our accountants will get to earn your keep. If we get audited, I'm sure you'll be able to handle it. We aren't doing anything untoward. Stacy laughed into her coffee, not taking a drink to keep from snorting it out her nose. Everything you do is untoward. I scowled while hugging Jenny to me. Not everything. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, everything, even the club. How do you get complete ownership of such a place without any money-changing hands? I stopped scowling and put on my most winning smile. Because we're good people? Auditors love hearing those kinds of defenses. In any case, the club is the source of funding. Keeping money in the Caymans isn't illegal, but it raises red flags. However, with the recent collapse of banks out west, money in business accounts is not insured by the FDIC, so it only makes sense to keep money where there's less risk. State and federal agencies are going to have to reconcile themselves with the fact that successful business owners aren't responsible for propping up other failed businesses, so bank deposits will drop. Government can fix their problems, or watch as red flags get raised left and right as a testimonial to a failed sector and not as anything untoward. Sounds like you've got it. You're giving them the finger, but through your eloquence of prose and not the actual finger. It's probably better your way than mine. Do not give anyone the finger, Ian, Stacy cautioned. Some people deserve it, though. Chapter 17 It is never too late to be what you might have been. George Eliot The new day brought renewed vigor. We had wrapped up earlier than usual the evening before, but that was because we were tired of rehashing the longest and worst day of our lives. I made breakfast, like I usually did. Jenny appeared, wearing nothing but a skimpy pair of panties. She sat at the bar beside the central counter where the stovetop was located. Watch out for the grease spatters. I'd learned early in life that one wore clothes while cooking bacon. Bacon grease was unforgiving on exposed skin. Jenny leaned back and crossed her arms. Didn't sleep well? I asked, although it was more of a statement. I knew she didn't. I was exhausted and was asleep before her and never woke up during the night, but that's how I slept. Jenny had to toss and turn for an hour, no matter how tired she was. Badly. I poured a cup of coffee for her with designer creamer, salted caramel mocha. I didn't know what Gladys did to make sure we had fresh fruit and groceries in the refrigerator, but she made the magic happen, even when her kids were being held hostage. It boggled my mind that she could still work. Gladys had me fooled. They must have put a tap in her office so she couldn't speak freely. That meant there could be a tap in our office, too. I'd have the cybersecurity team take a second look. I say we conduct the initial surveillance on our buddy's home. See what Freddy and Philippa get up to when they think no one is watching. We need to pick up a drone? I'd say yes, but we can go with a short-range one. We'll be able to get close to his house. It's in the middle of a ritzy area, but encroachment by the unwashed masses has made it a less than desirable area. There are two houses for sale within the same block as his. It has to be disconcerting, and if I were him, I'd be looking at moving. I think he's probably safe from the unwashed masses, Jenny replied after taking a long, slow drink of her coffee. I put her breakfast in front of her, bacon and scrambled eggs. I took a small plate of cut-up fruit out of the refrigerator, along with the Tabasco sauce. She never used it. I thought she was uncultured, or she had all her taste buds intact. My time in the Marines had solidified me putting Tabasco on most things that probably didn't require it. If I had a penny for every time I thought my wife was hot, I'd have a lot of pennies. Jenny chuckled softly and shook her head. Same. When she finished, she stood up. Somewhere between sitting down and standing, she'd gotten naked. I'm going to catch a shower. It would be a shame if I had to do it alone. She walked away with a casual toss of her hip. I was going to suggest we hit the gym, but maybe a recovery day is called for. I turned off the stove and ran after her. We drove toward the city. It wasn't the best time of day, and traffic was heavy. We followed side streets when possible, but most of the time we plodded along on a misleadingly named expressway. 
I'm pretty sure I hate Chicago traffic, I grumbled. Take a ride at the next intersection. We can get a baby drone at the store on the corner. I followed instructions into the parking lot of an electronics superstore. I hadn't known such things were still around, but here it was. We strolled in, found our way to the drones, picked the smallest one with linked video, and headed for the register. Once there, they really wanted us to join their frequent buyer club. It was a hard sell that any used car salesman would have been proud of. No, sorry, I'm not doing any of that. I'll pay cash. We prefer credit cards, sir, the young man at the register said. I pushed $200 bills at him. You don't have a credit card? Not that I'm going to use here at the data warehouse. How much does this company get when selling my name and email? What's your cut? Why the hard sell? Why are we still here? Can we pay for this or not? I glared at the young man. His shoulders sagged. They push us to sign people up and use credit cards, too, because of the information we can get from card use. That data has value, I guess. I know. I'm not going to give you anything except cash to buy this here spiffy toy. Come on, man. Finish this so we can go play. He didn't say another word. We completed the transaction and departed. We plugged the USB charger into the Jeep while still in the parking lot. We'd get enough of a charge by the time we needed it. What was that all about? Jenny asked. I've lost patience with everything. We've been back in the game for a day and already I need a vacation. There's an emotional toll in doing what we do. Yesterday was six months worth of work squeezed into one day. But we're not done. And that's how I've reconciled myself with this. Jenny shrugged. I'm a lot better now. I didn't bring up the sex, which was the magic elixir that usually made me feel better. But not this time, oddly. Our roles reversed. Jenny was right. We have work to do, I agreed. I'm glad I'm not doing this alone. Actually, I never would have made it this far without you. I'd probably be working black ops directly for the government, miserable and making a solid five grand a month plus hazardous duty pay. The drone was showing fully charged. It linked easily to Jenny's phone, and we watched the image it transmitted. How serendipitous. I blurted. It wouldn't have held us up if it had been uncharged. We had another twenty minutes to get to Max's place. We would probably be able to surveil the house with a five-minute flight, since the drone would be launched from within a hundred feet of the target. There were much bigger things to worry about, like whether Freddie Mac could be trusted to mind his other businesses. We didn't want uncomfortable questions regarding Mac Industries. We only wanted Chicago Industries out of his control. That meant we needed leverage. If we sanctioned his girlfriend, he'd become a zealot. We needed him to show respect for us and to us. How do we get him to do what we want? I asked aloud. It was a question for us both. I don't recommend that we kidnap Philippa. If we take her out, she becomes a martyr. Jenny followed my train of thought exactly. What does he care about? She continued. That's what we're here to answer. Good luck to us. It started with watching, then asking good questions of people who could provide quality answers. We needed to be open about looking for opportunities. I replayed our conversations in my mind, turning where Jenny told me to turn over the next 15 minutes. Mac Industries. What about Mac Industries? Jenny wondered. She pointed at a driveway where a for sale sign stood. In here. I turned in and parked. We got out and casually looked over the front of the house as if contemplating its purchase. We checked the front door. Then Jenny went left and I went right, looking for a way into the backyard. On my side, there was a gate. Hey, honey, let's take a look at the back. I waved her to my side. Blocked over there, she said while she sauntered toward me. We took our time. I carried the drone in my hand since it was little bigger than my palm. We had to jiggle the gate to get it to open. There was a lock on the backside that was mostly broken. It came off with little effort. The gate opened with a squeal. I pushed it open far enough to squeeze through and held it for Jenny. Once she was in, I pushed it shut. I couldn't secure it, but I could use the lock to wedge it. I shoved the lock under the lower frame. I pulled on the gate, and it wouldn't budge. We stood out of sight of the back windows. I let the drone rest in my palm while Jenny fired it up. It lifted into the air. 
Jenny flew it up, only about 15 feet, enough to clear the fences. She directed it across the neighboring backyard and stopped where we had a view into Freddie Mac's property. I watched the screen on Jenny's phone while she flew the drone. The backyard was typical for a mini-mansion, except it didn't have a pool. It had a zen garden and a large seating area with benches and chairs around a Star Wars-themed fire pit. The greenery around the area was neatly trimmed but unoccupied. The windows facing the garden had their shades up. It was like he had no secrets. We kept the shades pulled in our house because they also had infrared inhibitors. We were in a difficult business where enemies were lethal. It benefited us not to have a routine and to take simple precautions that also restricted law enforcement efforts should they catch our scent, although we didn't accept contracts on our home turf. That hadn't prevented me from executing the contract on Chaz's murderer. And then there was the tower, which forced us into an untenable position. I started to get angry again. Is he home? I don't think so, I replied. I think we'll need to come back tonight. Jenny turned the drone around to come back, but it started losing altitude. At least we'd cleaned our fingerprints off it, something we habitually did. Casual observers probably thought we were germaphobes. We watched the drone crash into a bush on the edge of the Zen garden. I wonder if finding a drone will bring him calm, I quipped. Jenny shook her head. That's not going to get us what we want. I watched the screen where the camera continued to transmit. Rotate the camera up and to your right. The image cleared as it looked through a gap in the leaves. Once again, serendipity is on our side. We can see into his house. Without the rotors, battery life should be extended. Turn it off for now. We'll see if it resurrects itself when we return tonight. I have high hopes. Jenny tapped a button on the controller and the screen on her phone went dark. We had a full day to kill. Back to the club. Maybe we can play some golf. Jenny chuckled. Simple as that. Realty speculators lead busy lives. It's not about the individual properties, but the portfolio. Is that what we are now? Besides being young and virile, you owe me hot tub time. I most assuredly do not. We have a house guest, and the hot tub is on the back deck. You'll have to cool your jets. She has to leave, I replied without skipping a beat. Probably today. No, you're not kicking her out for your sordid pleasures. I removed the lockout from under the gate and worked it open. I pulled it mostly closed behind me. They aren't sorted, I replied. We better call the realtor and see if we can meet her tonight. I used my untraceable phone to call the number on the sign out front. A person answered in one ring. I didn't waste any time. I'm looking at the property on Pine Avenue. Is the realtor handling this property available? That would be me, came the pleasant voice on the other end. I can meet you there in 15 minutes. We have another appointment, I lied. Can we meet you here this evening? My wife and I are interested in possibly adding this to our portfolio. We were driving through the neighborhood and saw it, but haven't done any research. What is the asking price? The realtor answered. 1.4, I repeated, as in $1,400,000. It was well within our price range, but it wasn't a neighborhood I wanted to move into, not even from a speculation standpoint. How long has it been on the market? It seems like it's in less than optimal condition for that price. I made eyes at Miss Jenny. The price has been reduced by over a quarter of a million dollars since it was initially listed because of the issues you've already noticed. That makes it the best buy in the whole neighborhood. Possibly. My wife and I would like to see if the inside is in better condition than the outside, which isn't bad, mind you. We like the location. Say six? It'll still be light, but we'll get dark soon. We'll get to see it in both the day and evening light. Of course. Can I get your names and phone number? Ian Bragg. I gave her the number of the burner phone that I had not yet used. We had other personas that we could adopt on a moment's notice. But if Freddy checked, I wanted him to know it was me. Chapter 18 It does not matter how slowly you go, as long as you do not stop. Confucius After passing the day at the club, where we squeezed in nine holes, took a shower, and ate an early dinner, we returned to Pine Street, two doors down from Freddie Mac, a.k.a. Jack in the Box. 
We arrived before the realtor, which was our intent. Moment of truth, Jenny said. She tapped the power button on the drone controller. The controller fired up. She hit it again to bring the drone online. I watched her phone intently, waiting for the Bluetooth handshake to complete. Come on, I pleaded with the hardware to do what it was supposed to do. The image brightened and sharpened. Oh yeah, the bringer of truth is alive. Nothing like looking into Freddy's house with our own eyes. We saw that Freddy and Philippa were drinking wine in the dining room. A tendril of smoke rose from the stove to get immediately sucked into the vent. They're getting ready to have dinner. I suggest we interrupt them. Headlights appeared from behind us. Someone opened the car door and got out. I guess we better look at a house before engaging in our other affairs. I would have blown off the visit, but I felt for the working stiff who wasn't going to get a commission. We weren't going to buy the house. We nodded to each other and opened our doors. The realtor was dressed in a sleek, royal blue dress, high heels, and makeup meant for nightlife. I wasn't sure who she was trying to woo, but Jenny wasn't impressed. The realtor headed straight for her. I'm sorry, I have a date after this. Call me Destiny. That's a great name for a realtor, Jenny replied smoothly. Jenny, and this is my husband, Ian. You make a great couple, although a little younger than the average age in this neighborhood. There's nothing that says you've made it like living in the high-rent district. Is that what this is? Is this the lowest-priced house in the area? I apologize for not checking ahead of time, but I'm not here to play a game of gotcha. However, everything you tell me, I will check its veracity later this evening. Understood, she replied with her million-dollar smile, but her tone suggested we'd ruined her playbook. You'd like to see the inside? I nodded. We would. In order to enter any home we represent, you need to have an approved credit application on file. I smiled. That makes the decision easy. We won't waste any more of your time. I offered my hand. Her effort to play hardball had failed. By challenging our credit status, she thought we'd backpedal and be more inclined to go after the home. The negotiation strategy was a failed one. She finally took my hand and shook it. Jenny offered hers, too. Destiny stood there, shifting uncomfortably. We couldn't leave because she had our vehicle blocked in. You are going to have to leave before we can leave, and I'm sure we'd like to leave. The approved credit application, it's the rules. I don't have any problem with that, but we don't have one on file because we weren't looking until we drove by. Maybe we'll put one in, maybe we won't. This house has been on the market long enough. I'm not worried about it getting snapped up. That should tell you something. It tells me we just lowered the price. I feel like there will be some action on this house soon, very soon. She bobbed her head, hopefully. Good luck, then. I'm sure we'll find something in the right area and at the right price. I bobbed my head to mirror the realtor. She frowned, but finally returned to her car. She was gone after a short wait. Do you think she had a date? I asked. With you, maybe, but not with anyone who's not buying a house. I was flattered, but then again, she'd never seen me. It was part of her approach. Flirt heavily with potential buyers. She has great taste, obviously. How would you know that? Women know, Jenny stated flatly. If women are so smart, why don't you have pockets in your clothes? We are creatures to defy logic except our own. You love it. A journey to infinity. I gestured at the jeep. We're wasting time. We climbed in the jeep and brought Jenny's phone out. The low battery light for the drone was flashing but the image showed that Jack in the Box and Princess Love Chunks were eating their dinner. Sometime during the five-minute exchange with the realtor, the dinner bell had rung. What's the plan, Ian? Jenny asked. I think the direct approach is called for. We'll park in their driveway. Better hurry before the battery dies. I started the Jeep, and we moved down the street that had almost no traffic. It took seconds to get where we wanted to go. I angle parked in front of their two-car garage to block any vehicles from trying to leave. He's up, Jenny said. They must have a security system. Are they trying to leave? No, it's just him. Time to go to the front door, then. Have an adult conversation with Freddy and his woman. I shut down the Jeep and strolled to the front door, waving at where I thought the camera was. 
This was the ultimate gamesmanship. We had no other card to play after showing up at Freddy's house. We'd have to kill him if he didn't acquiesce, which meant he'd have to look the other way when we went after Guido and Captain Shortpants. I knocked on the door. Ten seconds later, I hovered my knuckles in front of the door to try again. It opened before I could knock a second time. How did I know it was you? You saw me on your security monitor, just like I saw you on mine. You and Princess Love Chunks sitting down to an early dinner. I wish you'd stop calling her that. Soft spot for your counterpart, Freddy? Are you two contemplating a merger? Although now may not be an optimal time since your leadership of the organization is in a state of flux, you wouldn't be trying anything untoward, would you? I bumped the door with my shoulder and let myself inside. Jenny followed but stayed in the doorway. She let the door close most of the way before blocking it in case we needed to make a rapid egress. Let's have a seat. We don't want your dinner to get cold. I nudged Freddy toward his dining room, where Philippa kept her hands in her lap. I figured she had a pistol under there. So you know where I live. I don't hide it, Freddy said with his nose in the air. Maybe you should, especially when you're playing a dangerous game, the one where you contract a hit on me and my wife. We didn't appreciate that. I did not put a contract out on you. I don't do that. Who do you think you're talking to? Is this place bugged by the feds or something? Because you absolutely do that. You tried to have me killed, Freddy. Your Chicago Industries kills people, and your Mac Industries cleans up after them. Let's not play make-believe. I shifted around the side of the table to stand next to Princess Love Chunks. She hesitated, and I grabbed her arms to pull her hands out of her lap to where I could see them. She wasn't able to drop the small-caliber pistol she had been holding. I twisted it out of her hand. You were never an operator, were you? Did the old man gift you the L.A. branch or something? You're really bad at it, so I suggest you avoid playing so you don't get yourself killed. I think now is a great time for you two to get out of this business. Freddy held my gaze. No time like the present to cut your losses and move on, I continued. Like I said, the businesses that I operate out of the McManus Brothers building are the most lucrative. If there was anything else, it wouldn't make any money. It makes a lot of money, but none that you can readily get your hands on. Your money laundering operation insufficient, Freddy? Freddy put his fork down without having taken a bite. He crossed his arms and leaned back, slouching into the wooden dining room chair. What do you want me to say, Ian? That's where you have me at a loss. I don't trust you, but we need the handover of your organization to ours and no grief about it. Actually, both of your organizations. I waved Philippa's 380 at her. You need to focus on other stuff, too. Time to retire. Despite what you think, I'm very good at my job, Philippa countered. Good. You can work for us. We can always use more clients. Well-funded clients. We have standards, you know. The verbal jousting kept them from focusing on a way out. I was going to continue to control that part of the conversation. I'm not sure I could work for you, she replied. Fair enough. I'm not going to claim to be your daddy or anything. Looks like you already have one of those. I looked at Freddy. Inciting the two seemed like the right thing to do. Crass and uncultured. I don't understand how you beat us. Thank you for admitting that. The first step to fixing a problem is admitting that it exists. And now that you've conceded, what are we going to do about it? Nice play. Freddy shrugged one shoulder. You're going to leave my house and never come back. That is something I would love to do, Freddy Mac. But we have unfinished business. It seems that the only thing we're doing is talking, a constant back and forth of posturing. My boys are on their way to take care of you. More posturing. If your boys show up, you and Princess Lovechunks die first. Make the call and let's work this out. I might say you're not very good at your job either, Philippa said. You seem to want to do everything but kill us. You've had plenty of chances. I had. Only they could direct their organizations for the handover. But then again, maybe it was better if they were in disarray. You're right. We will make sure your organizations are rudderless. I raised the pistol, took careful aim, and fired. To Freddy's credit, he stayed perfectly still, which saved his life. The small caliber round split his ear and left a small crease in his hair. He winced and pressed his hand to the side of his head. 
You bastard. You demanded that I shoot you, so I did. Next one is between the eyes. I backhanded Philippa in the side of her head. And you too. She held her head almost in a parody of Freddy, but blood didn't drip from her hand like from his. Maybe it is best for you two to leave the world of the living. You refuse to help me help you. Your boys, that's pretty funny. The cleaners took plenty of your boys to the incinerator in the tower. I'd be surprised if you have any left. Enough posturing. I slammed my hand down on the table. Philippa grabbed for my hand. I spun and punched the side of her head again. She crumpled like a sack of potatoes. I brought the pistol up and aimed at Freddy's face. Since you don't care about living... He raised his hands. You're right. I have no boys left. I don't have anything left of Chicago Industries. Philippa has an organization with five operators. The whole thing was a bluff? Not Guido. He has a big group. Paul, too. We tried to team up to balance the power. It would be the triad. Not the Chinese mob version, either. We're a little less violent. Was that humor? I helped Philippa into the living room and dropped her on the couch. I motioned for Freddy to join us, but he pointed at the carpet with his bloody hand. That told me all I needed to know. He didn't want to mess up his carpet or couch. They weren't going anywhere. I went to the kitchen and wet a dish rag that I gave to Freddy. He wiped off his hand, then held it to the side of his head. I run the Max series of businesses. They are legitimate. The others use me for their money laundering. I don't run any contracts myself, but I did have some people who owed me favors. Those were the people you killed. After they tried to kill us, just to be clear. The bombs? Guido planted them. Guido is calling the shots. Paul is a useful idiot. As are we, I guess. That came as a surprise. It shouldn't have. Give us what we need to go after Guido. He's already on his way to the Big Apple. He doesn't like it here, Freddy explained. Who does? It's Chicago. At least there's White Castle here. There's White Castle on Long Island, Freddy said. How would you know that? Never mind. Their burgers aren't the same. Freddy had been to New York City, of course. If he was laundering money for the real hitman organizations, then that was the leverage I needed over them. For Freddy, he liked his 58th floor offices and his nice home life. He was enjoying the sedentary lifestyle of a busy executive. Close the spigots when I tell you, Freddy, and you won't have to open them again. We're headed east to visit Guido and invite him to abide by his agreement. You better be prepared to kill him, because he's not going to give you a second chance. Not after what you did to his people in the tower. He was beyond angry. You put him on his backside. There will be hell to pay. Despite the damage to his ear, Freddy was lucid and spoke under control. I laughed mirthlessly. Like they say on the playground, he started it. But as they say in adulthood, I'm going to finish it. Freddy nodded but winced, pinching his eyes closed and pressing the rag hard against his ear. Look what you did to me, you sadist. I think your secretary is the real sadist. I bet she runs a dominatrix business on the side. He and Jenny blurted from near the front door. Sorry, I mumbled. I stuffed the 380 into my pocket and headed into the living room. You might want to have that looked at, I pointed at Freddy's ear. Right, like I'm going to an emergency room to have a bullet wound bandaged. They have to report that stuff here. At least you know I hit what I aim at. It was never about killing you, Freddy, or Philippa. We won't be back as long as you don't give us a reason. Jenny opened the door. I stopped before leaving to unload the 380. I put the pistol and magazine on a small table next to the door. Once outside, I tossed the bullets into the bushes. I guess we're returning to New York, Jenny said casually. Time to cut the head off the snake. Chapter 19 What you do today can improve all your tomorrows. Ralph Marston Our flight left in the early afternoon. The extra time gave us a chance to stop by the club for a quick run-through, meet with the employees one last time. Morale was good. We were surprised to see Gladys at work, but there she was, processing bonuses for everyone. You don't need to be here if you have stuff to take care of at home, Jenny prodded, but Gladys only waved us off. The kids are downstairs learning how to make their own money. Server staff for the restaurant? I wondered. Of course, unless they need a strong back at the golf course, then Connor will work there. 
We'd love to play the back nine, but there isn't enough time before we have to leave for our flight, I explained. But next time... You're going to take care of the problem? Gladys continued to type without looking up. Cut the head off the snake and resolve the issue once and for all. We won't be taking on a whole slew of operators and operations, but we may take on some. L.A. and Houston could come into play, definitely New York. I doubt we'll do anything more with Chicago. I don't want growth in this area, seeing how we live here. Did the cybersecurity team sweep through the club? Earlier. Cleaned us right up. There was a small transmitter under my desk. Who planted it? I demanded. That is being dealt with, along with the individual who escaped my home. We won't be hearing from him again. She finally looked up. You gave me a good budget. I'll use about a quarter of it, and it'll go to a good cause. We trust you, Jenny said to forestall further questions. How much did you disperse for the bonuses? One fifty. Gives a good amount to everyone. We have 75 employees now. 75? When did that happen? Over the past year. It's like you're not even here, Gladys replied with a disarming smile. That's right, you live in the Hamptons. I wasn't sure how to respond to that level of sarcasm. Was she suggesting that we weren't spending enough time in Chicago? I decided discretion was the better part of valor. I need to use the restroom. Jenny and Gladys watched me go. The door closed and cut off their shared laugh, indubitably at my expense. I headed for the private bar, but it was too early for Mark to be in. I went to the restaurant and made sad puppy eyes at the hostess until she hooked me up with a cup of coffee. She thanked me for the bonus. I told her to thank Gladys, who was right. We hadn't been spending enough time at the club. I returned to the office wearing a frown that Jenny immediately picked up on. We retired to the back office, but only briefly. We were almost out of time. I sipped my coffee obnoxiously until Jenny took it away from me to claim as her own. We have to spend more time here. I know. A week on, week off. It's a good mix, Ian. Direct flights make it less cumbersome. Maybe we'll fly every Saturday, one way or the other. I suggest we hire a limo service on both ends. Driving in these big cities takes all the fun out of being in either place. The Hamptons is great. Lake Forest is great. It's all the stuff in between that's painful. First class travel, Ian. I grinned at my beautiful bride. Her green eyes sparkled as they did so often. Make it so, number one. She finished my coffee and stood. Shall we, number two? Hang on, I started, but my mental acuity was suffering. When I come up with an appropriately witty response, I'll tell you. Until then, know that it's coming. I'm shaking in my fancy shoes. She showed off her Chuck Taylors with green neon and black pattern. I thought it might have been the Seahawks. I didn't care about football, but she was from Seattle. She probably had no choice but to support the home team. I looked at my nondescript Levi's and button-down shirt. I wore desert combat boots. They didn't have a metal shank, so I didn't have to take them off going through the airport. Unless they didn't funnel us through a first-class line and we got the cattle-class treatment. We didn't apply for the pre-check thing. If the government was going to get our fingerprints, they would have to take them. I wasn't good with simply handing them a baseline from which to work. Same with DNA. No test for us to see where our ancestors came from. We had our lives to live, and that meant no freebies. I was sure they had my data on file because I'd been in the Marines, but that was a long time ago. They'd have to focus a search on former military if they wanted to find me. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't but we wanted to give them nothing to match it from. That meant keeping the scenes of our crimes squeaky clean. Except for the tower. Guido had a lot to answer for. He set us up. I believed that in my gut, and when Freddy said it, that reinforced it. I tried to avoid preconceived notions, but the gang of four had us chasing our tails right up until we decided to drive the train. Then they came along for the ride. That's when their facade crumbled. It was Guido. We both hugged Gladys on our way out. Put aside an extra 50000 for bonuses. 150 k might not be enough. I like seeing the employees happy. And we'll be back in a week or so. One week here, one week in New York. We compromised, but we also want a limo to take us back and forth on both ends. Can you make the arrangements? Jenny punched me in the arm. We can take care of that. It's my job. 
I'll get your tickets, set up your ground transportation, and it'll be done. No sense doing it onesie-twosie. Thank you for everything. Stay in the big house with your kids for the next week, if you want. I removed the house key from the ring. Give me the car keys, too. We'll get you a ride to the airport right now. Enjoy your free time while you're not driving. Can we get them to play Rush during the drive? Gladys looked at me for a second, picked up the phone, and made a call. No, she told me before the person on the other end answered. We excused ourselves. By the time we made it to the entrance, one of the supervisors was there to meet us. Hey, Bonnie, we said together. Your ride will be here momentarily, she said. Do you need help getting your bags from the Jeep? I would normally say no, but it appears that I've left my keys upstairs. I made to leave, but Bonnie stopped me. Gladys unlocked it for us. Your bags are on their way. Then why did you ask? To give you a chance to give the right answer and let people help you. She winked at me. I guess I didn't answer correctly then. You know us. We're not going to ask for help when we can do it ourselves. Don't want you to think we're a pair of lazy scumbags. We don't think that. Bonnie nodded toward the door. Enjoy your trip. See you in a week. Does everyone know? I wondered. Jenny smirked. This is the club. Good news travels at the speed of light. Bonnie wished us both well and returned to the restaurant. The van for the golf club pulled up front. The driver hopped out and tossed our bags inside. He held open the side door for us. It's almost like a limo, I said. Jenny raised an eyebrow at me. Gladys had three minutes to arrange this. We have a ride and didn't have to do anything except walk down the stairs. These good people are going to turn us into, what did you say, lazy scumbags? If the Chuck Taylors fit, I held the door for Jenny. With our departure from the club, I turned my attention to the matter at hand, bringing the wrath of the Peace Archive down on Guido's head. Vengeance, retribution, the kinds of words that weren't for professionals in our business. They applied. It wasn't a simple matter of a hard business meeting. We had to penetrate Guido's mansion and do away with him if we couldn't find a weakness in some kind of routine. Maybe we'd be able to return in a week, maybe not. We couldn't hurry this. Guido was a professional, exactly like we purported ourselves to be. As we exited the secure area of the airport, we spotted our limo driver with a sign that read Ian and Jenny in pink on both sides of a heart with an arrow through it. I've transgressed somewhere and I'm being made to pay. Jenny didn't think so. It's cute. Newlyweds. That's us. Almost. Still feels like it. The only challenge with riding in a limousine was not being able to have a private conversation during the drive. I'd have to rethink that, or possibly get a portable device like Guido had that dampened electronics. The equipment used at the club was hardwired and more robust with greater range. However, we only needed something for the short range of a back seat. Then again, jammers were illegal. Traveling with one could bring unwanted attention. Alas, we'd have to do without our usual work conversation until we got home. We thanked the driver and gave him a good tip. At least Jenny had her key, since mine was on the Jeep key ring. I'd remedy that soonest. Our first trip to the estate of Guido Calcavecchi would be that night. I was tired from the travel, but we were on the job. This one couldn't wait. The longer we took, the more entrenched he would get. He had to know that we were coming for him. If he didn't, then it would be easier, but we expected the former. We probably need a weapon or two, I said without humor. It was part of every contract. Figure out what the right weapon was, acquire it, use it, then discard it where no one would find it. Jenny's father's M1911 was in a gap in the rocks of a mountain north of Tucson. So many weapons scattered across America. I shrugged. There would be more before we finished. Drug dealers, I suggested. Finding the right one would yield a weapon and get a dealer off the street. We'd done it more than once before. We didn't frequent those areas, so they wouldn't see us come back. Gang violence in drug trade wasn't investigated with the rigor of crimes committed in upscale neighborhoods. I'm sure we can find a volunteer who will be most accommodating. Tonight, after we wrecky Guido's house, we'll find some place on the way back here. I wanted to take a shower, but it was late. 
I settled for washing my hands and face. I let the water drip for a few moments before I used the towel. Jenny did the same thing. We changed clothes so we didn't match the security footage taken at the airport, opting for dark clothes in case we needed to work outside the vehicle, which I expected we would. I doubted we'd get an advantageous view from a parking spot. We jumped in our New York ride, another Jeep Grand Cherokee, and headed toward Farmingdale, where Guido's home overlooked the famed Bethpage Golf Course. He had purchased a cement plant out of bankruptcy solely for the location, then built a mansion with a four-story tower at the top of which he could sit under an umbrella and watch the golfers from less than a couple hundred feet away. I envied his ingenuity and diligence in bringing such a home into existence with an unrivaled view since a wall of trees stood between the multiple courses and outsiders. The more I studied the satellite imagery showing his house, the more I knew that we would only be able to drive by one time and we couldn't park nearby. The single road looped past the property, meaning there was no reason for a car to drive it twice. One road, no side roads near the mansion. Two other facilities stood nearby, which could provide marginal cover, but they weren't the type where loitering was commonplace, since they were emergency responder training centers. We'll drive by tonight, but the best place to see the property might be from the golf course. I searched the net to find how to make a tea time for the public course, but was quickly jerked back to reality. The course was in high demand because of its quality. I'm not sleeping in the car, Jenny said, reading over my shoulder, which suggested getting in line the night before because the morning tea times were first come, first served. It'll be an adventure, like camping without any of the fun, I replied. I tried the online option, and there wasn't a single spot available for the next two weeks. We know people in this area. I called Mark Gadston, shipping magnate. We had saved his daughter from a drug-fueled life of slavery. He was in our perpetual debt. His words, not mine. Ian, buddy, you back in town? We are, and hope that your daughter is doing well. I checked in every now and again. I liked maintaining relationships that mattered with people who made a difference. His shipping routes were important for commerce on Long Island. She is doing much better. Gaining weight, thank goodness. She was downright skeletal. What can I do for you? I need to play Bethpage Black, I stated. Don't beat around the bush or quibble. Tell me what you really want, Mark joked. Do you have any strings you can pull? In the next day or two would be best. What do you have going on that requires you to play the black course? He waited, but I didn't answer. Probably best that I not know. Why don't you play with those shysters who love taking your money? You cost me less than they do but they were next on my list. I'm afraid this is one area where I'm not going to be able to help, but if you need to ship a 5,000-pound marble statue from the Uffizi to the Hamptons, I'm your man. We'll keep you in mind. Great news about your daughter. If you need any more work where that is involved, let me know. I hate dealers with a passion. Me too, Ian. They should string them up one by one and hang them on the bridges leading to the island, all of them. I ended the call with a hearty, here, here. My next call was to Maxim Odenkirk. Max, I need to take all your money, one hole at a time. To the average listener, my words would make little sense, but to a golfer, they would resonate clearly. Have you been practicing? Max replied. I doubt you can take all my money on the course. Me and the boys would be happy to take all your money, though. I don't have any money, not compared to you. I'll spot you a quarter mil that you can hand right back to me. Max, that's not how friends work. What do you say? You get us a reservation at Bethpage Black in the next day or two, and we'll call it even? It's been a while since I played the Black. Why the urgency? How long have you known me, Max? You know we don't ask those kinds of questions. I shook my head, but he couldn't see. Max laughed into the phone. Okay, my friend, I'll take your money. Ten grand a hole? I'm sure I can get a tea time, not for tomorrow, but for the day after. I'll bring the usual suspects. Sounds good. Me and you against the lesser hedge fund managers. You might want to partner with Albus. He's better than me. We'd played before, and they took a lot of my money. But it gave me the in I needed. We'd made the money back with the first contract, and it was all gravy after that. But he's young and overconfident, so we have him right where we want him. Sure. What's the worst thing that can happen? 
I've never lost all 18 holes before, but there's always a first time. Max deadpanned. I'll meet you there. Let me know when. And thanks, Max. I'll do my best to play well. I would think less of you if you didn't. See you soon, Ian. I don't get to play? Jenny asked. I froze because I heard that the T-Rex can't see you if you don't move. I'll take the gold card and head into town. I could use a new dress. Jenny smiled. She wasn't into spending money on clothes. She'd probably go to a Kohl's, followed by a trip to Sneaker Hut. Of course. Do you know what I'm planning? I expected she would. You're going to dive into the woods on this hole. She pointed at my computer screen with the overhead image of the course and Guido's mansion. You're going to take a look and then hop on the next tee. What's that going to cost you? $10,000 to get a one-minute look? Do you remember the days not long ago when such a sum would have been unconscionable? Jenny liked to remind me where we'd come from, but I never forgot. My blue-collar roots always carried me, as the gang of four had noted. I was crass and uncultured. They hadn't been wrong. Being an executive of a multi-million dollar business came with obligations that I hadn't completely embraced. Jenny was also from Salt of the Earth Roots. Together, we worked well in our new roles because we kept each other honest. It's the price of admission into this club. I don't get the feeling that you think I can win. I might walk away with a few extra nickels. She made a face that suggested I was going to get rolled. These men made their fortunes off betting on themselves. Then again, so did I. I'll let Max know you have no faith in him. He'll be appalled. I turned up the music for the rest of the drive. We were on the clock, which meant Rush was playing. A good Neil Peart drum solo brought us to the turn that would take us through the course and to Guido's place. Life is 10% what happens to you, and 90% how you react to it. Charles R. Swindle The road took us to the emergency services training facilities. We rounded past their buildings, and the mansion came into view. It was well lit, which boded well for our drive-by and being able to see more, but it was harder to penetrate a facility at night that was well lit. I preferred the dark. We had to look for weaknesses. At least there wasn't a high fence around the compound. It was open to the world, but its security came through wide open spaces. A small shack with a gate out front kept vehicles from accidentally entering the large roundabout driveway with a fountain in the center. Very Italian, I said. Is it? Jenny asked. Could be about anywhere in Europe or fancy places in New York. He's Italian and wanted a taste of home. That's my guess. Were his parents rich when they lived there? He's first-generation American, born here. I wasn't married to the idea of where the fountain came from. In the big scheme of life, it didn't matter. We both eyed the area intently. We had missed the low wall that surrounded the area to keep vehicles out, but high tensile wire ran horizontally from one brick post to another. Insulators, something that wouldn't be visible from farther away, supported the wires. An electric fence, methinks. The wires appeared to rise to a height of eight feet, much higher than a person could jump unaided. Camera domes blistered the overhangs surrounding the front and sides of the house, hanging from both low and high roofs. I doubted there were any gaps in coverage. The weakness would be in who was monitoring it and how. It was dark and the booth by the gate was lit up, but I couldn't tell if it was from the cameras or from a different computer system. Having one person be responsible for access and the cameras would create a serious gap in coverage. The one guard would be distracted every time a vehicle arrived, or a scantily clad woman rode by on her bike. There was a variety of ways to distract a bored man, but one that was more effective than all the rest. Too bad Jack Palance was dead. This would have been a good contract for her. She would have used poison, probably, to make it look like a heart attack. Too bad she'd been a psychopath who tried to kill my wife. Jenny had defeated her in hand-to-hand. -hand. I had arrived in time to finish her, but the hard work had already been done. Jenny wasn't a small woman. She had a little heft to her that, over the years, we'd turned into muscle and core strength. We worked out almost every day, and we worked out hard. When we sparred, we didn't pull any punches. We rounded the corner, and that was it. The house was shielded by trees. Looking the other way... 
one would never know that a world-class golf course was hidden behind the forest. Jenny waved her phone. She'd recorded the entire drive-by so we could study it later. I hadn't seen because she'd covered the screen with her hand. There was no need for anyone in the house to see the reflection from the vehicle driving by at five miles an hour under the speed limit. Home? Jenny asked. It's not ridiculously late. Maybe we can catch some takeout Chinese from Farmingdale. Jenny was instantly on her phone looking for a restaurant. They don't have egg foo young, she grumbled while tapping on the number to call for a takeout order. She counted on me to tell her what I wanted. If I didn't, then she ordered what I liked, usually a couple different entrees. I didn't say anything because I was thinking about the compound. It was much more than just a mansion, and I had to assume it had a complete security force, more than just a toll booth to raise the gate. Even with an electrified fence to dissuade hardy souls seeking entrance somewhere other than the main gate, there was much more to it than initial appearances. I looked forward to reviewing the video. But that was just his residence. We needed his schedule. If he lived in a fortress, which I was starting to see his mansion as, then we would need to take him outside the compound, in the open or in a private spot. More research. Needed to dive into the dark web to see what else he had his fingers in. Where would he go and why? Once again, more questions than answers. Chinese takeout would round some of the rough edges. Plus, we were at our own home with a private hot tub. I had an idea for dessert, and then we could review the video. We spent the down day online, searching for anything and everything related to Guido. Knowing that he was laundering money through Mac Industries helped highlight their process for legitimizing their cash, turning dirty money into clean money. Besides the operators, what businesses did he run? He wasn't the mob, so I didn't expect any protection rackets or loan sharking. Did he have some boys who visited broken bones upon people? Maybe. Then again, he could be in over his head by trying to control too much, overextending himself. How could that help me? I didn't know. Jenny and I spent a full day twisted up in knots and running in circles. We took a break by running to the store and adding to our supplies. To Guido's credit, he had almost no presence on the internet. The dark web wasn't much better. His information had not been stolen as far as we could find. I had to assume his people intercepted anything meant to go to Guido. We needed to dig into their lives and find cracks that would lead us to him. We didn't want to stay away from home very long, so instead of eating out, we ordered enough delivery for a couple days. We dug like miners, thinking the next big vein was only six inches away, but the only thing that happened was that we dug deep holes devoid of precious metals or gemstones. The deeper we went, the darker it got, until we backed out and sunk new shafts into the granite mountain that was Guido Calcavecchi. He was heavily insulated against those who sought to do what we were doing. We weren't even looking for dirt, just trying to find his email address so we could hack into it or find someone who already had through compromised accounts. I didn't think we were asking for too much, but the world had different ideas. Guido was far more savvy than I gave him credit for, but then again he was the one with the personal jammer and Kevlar briefcase. He'd built his empire in a way that completely insulated him from the outside world. No wonder he was so angry when he didn't get what he wanted with both of us dead. I'd put a tail on Jack in the Box and Princess Love Chunks because I only trusted them so far. They were into their routine. When it came to operators and our business, the worst thing they could do was have a routine. Mentally and physically, they were out of the game. I was pleased. That was the best place for the competition, retirement. That left Captain Shortpants and Guido, but if Freddy was correct, Paul would be out as soon as Guido was removed. Sanctioned terminated, whatever term applied. This was what I loved about the job, dissecting the target to make a better informed next move, the game of chess but real life. Every move would draw a counter move, keep him on his heels. We hadn't made the first move, not yet. As enticing as the hot tub sounded, I was happy eating, having a beer, and getting a good night's sleep so I could start with a fresh mind first thing in the morning. I had a few hours before our tea time. Beth Page Black, side of the U.S. Open and the only unmonitored access to Guido's compound. 
That meant a trail cam that I would install on a tree looking across the street. I had one at the house, ostensibly for security and wildlife watching. I took it, wiped it down inside and out, and linked it through my burner phone that I had not yet used. I hooked a supplemental backup power supply to it. With both sets of electronics in place, we'd get about a week's worth of coverage before the juice ran out. What would we learn over the course of a week? I hoped it would be enough to find a chink in his rather formidable armor. The Bethpage Black course was as much an experience as it was about the game of golf. We treated ourselves to pull carts to make the long walk less strenuous, although we were all in good shape. I would be distracted for the entire round. I was going to lose a lot of Max's money working our way toward the turn from hole 15 to 16. It was close. I'd have to be careful running into the woods and back out. The turn was sharp. I might have to donate two holes. Max was not going to be amused. When I let him know on the first tee, he rolled his eyes at me. You're covering me on those holes unless I shoot lights out and save us. That's the plan, I replied with a wink and a smile. We're playing the tips, Albus Porter stated unequivocally, the tee box that was farthest from the hole. It made the holes play long and extremely hard. I wasn't sure I had the length for it, but they were doing me a favor. Where else will we play from? This isn't summer camp. I warmed up off the tee when our turn came. I laughed when I looked at the hole. It was a long way away, around a dog leg, and the first wasn't considered a long hole. Play within yourself, I counseled. The temptation to overswing was great. I reinforced a rhythm with too many practice swings. I knew I had to hit the ball when the others started heckling me. They quieted when I addressed the ball. I hit it well, but was far short of theirs. Max looked at me. Is this how it's going to be? You cut me deep with your words, my friend. At least I'm in the fairway. That rough looks grim. And such was the way of the round. I had to count on long approach shots and good putting to keep us even through nine. I beamed at Max. At least the most we can lose now is ninety grand. Is that how you think? No wonder you're poor. I didn't think Jenny and I were poor, hardly, but we weren't in the billionaire's league. Our net worth was questionable because of the illegal nature of how we earned our money, so I conceded to being poorer than my fellows, but not poor by any measure. One finds wealth in the measure of one's friends, I replied. And no, after we win these next four holes, we'll pick them up on number 17 and start taking some serious money. That's when we kick their collective buttocks. Ass, Ian, you can say it. We're going to kick their asses. They're bickering like an old married couple. They're close to losing it altogether. I can't give them any hope. Go do what you need to do and get back to us soonest. Two holes, that's all you get, but only after you've brought your A-game. Nothing less, so we can close them out. Consider it done, Max. Unfortunately, it wasn't done. I watched the other golfers and tried to gauge the future holes. I lost focus on my game and didn't come close to winning any holes. We did exactly what we didn't want to do. We gave them hope. They were up one hole when we hit number 15. I teed first and hit mine far right, deep into the trees. I left the group and raced after it, carrying only one club. Max towed my cart behind him. He pointed at his eyes and then at me. I gave him the thumbs up, hitched my satchel tightly, and melted into the trees. Chapter 21 If you're going through hell, keep going. Winston Churchill I wasn't the first one who hit their shot into the trees, but I was probably the only one who did it on purpose, I didn't bother looking for my ball. I didn't care. What mattered was getting to the woods down by the green, where there was the best view of Guido's house. I moved out of sight of the fairway, while also being mostly hidden from the view of a road that traveled outside the course's fenced border. There was no reason for me to show myself to anyone. No one needed to know what I was doing. I reached a point where I was even with the green, over 400 yards away. I moved from tree to tree toward the fence line, until I had an unimpeded view of the compound across the street. It wasn't the best angle to see the gate. 
I needed to get farther, between the green and the next hole's tee. I moved directly away from the house before I could travel laterally once more. The group in front of us was still putting, which benefited me because it gave me more time. Once again, I moved from tree to tree toward Guido's compound. I found the best angle. The wide trunk was suboptimal because the thin strap for connecting the trail cam to a branch wouldn't wrap around. The only answer was up. I heard the swing and click of someone teeing off from nearby. The group ahead of ours had cleared the green and were heading out on the 16th hole. I still had time. Our group had to approach the 15th green and then putt. I vaulted to the nearest branch and pulled myself up. Scrambling into the tree was easy enough. Good thing I wore black. Sap and bark stained my shirt and trousers. We'd leave after the round was over. I was already making up a story about a battle with an approach shot and a tree. The trail cam was strapped on, well above eye level, at a spot where no one should be looking for a lost ball. I connected the USB cable to the two-port external battery, tucking it into a plastic baggie with the burner phone also connected to the backup power. It wouldn't last too long. I didn't have a solar power adapter and array. That would have made for a more obvious setup. As it was, the trail cam had rudimentary flat paint, camouflage of sorts. I checked the aim one last time and dropped to the ground. I shouldered my small satchel, now empty, and dialed Jenny's phone from my untraceable satellite phone. She answered on the first ring but didn't say anything. That was our standard operating procedure. Don't give them a voice print without them identifying themselves first. It should be live. Give it a check. Gotta run. I ended the call and jogged easily toward the next tee. My group was still putting on the 15th hole. Max made a longer putt, and the other two picked up their balls. That meant we tied or won the hole. I stretched my shoulders and waited. We had three holes to take some of Albus Porter's money. Dave Tapper needed to go home lighter in the wallet as well. I was extremely competitive and wanted to win, even though I didn't have the skill of these far more seasoned players. I wouldn't cheat. That was a testament to the quality of one's character. I needed to practice more, that was all. Get lessons. Good thing Jenny and I owned a golf course. We are one up, Max announced with a toss of his ball into the air. He caught it and swirled it around his hand using a magician's balancing trick. What the hell happened to you? I was ready. You see, this tree had different ideas about my ball than I did. We finished up two holes. Albus transferred 20000 to me with a few taps from his phone. He shrugged it off as play money. I had half a beer with the group at the clubhouse bar and then excused myself. They also had to go. Running major businesses didn't give one a great deal of free time. We agreed to play again in a week. Same teams. That would give me a chance to recover my gear or replace the supplemental battery, whatever the situation dictated. We had to go shopping and pick up replacement gear, another trail cam, another external power brick, and another burner phone. It was important to be ready for the next opportunity. I feared that it would take a significant amount of data collection before we'd find what we were looking for. Patience was on our side. We only had to get lucky once. Guido had to be on the top of his game at all times. Jenny brought up the feed on the computer. Six hours away to install one camera, she snickered. I remember when you spent the entire night dressed like a homeless person, twice. The image cleared, showing Guido's front gate and the home behind it. It was an HD camera, but it only took one picture every ten seconds, unless activated by a motion in front of it. There was nothing close enough to trigger it. Six images a minute would have to do. It was the most active setting on the system beside full-time video, which would have eaten the batteries in less than a day. Jenny split the computer's screen in two, showing the camera imagery on one while she continued digging for information on Guido and his empire. The fact that there was nothing to find should have triggered the authorities. How could someone live the billionaire lifestyle without having a billionaire's bevy of businesses? That gave her an idea. Jenny looked at exposés to find breaking news that was more than gossip to be its own cottage industry. She should have known, but had stopped watching the news years earlier. What if we flush you out of hiding? Jenny asked out loud. She started to build a package for an enterprising reporter to look into. A person who ran an organization that killed people.
It had to be the juiciest of news and not something for the faint-hearted. Someone like Barbara Jekyll, a reporter who fell out of favor by trying to report on Ian and Jenny. She would be appropriately desperate and willing to jump on any thread, no matter how thin. Would she dig deeply enough to find what there was to find? Or, more importantly, that there was nothing? Jenny used the resources of the dark web to find Jekyll's current address. The electric company's billing department had been breached and the customer database made available. All it took was $100 off a Visa gift card. Too often, scammers scammed, and the list was just a way to get your card. However, on the dark web, those with better skills were always out there. Scam a premier surfer, and you'd find your life ruined. What would it take to flush Guido into the open? Would it be enough to destroy his business from without, or did he have to die? Jenny asked the hard questions. Nothing was a given. Whatever course of action they chose, it would have to remove Guido from the business. An anonymous tip to the IRS, maybe? He had moved $2 million into their account without hesitation. He hadn't even blinked. Cayman Islands money. But with exposing him came the risk of exposing the Peace Archive. What about the vice president? What would it take to bring the feds down on his head, like the FBI? No, including the vice president to bring down a competitor was the worst choice. It might force Jimmy Triplethorne to abandon any relation with Ian and Jenny Bragg. It had to be the media, if Guido didn't expose himself. Jenny wrote the address on a napkin. Sometimes battles were fought by proxies. Ian and Jenny didn't need to take on Guido directly. That was what they'd been missing. Bring a more robust army to bear. She couldn't wait to talk through a plan. I parked in the garage as usual, watching the door close all the way before taking my eyes from the rearview mirror. I left my clubs and shoes in the back and joined Jenny in the house. She was on her feet and ready to fight, but she relaxed when she saw it was me. The look on her face suggested she'd found something. What is it? More like, who? She waggled her eyebrows and pulled a beer out of the refrigerator for me. I just had one at the club. The club. I like the way you say that. It's not like the club, which is the one we run, although they do sound an awful lot alike. Did you buy the golf course with your derelict buddies? They're rich, and no, it's not for sale. You found something, didn't you? I thought for a moment. They're not derelicts. Didn't we settle that by having them over to our house? See, you've made me a bitter golf widow. I was pretty sure I hadn't, but she was on a roll. You're not bitter. I'd call it determined. Jenny gave me her best, intrigued look. I held out for as long as I could before I took the beer. How could I resist? My emerald-eyed babe looked gorgeous as always. What happened to you? She finally noticed my shirt. You see, I hit the ball into the trees, and the lumber didn't want to give in to my devilishly good looks and manly wiles. Jenny looked down her nose at me. I had to climb into the tree to place the trail cam. It wasn't as easy as I thought it would be, I admitted. Jenny giggled. There's my real man. Lucky you're in good shape or it could have been much worse. Made twenty grand off my derelict buddies, as you called them. I took a slow drink of the craft beer, a dark with a hint of chocolate. That's nice, dear. Retire to the rear deck? Unless you're in a hurry for microwaved leftovers, I suggested. Yes, I'll take the deck. It's a pleasant evening. Jenny brought the computer to set on the table between us so we could watch the images taken by the trail cam. Anything yet? I asked, even though I knew Jenny would have said something if there had been any movements at the mansion. Nothing. As in, nothing at all. Not a single person outside beside the guard who hasn't left the booth. Guido and whoever shares that house with him must live a boring life. But I have a different idea. I knew you had something up your sleeve. Out with it, woman. Yes, you big hunk of sweaty man, you, Jenny replied. I had to laugh at her retort. She was an equal partner in all things. Our verbal jousting was an ongoing effort, and I felt like I was usually on the losing end. I had to learn some new moves if I was to keep up. We sat in two chairs by the pool. The sun was setting where we couldn't see it, but twilight was plenty bright. Jenny raised her glass with a white wine, and I clinked my bottle against it. To us, as always, 
to us and a good life. She bowed her head to me and took a drink. Once finished, she laid out her idea of a media campaign. Bold, vibrant, devilish even. What's the risk to us or Freddie Mac? Freddie said he launders Guido's money. I wonder if it's enough to be noticed and drop the bad guy federal bureaucrat scumbags on Freddie's shoulders. We can't tell Jimmy. We have to avoid that completely, I agreed. That was my thought. Can't have the so-called competition targeted by the VP without dirt falling on all of us. Yowza. That's exactly why he can't ever find out about our role in anything to do with Guido, Freddie Mac, Philippa, and Captain Shortpants. Let me check in with Gladys, make sure nothing untoward is happening. I dialed the number using my special phone. Gladys answered. The beach is sunny and bright. During the day, but also the night. Everything is okay, Gladys? Her challenge to my response suggested it was. She wouldn't have challenged me had there been any intruders or visitors within hearing distance. It wasn't the most exacting of security measures, but little things added up to big results. The Peace Archive remained sound and secure, exactly like Guido's organization, which remained nameless. We couldn't find anything on it. I wondered if it even existed, but the hired guns who came after us in the tower had to come from somewhere. They were organized and focused, although I wouldn't consider them very good. Maybe the competition was nowhere near what we thought it was? That is inspired, Jenny said. These guys do something other than run organizations like ours. But they want to, and taking us out was key to it. I see now. They hired grade B thugs, all except that woman. I want to know who she was. She was a pro, the only one with her wits about her, and we could use someone like her. Replacement for Jack Palance? Exactly. I sipped my beer and watched the ocean as darkness fought to overwhelm the day. That being said, what does Guido do for money? Therein lies the problem, Jenny replied. Hey, that's my line. I took a long drink before it got too warm. A flicker on the computer screen caught my eye. Jenny's too. We both stared at the screen. A limousine waited at the gate for the guard. We didn't get to watch him amble over and check the driver before opening the gate. The ten-second wait for the next image was interminable. When the new image appeared, the limo was headed through. I expanded the license plate. I shifted the image to fill half the screen and brought up the internet on the other half. We always browsed using a VPN. No one needed to know we were online. The search gave me my answer in a thousandth of a second. It was the mayor of Queens. What does this change? Jenny asked. I wish I knew. I drained my beer. Fancy a walk on the beach? I'd fancy nothing more. Jenny took my hand, and we strolled down our property to the beach. I stood ankle-deep in the cool water. Connections. That's how he stays out of the spotlight. I'm liking your idea about building a media package for Babs Jekyll even more. That picture of the mayor arriving at his compound should help her ask the hard questions. I'm curious what the mayor has to say about his friend. We should check campaign donations. I couldn't find any companies tied to his name at least not to a Guido Calcavecchi. Have we checked property records? We know the address. I only checked the open source material that listed his name as Guido. We hurried back to the small table. But the property records will probably say something completely different. I started the search while Jenny kept her eye on the surveillance images. The limo had moved into the compound. One picture showed the back of an individual who could have been the mayor entering the house. The trail cam hadn't caught anything damning besides the mayor's ride being at a rich guy's compound. Welcome to the fast-paced world of campaign finance. I hate politicians, I mumbled. That's going to be a drawback in keeping an open mind. We better build that package for our journalist friend. I use the term friend loosely. Ian, I feel like we're imposters. Nothing is right about any of this, not compared to previous contracts. Seeing the other people in this business, if we're imposters, we're the best that have ever impostered. We're flying by the seat of our pants on this one. We have nowhere to start, no thread to pull to unravel the evil empire. We haven't secured a weapon, not yet. There's some dealer out there living on borrowed time. That's beside the fact that we've been chasing our tails since getting called to Chicago. We need to work up new contracts for our people, 
keep our business moving forward. This is all a distraction. We need to be driving this train, but we're not. Guido is calling the shots. Right down to having at least one mayor in his pocket. Who else does he have providing cover? A million here and a million there, and voila, no police ever investigate. What are the odds he has editors in his pocket? If we get Babs engaged and she finds juicy stuff to print, will they? Or will the editors kill it because Guido is their friend? While talking, I had been digging deep into the property records for ownership of the mansion. Would you look at that? I gestured toward the screen. Property records are sealed, but building permits are contained elsewhere. Those are public information. Twelve years ago, the permit was granted for Machiavelli Construction, with the property owner listed as Tony Pucchio. Pulling the string on Pucchio, I disappeared into screen after screen of dozens of men by that name, but only one in Farmingdale. His name stopped appearing nine years earlier, which was when the trail was lost. The first appearance of Guido Calcavecchi came nearly a year later. Was it the same person? Are we worse off if we assume it is? Jenny asked. We'll include the information as part of the package that we send to Babs. See if she's as tenacious with him as she was with us. I studied the screen for a few moments longer. The outside lights popped on at Guido's house. I expanded the image to fill the screen. The limo sat in front of the house, and no one was in the image. We waited the interminable ten seconds before the next image popped up. A front shot of both the mayor and Guido. They weren't shaking hands, but they were close. Guido had his hand on the mayor's shoulder. The driver held the door open. The gate guard was out of his shack. I took a screenshot as a backup image. Ten seconds later, the limo was driving out of the compound with Guido waving goodbye. I took an extra screenshot of that image, too. Chapter 22 Well done is better than well said. Benjamin Franklin I sat in my underwear at the small table occupying our breakfast nook, watching the rays from a cloudless sunrise dance across the water before our home. I most enjoyed the calm of the morning. Most people were still in bed, where they'd claw for those few moments of sleep amid the warm embrace of their covers, just like Jenny did every morning. I smiled, thinking of her in bed, curled up and sleeping like a goddess. Once again, I'd add pennies to my virtual jar for the times I thought my wife was hot. I had a terminal case of love fever. The package we put together the evening before looked complete enough without pointing any fingers at Freddie Mac or us. She might make the connections, but they would be spurious. The plan was for her contacts to reveal information that we were unable to find. Maybe she'd hire a small army of researchers like journalism majors at one of the many colleges and universities in the area. They were resources that we couldn't tap into without revealing our real purpose. Jenny strolled in and hugged me from behind, which I always enjoyed since she slept naked, and that was how she appeared in the kitchen each morning. Are we ready? I'm creating a fake email right now, basing it out of Manhattan, a place that she's dying to get back to covering. Jenny looked skeptically at the name I had created for the email. Barry McStufflebeam. Would you open an email from a person with that name? I would, because it's hugely interesting. Not a name like Ben Dover, Anita Lover, or Buck Naked, which push all the wrong buttons. I had already checked the data attached to the images and text we'd put together. I'd scrubbed it all clean. Once the pictures with the mayor leaked, they'd be over the fence and ripping the camera out of the tree. It was the cost of doing business. Nothing would identify us there, either. I think we need to return to Chicago while the pot is stirred here. We have to get our people to work. It's been a slow year. We'll have a party on the beach here in a few weeks to talk business with the in crowd. Same bunch as last time. Anyone else gets vetted. No strangers allowed. New contracts are good. Jenny worked her way between me and the table to sit in my lap. She wrapped her arms around my neck and kissed me on the forehead. You are making it hard to work. How many times are you going to check it? Jenny asked. Just once more, and then I'll hit send. Do you want breakfast? 
She dragged her breasts across my face as she stood. I want something. She left the kitchen on her way to the stairs and back to our bedroom. Don't rush, I counseled myself, but I couldn't concentrate. I did not press send, since my mind was already upstairs. You stay right there. I'll be back for you in thirty minutes. The computer didn't answer. I stopped. Make it an hour. Jenny was amused at how she distracted me to the point that I couldn't send the email. When I did hit send, I had changed the text in the message to end with, I'll reveal myself when the time is right. It wasn't a lie, since the time would never be right. I already knew that was the case. The worst thing I could imagine was having a predatory and self-serving journalist shadowing us. It would be a nightmare. It would be the end of our business. The feds weren't as much of a threat as long as we did odd jobs for them every now and again. As much as it would have made sense to maintain leverage over those who contracted our services, I didn't keep a record, not screenshots of messages and not recorded meetings. If I had to resort to that, I would have already lost. We also understood that they would sacrifice us before themselves. That was the way of politicians. But we also had the majority leader in our debt. I never wanted to test anyone's loyalties. We would continue to take care with those contracts to not expose ourselves to law enforcement, although we did get top cover from our acquaintance within the Director of National Intelligence's office. Rick Bannock was an interesting character. He had his own story and had been strong-armed into requesting our help. No one could argue with the results we were able to deliver in his name. He'd probably turn us in if it came down to it. He was a Boy Scout, at least that's what I thought. He was on the right side of the law and had every intention of staying there. We didn't have that choice. We had the ability to act by any means possible, so we had the responsibility to act. That was my ethos, the same one that I had dragged Jenny into. She'd always had the courage of her convictions and had never needed to use violence to enforce them. Not until she met me. I had been a bad influence. Hitting send. I pressed the button, and it was blasted through the internet right to Barbara Jekyll's email. Getting our tickets back to Chicago. I accessed the airline's page and bought our tickets. We'd leave in a few hours. It was time to secure the house. We checked the images from the trail cam, but Guido wasn't a morning person. No one did anything at the house for as long as we watched. We finally shut down the computer and left for the airport, taking the limo service that we had contracted one round trip per week, whether we used it or not. While in the back of the limo, I sent a text to Max Odenkirk about a meeting and dinner at our home in two weeks' time. We'd get the catering locked in and make sure the right people were invited. We needed at least one contract out of the evening. Two would be better, and three would be best. Once at the club, we had pending meetings with a number of members. Every one of those could become a contract. It was nice getting back into the swing of things. Is Guido worth pursuing? Jenny asked quietly in the back of the limo. I shook my head. This wasn't the place to discuss such things. You ask the hardest questions. We relaxed on the drive. It was the millionaire lifestyle, something I had yet to get used to, but could certainly embrace. The trip through the airport was mostly painless, and we always flew first class, so there was minimal friction. We were the first ones off the airplane at our destination, too first ones out the exit, where we were met by another limousine service. He took our carry-on bags and led us to the nearby limo park. We piled in and headed out. We popped a bottle of Prosecco. Traffic was heavy, so it was going to be a while. I thought of asking the driver to detour through a White Castle, but realized we needed to work out before we'd be rewarded with a meal. The club had a gym. Straight to the club, my good man, I called up front. The driver tipped his hat. We did not have a jamming system in the gym in case someone wanted to stream music while they worked out. Even though we didn't have a large percentage of members who worked out, the gym was empty 90% of the time. Our physical therapist used it as much as anyone while rehabbing our aging members after various replacement surgeries, like knees or hips. It took almost 90 minutes to get to Lake Forest from O'Hare. Not a record by any stretch for how long the trip could take. We were ready to stretch our legs once we were out. I tipped the driver a hundred dollar bill. He nodded appreciatively and was on his way.
I held the door for Miss Jenny. She skipped past the stairs and went straight to the locker room. I looked up to the second floor where Gladys probably already knew that we'd arrived. I hurried after Jenny. We had our own lockers, and when I opened mine, it made me wonder the last time I had taken my workout clothes home to get washed. It had been a while, and that wasn't a good thing. I locked everything into my locker, set the security system, and strutted into the gym. I own you, I called to Miss Jenny, who was already doing her first set of bench presses on the universal machine. She wrinkled her nose at me. Have you ever washed those? My time in the Marines insulated me from certain sensitivities, like bad smells. It wasn't that I couldn't smell. It was that I wasn't offended by them. I took the high road. Tonight, they go straight into the washer, I declared with a deep bow and sweep of my arm. I moved to the bench when Jenny finished and knocked out my starter set, which was 20 pounds up from Jenny's first set. She used that as her second set. We continued until we finished our push routine, including leg presses. We both walked stiffly from the locker rooms to the private bar where our first meeting was lined up. The old stalwart, Mr. Allsize. Jenny was the best closer of deals, but I was there if we needed to firm up any details or the contract would be exceedingly complex and command a higher price. It was the give and take of our business. We settled into our usual seats with glasses of sparkling water with lemon. Mark dropped off a quart-sized bottle of Pellegrino and a small dish of lemon slices. He figured we would be there for a while. Prince Markle knew what we didn't. We accepted his foresight with dignity and grace. Mark was right. By the time we finished the bottle, we'd been through four different meetings and secured two contracts for sanctions in Denver and Los Angeles. We would package them up. As soon as we were confident the proposed targets were bad people, we'd put them out for bid. After the fourth person walked away, we stood to leave, but Mr. Smythe returned. He was one of the two we didn't agree to a contract with. I had to come back so I could ogle this fine woman. Mr. Smythe, I started, if there's any ogling to do of my wife, I've reserved the right to do it myself. Yes, my boy, of course. Smythe was ancient, well into his eighties, and an interminable flirt. He walked with a cane, but probably should have used a walker with tennis balls on the front legs. I'll do it. That man has gone too far. My associates have had it with his lying and thieving ways. Can't you just fire him? I pressed. You see, he's a blackmailer, too. He's intimated that he will forever be a part of their lives. Give us the information, I said. He's low but high profile in a secure position within a major corporation. What about this information he supposedly has? I guess you want to make sure that is recovered so it can't be used. That's more important than the termination of their association, shall we say. We can have the latter without the former, I asked. Smythe nodded. That gives us a great deal of latitude, but adds complexity. It would be a good contract for the right operator, and it was close, St. Louis. It would make someone's year. Three and a half mil, Jenny said calmly. That's it, no less. Smythe leaned across the table and narrowed his eyes at Jenny. If you weren't so gorgeous, I'd say to tell your jokes to someone else. But you're fine. They'll pay it. He laughed until he ended in a coughing fit. They were willing to go as high as five. I shrugged. Then we all feel like we got a good deal. We'll work up the package. He slid a thumb drive across the table. I put it in my pocket with the other. That was the one thing missing from our engagement with Guido. No one had done the initial groundwork. We had started from ground zero. We shook hands with Smythe, and he tottered away. Three new contracts. I sat down and waved at Mark to bring me a beer and something for Miss Jenny. It's nice to be doing this side of the business up close and in person. We don't need Guido's people or Captain Shortpants's. But we can't have them actively targeting us either, Jenny said, raining on my parade. So there we are. New work that will pay the bills while we clear our own baffles. What? Jenny looked at me sideways. Submarines zigging and zagging to make sure no one is following them in the propeller wash. It's a cool naval term I learned from reading Clancy. Jenny shook her head. Not in the Marines? 
Marines don't have any submarines. You know, long, hard things filled with semen. You most definitely don't have anything like that, Jenny quipped. Sorry, I was only half listening while you departed on a tangent to distant and unknown realms. The beer hit the spot. I'd been drinking more than usual lately, but the beers tasted better than normal. Maybe I had been blessed with good vintages, or maybe the recent work made me thirsty for the beverage that put me in the most contemplative of moods. Jenny sipped her wine before excusing herself to visit the restroom. The second she was out of sight, an older member, who I had never talked with, ambled up. Preston Pettigrew at your service, the man said in a musical tenor. I introduced myself and thanked him for being a member of the club. I motioned for him to sit, but he shook his head. This will only take a moment. Our mutual friend, Freddie Mac, asked me to deliver a message to you alone. Chapter 23 Failure is the condiment that gives success its flavor. Truman Capote My hackles rose and I stood to face the man. He backed up half a step. Freddy asked if you would meet him at his office. I will not. I don't have good memories from the last time we met him at his office, and I most assuredly would not go alone to a business meeting. Tell him if he wants to meet us, he comes here, where we would roll out the red carpet for him. Maybe he can become a member. He meets the minimum qualifications. If I may ask, where do you know Freddy from? We have done business on a number of occasions and continue a loose association. He sounded humble when asking me for this favor. I appreciate you playing the role of mule. My invite is sincere. I don't wish to go into the city. I don't like it down there. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to meet my wife for dinner. Of course. Preston Pettigrew bowed with a flourish and returned to where he'd been sitting. If he was a member of the club, he'd already been vetted and had his own money. Done business with Freddy could mean several things, not the least of which was money laundering. Not everyone came by their money the same way, through inheritance. Some earned it, others got lucky. Most had an army of employees and a smaller yet equally robust number of managers to drive revenue to the top. It gave the CEOs time to hang out with their fellows in a ten grand a month setting and lament the state of the world. I met Jenny in the hallway and offered her my arm. We strolled the few steps to the hostess, who took us to our usual table. She thanked us for the recent bonus and said it gave her enough to put money down on a condo. Jenny hugged her, and I shook her hand. Employees committing for the long term. We were pleased for her. Once she returned to her station, we waved again. I then told Jenny about the odd request from Pettigrew. What are you going to do? If he comes here, we'll meet with him and find out what he wants. If he doesn't come here, then it was a setup and we're better off having no part of it. Like we're ever going back into the tower. I think never is the safe bet. Jenny smiled. Timothy, our regular server, arrived. He also thanked us for the bonus. We gave Gladys the props. Whatever chef thinks is her best dish this evening, I'll take that. Same here, Jenny added. Can you send a message upstairs to ask Gladys to join us, please? Timothy pointed at a young man in server's attire. I'll ask her son to do it, or her daughter who's in the scullery. We had missed that they were on shift. Besides earning their own money, it kept them safe since they were under the club's security umbrella. I got Connor's attention. He hurried over. Can you ask your mom to join us? The dampening field was active around our table, so I couldn't call. I could have gotten up and gone to the hallway, but didn't, which made me wonder if I'd grown lazy. Jenny leaned back in her chair and folded her arms across her stomach. I know what you're thinking, I said. I doubt it, she replied. Why didn't we just walk up to the office and see Gladys before sitting our happy asses down? Jenny shook her head. That wasn't what I was thinking. Happy asses? Where do you come up with this stuff? Oh, your sordid past, my husband. She threw the back of her hand to her forehead in the most dramatic way. I added a penny to my virtual jar, then a second one. What were you thinking? Not going to be that easy. She raised her nose in the air. I had no clue where to go from there. Naked hot tub? 
That's what you are thinking. No, I was focused on movie night. When's the last time we used our home theater? Never. We hadn't ever used it. I didn't see it tonight either. We have three packages to build and send out for bid. We'll do that tomorrow. Tonight, a movie. Something easy on our minds. Hunt for Red October, I guessed. How about The Princess Bride? She knew my weakness. Good call. Gladys stopped a couple respectful paces away. I stood and pulled a chair out for her. She bowed her head and sat down. Timothy appeared out of nowhere and delivered a glass of sparkling water before verifying her order. He seemed to already know what she wanted. How are you and your family doing? I asked pointedly. I wanted an honest answer. We are doing just fine, Ian. The troubles of the past are behind us. The kids like the focus of a job to keep them from rehashing it. Do they need to talk with somebody about it? I'm sure there are plenty of professionals. She stopped me. If we need to, I know we're covered. You can give them credit for coming from hardy stock. These two already have a great deal of confidence and self-respect. They know it was nothing they did, and there was nothing they could have done to stop it. The only concern I have is that Chris watched you take down one of their oppressors. She wants to learn how to do that. There's nothing wrong with learning self-defense, I replied. Jenny shook her head at me. I think she's talking about offense, not defense. It's about punishing the person who would cause her pain. Gladys tapped her nose. I thought about her statement that they didn't need any help. It was up to us. Timothy appeared with an appetizer. I asked him to send Chris out to us. She walked through the kitchen door, wiping her hands on a towel. Thanks for the job, she said right away, and then waited. We're going to enroll you in a martial arts class. I recommend Taekwondo. There's a lot of power in that one. I was thinking more like Kung Fu, Chrysalis replied. I swallowed and blinked before answering. That is a more advanced form and for defense only. You'll probably want a good balance of offense and defense. She was taken aback. I wanted to make her think. If your goal is to hurt people, then just pick up a baseball bat. If your goal is to be at peace with yourself and the world around you, then practice martial arts. Chris turned on her mother. What did you say? Gladys held up her hands in surrender. She didn't have to say anything. I expect you know what we do for a living. Not the club, but the other stuff. She looked back and forth from her mother to me. She slowly shook her head. We perform high-level security tasks for people who wish to remain private, I lied. And that means we have to be ready for everything. Martial arts, taekwondo. Start it and stay active with it for a year. And then think about changing, if you are still of a mind to. On us, we'll pay for it. I gestured to Ginny and me. That's too kind. Gladys waved her hands to reject the offer. I won't take no for an answer. We looked at Chrysalis. For you and your personal health and well-being. You'll have to buy your own ghee. I will, and thank you. I don't really mind being the resident dishwasher. I get to sample a lot of the dishes before they are foisted upon our unwitting patrons. Jenny and I had a good laugh at that while Chris waved and returned to the kitchen. I turned to Gladys. Freddie Mac wants to meet with me. Seems like Pettigrew is a friend of his. He asked for our boy Freddie, but for some reason he wanted to meet me alone. I hope you told him what he could do to himself. In so many words... I invited him up here. Before you say it, I think it was Guido's boys who paid you a visit. I'm not sure Freddy and Philippa have any people they could task with such a job. That was a thug thing to do. Guido is responsible. We have him under surveillance in New York while we're here, acting like we're not coming after him. Is that all you're doing? Gladys was no fool. We have another iron burning in a very hot fire. We'll see if that bears any fruit. I think we'll know fairly soon about that one. In the interim, we watch and we run our business like normal. If Freddy calls or shows up, I'll contact you immediately. Thanks, G. You make the world go round and you keep us out of trouble. The latter is a full-time job, Gladys quipped, snickering at her own jibe. We had a lot to do. Catch up on the images from Guido's home and build packages. None of that could be delegated. There were certain things that we did ourselves, that we had to do. 
It was how we brought value to the organization. But I didn't hurry dinner or dessert, much as I was antsy and ready to go. Jenny held me back. Patience was not my virtue. It was Jenny's. There was nothing so important that it took precedence. After a cup of coffee following key lime pie, she knew that was as far as she could push when it came to teaching me patience. Otherwise, I would have ended up on my knees begging her to leave. Our Jeep was where we left it for the short drive home. We brought up the computer and quickly reviewed the images from the past eight hours. I didn't know if I was relieved or disappointed. We saw nothing. No one came, no one left. The gate guard changed a single time. It took less than a half hour to scroll through the steaming pile of nothing. But in our false email, we had received a response. Of course, it was a bunch of questions, starting with, You need to identify yourself. I will protect my source. Guess who's not going to identify themselves? I asked rhetorically. Will she stonewall us if we don't answer her questions? Of course not. This tells me she's even more keen to dig into it. She's bulldozing everything in front of her to get her story, including us, or at least she's trying to steamroll us. The rest of the questions went to other information that would reveal who we were. I chose to answer with a simple statement. Then ignore the story. Your choice, BM. There's no way she's going to ignore the story. She'll continue her heavy-handed approach in trying to figure out who Barry McStufflebeam is. That name. Jenny still wasn't sure. I dove into the dark web and the series of portals that led to the Peace Archive bidding site. What are you doing? Jenny rested her hand on the top of the laptop, leaning on it to close the computer. Starting the packages. She knew what I was doing. There was no way to obfuscate or lead her astray. She pushed the screen to the keyboard and the computer snapped shut. Movie time? I asked. Yes. Give me two hours of your undivided attention and then you'll be free to do Ian stuff. Deal. She kissed me warmly. It was much more than the usual. We walked hand in hand to the basement where the home theater occupied a long, thin room. There were four recliners facing a monster television. The central pair was a love seat so we could sit together without an armrest in the way. With the movie streaming, Jenny started kissing my neck. The next thing I knew, Andre the Giant's Holocaust cloak was on fire. There was only a half hour left in the movie. Time truly does fly when you're having fun. Chapter 24 It always seems impossible until it's done. Nelson Mandela Freddie called Gladys first thing in the morning to arrange a meeting around lunchtime. She suggested our restaurant, and he agreed. I'd already finished one package and was well into the second. Jenny worked on the third from the comfort of our grossly oversized bed. We had time to finish both before we needed to make our way to the club. I was okay with not getting there before him. Our people could check him out while we showed up fashionably late, make sure he knew his place. Then again, I hated those kinds of games. We'd get there by 11.30, a half hour before he was due. With traffic, he'd probably be the one that was late. He wasn't. We arrived at the same time. We parked in our spot, and he parked a Mercedes sports car in the guest area of the lot. Philippa was with him. For some reason, I was pleased to see that. I watched their hands as they approached. They'd both carried concealed weapons in the tower. Wary was Trust's good friend. They understood our concerns and kept their hands in the open. The club had a reception captain who held the door for our guests. He or she had the responsibility of recognizing all members and greeting them by name. It wasn't a great number, less than 50 total. Their guests had to be with them at all times. No one wandered the club without paying for the privilege. Liam was currently on duty. He possessed average intelligence, but a keen wit. He wasn't the most physically imposing, but he took his job seriously and was fanatically loyal to the club. He was paid well, but more importantly, he was appreciated. Some members tended to think their money put them in a higher place than those who worked there. I refused to tolerate that. I had removed one member for berating one of our employees. Ten grand and a few minutes of bad publicity helped raise our profile, and we gained five new members over the matter. 
In the immortal words of the master and commander, man demands to be governed. Even the wealthy, although their definition was different, they still liked guidelines. And for some reason, they liked us. We were consistent. They also thought we had dirt on them, since most had used our ancillary services, although we never kept those kinds of records solely for the purpose of blackmailing someone. It was all offshore. I hoped Freddie Mac took the same precautions, but laundering money had a necessary element within the United States. The conversion of paper money into legal bank money without raising any red flags. I offered my hand. Freddy? Philippa? I didn't expect to see you two. I didn't add, again or ever. We have something we need to talk about, Freddy said ominously. Inside, then. We have a secure area where we can talk freely. We also have one of the best chefs and kitchens in the world, but we don't share that publicly because we don't need her poached by the competition. Freddy grunted. Is that how it works out here? Come on, Freddy. No verbal jousting. I'm not in the mood. Jenny walked on the other side, next to Philippa. We wanted to keep them within arm's reach to forestall any untoward actions. Trust, but verify. Once Liam had seen us meet the couple in the parking lot, he moved closer, angling for a viable line of fire. He met us in the circular drive under the arrivals roof. Mr. and Mrs. Bragg, good morning, and to your guests, too. Do you require any assistance? Thanks, Liam. Your welcoming presence is sufficient and greatly appreciated. We're going to snag lunch. Do you need me to bring you anything? Another cup of coffee, maybe? No, sir. I'm good. I'm sending one anyway, I replied, shaking his hand and delivering a gentle thump on his shoulder. We met the hostess, who delivered us smartly to our table. Before we sat, I asked the hostess for a favor. Can you get me a coffee for Liam? I'll take it out. You don't have to bother. I'll have it delivered. I said I'd bring it. It'll be cheesy if someone else takes it. Of course, Mr. Bragg. The hostess was off. I figured the coffee would be delivered to our table in under two minutes. I'll take it out, Jenny suggested, which would give Freddy a short window to speak to me alone as he wanted. It was the kind of chess move that kept us in front of the competition. I gave her a quick hug and then pulled out her chair. Freddy pulled out Philippus. Look over your menus, and if there's something you want that's not on there, let us know. We're in tight with the kitchen. I crossed my fingers, like two peas in a pod. I would hope so. You own this place, don't you? That's what the tax office thinks, I replied. The coffee arrived, and Jenny was off. This area is dampened. Check your phones. You'll see that you have no signal. Nothing can be recorded. What did you want to see me about? Guido. Freddy looked at his lap and shook his head. I suspected. Did he threaten you? I'm to take one of his people onto the board of directors for a transition while we remove my people and replace them with more of his for a final transition to a new chairman in six months. And he's not paying you for the pleasure? Freddy shook his head. He's offered our lives. He gestured toward Philippa. Both of us, just like you did. I'd say I'm sorry, but you lured us to the tower because you took our chief of staff's family hostage. That was Guido, but we helped. Yes, we apologize for that, but with the hole in my ear, I think we can call it even. I hadn't wanted to mention the bandage that stuck out despite his hat. I exercised the greatest amount of self-discipline in not staring at it. What do you want from us? I want you to take Guido out, Freddy said. We'll pay your usual contract fee, but we need it done quickly. He's set to invade my board by next week. We have nine days to upset the apple cot. Jenny returned, and Freddy nodded to her. They want to hire us to remove Guido from the equation, I told her. That was predictable. Is there anyone who wants him around? Jenny wondered. Captain Shortpants? You said he's not running a big organization. I wanted maximum clarity on the players in the game. Where would we find enemies? Paul's seven operators are all Hispanic. His contracts are for Hispanic targets that aren't police favorites, so his activities stay off their blotters. Sounds almost like our contracts. Seven? But they're all in Houston? They've done work elsewhere, but yeah, mostly in Houston. It's a big city with a lot of posturing for turf. Kind of like here. 
We don't do a lot of work here. Almost everyone is dirty here, and almost everyone is in bed with someone from the government. It's the damnedest thing. I wasn't trying to be dramatic. Vetting Chicago targets was a hassle and hardly ever bore fruit. What's the contract on Guido worth to you? I'd say ten million, if you can do it in less than nine days. I blew out of breath to almost whistle. Jenny frowned. We needed Babs to pick up the pace with her inquiries, but couldn't push that without revealing who we were. Maybe it was time to send the package to a few competitors. We'll think about it while we eat. I didn't need to tell him Guido was on our short list of targets, a list that only had one name on it, or two if you counted Tony Puccio as a name worth checking. From a business perspective, it would be good to get paid a princely sum for something we were doing anyway. Timothy took our order after Freddy deferred to us to order for him. We went with lasagna and a wedge salad with blue cheese crumbles. I ordered a grilled cheese with extra ketchup just to show we didn't need to order something that was on the menu. Jenny went with a chef's salad. No ingredients were listed on the menu under that listing. One went with the chef's whims for the day. The quality of our meals earned some respect from Freddie Mac and Philippa San Bernardino. Are you going to join the club? I asked when we were finished. It's a long way from where we live, Freddie replied. I'll take that as a yes. You'll need to visit Gladys on the second floor. We'll take you there when we're finished. That's part of the fee to do the job. We'll take it. We'll return to New York first thing tomorrow because there's a lot of work to do if we're to meet your short deadline. I will be forever in your debt if you can pull this off. Freddy put his hand on my chest as if feeling for my heartbeat. You'll pay the fee. If we pull this off or when we pull this off, we'll all benefit. I will caveat it with Guido's removal may not necessarily entail killing him. It might be better if we don't but that will take the complete destruction of his empire by showing him to be something so deplorable that everyone will run from him. I hadn't thought of a misinformation campaign to that level until that moment. Child trafficking, sex trafficking, it would dissociate him from anyone he would wish to do business with. Once he was out of the picture, then we could sanction him at our leisure. Time could be on our side by buying more of it. Epstein didn't kill himself. But no one seemed to care about that because of his crimes. Guido needed to fall into the same cesspool and drown. After lunch, we headed upstairs. Gladys greeted us warmly, as she always did. As soon as I introduced Freddie and Philippa, her face fell and she glared at me. It was Guido who ordered leveraging you. And it's Guido that Freddie and Philippa just contracted with us to sanction. We'll be going back to New York first thing tomorrow. How about a red eye? Gladys offered. A late night flight that would arrive first thing in the morning, East Coast time. Since you're not driving, you can rest on the way to the airport and rest more on your flight. Early bird gets the worm. Gladys was paying us back for sins of our past. Sure, make it a red eye. Have the good people pick us up when they need to get us there in time. Thanks, Gladys, for eliminating any chance of a good night's sleep. I'm here for you. Gladys replied. I'll take care of the paperwork for Mr. Mack. She pulled a sheet of paper from her desk drawer and handed it over. It was the simplest of forms. We wanted names and a way to verify your information, along with direct payment details. We watched Freddy fill it out. He handed it back. That's it? We'll take care of everything from here, except the little thing about payment for the other contract. That needs to hit our account before we leave. We stood in uncomfortable silence while Gladys ran the application through a scanner to input the data and jumped online to set up our trip. We have a business to run, of course, I explained, not making it sound like a shakedown. He started tapping on his phone. It's the bank in the Cayman Islands, right? It is. Once he was ready, I dictated the account number. He tapped the transfer and shut down his phone. Done. No more from me, Mr. Bragg. You have enough of my money. Now, I want to see results. I don't blame you. My word is good, Freddy. We will take care of business in our own way on your timeline. We shook hands once more. Her name is Maria Cruz, the woman you talked out of trying to kill you. We'll give her number to Gladys, Freddy said before he ushered Philippa through the door. I don't like those kinds of surprises, Ian, Gladys snapped. It took all I had not to throw my stapler at him. 
I thank you for your restraint. I never took you for a brute until I heard you yelling at the men in your house. I'm not always the calm and collected pentagenarian you're used to. Jenny and I had a good laugh. Give her the library's award, I quipped. But I had to get serious. We had a nearly insurmountable climb before us. We better get home and get ourselves in the right frame of mind. None of what happens next is going to be easy. Chapter 25 We Are What We Believe We Are C.S. Lewis Our home in the Hamptons, following the early morning hustle of the city, provided a calm respite, a zen-like reprieve from the grind, but we had work to do. I figured we wouldn't be spared a trip back to the city if everything we had in place failed. We'd only been gone five days, so we were still getting images from the trail cam. Another vehicle came, a limousine, but the license plate didn't show in any of the shots. Black Cadillac Escalades were so common as to add no fidelity to a search for its owner. We couldn't see the dignitary's face when he entered the mansion, but during the exit an hour later we acquired a clear shot. He didn't look familiar, so we ran an image search on the net. This is enlightening. I turned the monitor so Jenny could see it. She'd brought her computer from Chicago, since we needed two for the research-heavy work we were doing. Ours for one small morsel that didn't add in with the other morsels. It was a buffet that wouldn't serve a single meal. A movie producer? This guy could play into the child trafficking narrative. But then if he wasn't doing that stuff, I'd feel pretty bad. When we launch this missile, it'll be scorched earth, destroying everyone it touches, even if they disprove it. How many innocents are we willing to sacrifice to get to the guilty man? Jenny asked. She knew the answer, as did I. It was one of the immutable laws of what we did. None. We have to keep looking. But why was this guy there? Probably trying to get funding for a movie, nothing more. I'll check him out, Jenny said. She disappeared into her computer. She would forever be a student. That's why she made a good teacher and a good leader of the Peace Archive. An email arrived in my McStufflebeam account. There was only one person who had that email, Babs Jekyll. I opened it. There was a single link using a shortener program. It could have been a virus or something as bad. I checked the firewall and that my virus protections were up to date. Then I clicked the link. It led to a news article on page 100 of the New York City Post, which wasn't owned by anyone who lived in New York. It was insulated somewhat from local politics. The article was everything I hoped. An American Oligarch by Barbara Jekyll, Pulitzer nominee. What did the Russian oligarchs do to earn their billions? They cozied up with the government after the fall of the Soviet Union and took private control of public sectors for pennies on the dollar. No one was there to prevent it. Political loyalty to the new regime was rewarded with obscene wealth, which was then used to line the pockets of the corrupt. It was nothing more than a self-licking ice cream cone. The people's plight hadn't changed, only their masters. They were given tendrils of false hope to carry them from day to day. Products arrived, overpriced and of questionable quality, but the shelves were no longer empty because communism failed. Yay, capitalism! It changed nothing that the oligarchs did to earn or keep earning their wealth. But that's not why you've read this far. This isn't a history lesson, but present-day America, right in our own backyard of Farmingdale. Picture of the Kalkovecki Mansion. Who owns the house in this picture? You'd be hard-pressed to find that information. The property was initially bought by a Tony Puccio out of bankruptcy before a luxurious mansion was built, the only one with an unimpeded view of Bethpage Black. It's like winning the lottery and being given a home along the 18th fairway of Augusta National. If you're not a golfer, this is a big deal and increases a property's value exponentially. A bankruptcy purchase. A home whose records are sealed. Who is Tony Puccio, who conveniently disappeared about the time that Guido Calcavecchi appeared? Are they the same person? That wouldn't matter, but what does Mr. Calcavecchi do to afford such a palace? Once again, you would be hard-pressed to find the answer. Maybe we should ask the mayor of Queens, who was seen visiting the compound this past week. 
or maybe Nino Chinafor, the producer who also visited the compound. Were they both trolling for money? There's nothing wrong with providing campaign donations or backing a film, but Guido Calcavecchi is not listed on any of the required donor forms to the mayor's campaign. Guido Calcavecchi is not listed in the credits of any China 4 directed film. Guido Calcavecchi, a man with vast wealth, a man who runs no businesses, a man with no family legacy. Who is this American oligarch? What does he do for his money? Like Paul Harvey used to say, wait until you hear the rest of the story. Part 2 coming tomorrow. You have to read this. I turned my computer around so Jenny could read the article. Consider yourself played, Jenny whispered. Nicely done, Ian. I knew she couldn't resist. It's a juicy story with black hole-sized voids of information. As soon as she started digging, she was hooked. She only wanted to link us in for more story fodder, but she's got enough. I scowled at the screen. Like we were talking about with innocent people, I think she has made herself a target. I brought up the trail cam and reviewed the last hour of images. The article had published only 20 minutes earlier. Ten minutes ago, Guido left his garage in a Bentley sports coupe. He power slid into the street and was gone. The acceleration out of the compound was so violent it activated the motion sensor and the cam recorded the departure in streaming video. Fifteen seconds after the sports car departed, a small red car raced by. It was the kind of car an underpaid reporter might drive. Sure looked like her, Jenny said. I nodded. The video stopped streaming after a minute. Where are you going, Guido? And it begs the question, why didn't he summon the lowlifes to him? I think he's going to pound on someone's desk, like the mayor's, Jenny suggested. I would love to know who. We'll find out as soon as Babs goes to print. What if he's going to the Post's main offices in Manhattan? Then he's going to have a long and miserable drive, Jenny said. I'm glad Babs is following him and not us. I'm not good with going downtown. Not today. Me neither. Start the clock. We'll see when he gets home. If he's alone in his sports car, that may be a great time to take a shot. If only we had a weapon that would do it. it. Sounds like we're going somewhere. Queens? The mayor is hobnobbing with someone like Guido when he should be working to make the city safe for its residents and guests. I could see that as a comment on the Post's article, Jenny said. We accessed the comments below Babs's article. They weren't plentiful, but the usual conspiracy theories to the outright psychotic. No, Guido was not an alien from outer space. I typed in a comment using my McStufflebeam email. It would compromise the email and I'd start getting spammed because the web service or newspaper would sell the email to any and all advertisers who wanted it. It was worth it. I can't believe the mayor is hobnobbing with a child molester like Guido Calcavecchi when he should be addressing crime in Queens. Is that how you want to play it? Is the mayor collateral damage? If he's meeting with Guido, I have to assume he's dirty, since none of Guido's campaign donations show up anywhere. Dark money. It's not illegal, but it's unethical. Heaven forbid people ask the mayor uncomfortable questions. I submitted the comment. We'll see what the conspiracy theorists have to say about it. In the meantime, we have an event to plan. Friday night, 16 days hence, there shall be a bash here at Casa Bragg. Catering is locked in, Jenny replied without looking up from her computer. Please tell me you didn't order any vegetarian stuff. I ordered vegetables, but nothing specifically for vegetarians. It's a meat fest. Thank God. I thrust my arms over my head and cheered. Denying people food is worth cheering? I lost my smile and adopted my most neutral expression. No, having a meat fest catered is what I was cheering. The deniers will be able to fend for themselves. We'll have enough of the usual stuff, won't we? Ian, how long have you known me? I feel like there's a right answer to this question that doesn't involve the exact number of days that I've been blessed by your company. She waited. Long enough to know that you take care of everyone and that I eat last so there's plenty to make sure I get a good meal? Was that so hard? No. I'm detail-oriented and have a tendency to question every element that goes to those details. Who have we invited so far? Jenny shook her head. 
No one. That's your department. I stared into the distance. I started making phone calls to the usual suspects. I left voicemails for half of them and had short conversations with the other half. Mark Gadsden always took my call and agreed to come right away. He said he'd bring a friend he wanted to introduce me to. That was how we ran the business. Personal recommendations led to more and better work. The hedge fund guys had voicemails. They'd probably harangue each other until they all came. Max had pulled strings to get us a tea time. The twenty grand we won wasn't enough to buy an automatic favor, especially since he did most of the work in our team victory. We didn't invite anyone else. We hadn't grown our contacts in any way since our first party, which seemed like years ago, but had only been a few months. That settled. We were on track for a good time. Back to Guido the Killer Pimp. I brought up the Post's article, and the comments section was getting lively. Both defenders and supporters were railing on the mayor. A fellow child molester? Dirty oligarch supporting self-serving scumbag? A good man who should sue everyone casting aspersions? I guess they didn't understand that public persons had little protection against spurious allegations. I never said the mayor was a molester, and no one was coming to Guido's defense, not even Guido. For him to sue, he'd have to make the case for himself. Civil court was less congenial regarding innocent until proven guilty. Also, they'd never find out who we were. Barry McStufflebeam didn't exist, and nothing associated with the email would lead anyone to us. Have fun filing that lawsuit. People who had never had to employ lawyers were the first ones to scream that someone should sue. Those were lucrative for the lawyer and almost no one else. Some people seemed to have insight into the mayor, but no one knew anything about Guido. I pulled up the email and found four recommendations for home warranties, two for vehicle warranties, two for window replacements, and one home loan offer. What do you say I send a note to Babs and let her know we saw her chasing Guido? How about we roll a dealer and get what we need to close out Guido's campaign against us? That's a good start. I only had to adjust the plates on our Jeep before leaving. Chapter 26 We all have ability. The difference is how we use it. Charlotte Witten We checked the seedier areas of Queens, or what we thought were seedy. It took a while to find the corner-standing gimp soliciting people. He wasn't the one we were looking for. He was a front, a mule carrying a certain amount of product. It was the thug in the shadows who was running the operation. He would be the one who was armed. We drove around the block and parked the next street over. We walked one way, clockwise, to get closer to our new friend. I pulled my hat down low on my forehead. Jenny also wore a hat, one she liked, that would find its way into a dumpster between here and home. We usually ditched whatever we used when committing a crime. It was the only way to be sure evidence didn't get into our house. Like the gun. It was a single-use item. We ditch it as soon as possible. I was never comfortable having weapons at the house or on our persons. We could never be casually accused of being violent if we weren't working the system. We walked along, arm in arm, as if nothing important was going on. We took a hard turn at the alcove where the man we tagged as a dealer was standing. We need some smack for a good evening, I said. There's your man out there, he pointed with the lid end of a cigarette, drawing it back to his mouth dangerously close to my face. Nah, he's nobody. You're running the show, and you'll have the quantity we need for a full evening. We're having guests. Not me. And if you know what's good for you, you'll walk away. The sun was low in the sky. It was late, but not quite night. I was comfortable that he was the one we sought. I stared into his eyes for a second, which froze him. I drove a heel strike into his chin. He never saw it coming. He staggered back, and I hammered a fist into his throat. He gasped for breath, hands clutching at his damaged windpipe. Blood streamed from his mouth where he'd bitten through his tongue. He started gagging. You gonna puke? I thought you were a tough guy. Let me help you. I pushed his head down until his face hit my knee. That left a blood splatter on my jeans, but it couldn't be helped. We'd be gone momentarily. He would have collapsed had I not been holding him. Jenny checked his waistband and pulled out a Glock 41. 
I could tell what it was at a glance. It was a nice weapon, far better than what I would have guessed he was carrying. He didn't strike me as a connoisseur. Jenny finished searching him. His drug stash was trapped in a medical wrap around his ankle. We took it, ripped the bags open, and dumped the product into the grass. I punched him in the side of the head and let him crumple. We strolled off, past the man on the corner. He shied away from us. If he witnessed the attack, he wouldn't say anything. I made a finger gun and pointed it at him. He shivered and looked away. We increased our pace. It was time to get out of there. We walked without holding hands, casually looking for any friends of the dealer, but no one appeared. Had we hassled the man on the street, he wouldn't have had a weapon, and the one who did would have had a clean shot at us. Our familiarity with the trade was an uncomfortable truth of how we ran our business. People doing illegal things tended to have illegal weapons, which was what we needed. A weapon outside the system. Three men popped out of a house and yelled at us. Hey! They started to run. What's the plan? Jenny asked. The men were big, but overweight. They were probably strong, but would be slow. We fight them. Go for the knees, I said out of the side of my mouth. We separated, putting a body length between us. What's up, fellas? I called as they closed on us. All three ran for me. I moved aside to give Jenny an angle to come in from behind them. Two men were in front, side by side. I lined them up to determine which to take on first. Knives appeared in their hands. Escalation required escalation. Never bring a knife to a gunfight. I pulled the pistol and aimed. The man in the back produced his own pistol. He started to bring it up. I shot him in the face before we began any macho posturing. The other two hesitated. I shot them both in the chest, single shots to the heart. They collapsed. I was firing a forty-five. The impact at this range would be lethal. Jenny vaulted over one of the bodies. I turned and ran. We hit the corner at a sprint, and once out of sight, we slowed to a walk. We continued to our jeep, climbed in, and left making numerous turns before getting back on the road to the Hamptons. We changed the license plate back to our own the second we got home. My heart was racing. Why did they have to come after us? I grumbled. Bad guys have to do bad guy stuff. You were sounding like me. It wasn't the first time I'd said that. It confirmed that I was a bad influence. I wondered how many Jennyisms I had picked up. My heart is racing too, Ian. That was a lot more exciting than it should have been. So you beat up a dealer and trashed however much of his product he was pushing. Those three shouldn't have come after us. They made a bad choice. Pulling weapons exacerbated the situation. They failed at life, I replied. I know I should feel bad about it, but I sure wasn't going to take a beating from the likes of them. And I sure as hell wasn't going to let them kill us like they did Chaz. People with so little respect for life shouldn't be surprised when they so easily lose theirs. Once on the highway, I accelerated to the speed limit, but didn't exceed it. There was a constant stream of cars lined up to pass us. I let the first ten go around, and then sped up to keep pace with the slowest of the speeders. That got us back to the Hamptons and home, where we fired up the burn barrel and lit my fake cardboard license plate on fire. Using a stir stick and tender, I made sure it burned up completely. Printed on gloss paper and attached to a license plate-sized foam board, it was a passable version. The shadow of the license plate bracket covered much of it to keep casual observers from noticing. The bracket from some used car dealer would get tossed in a bush miles from our house later tonight. While I was in the back, Jenny checked the trail cam images for the previous two hours. She then joined me, carrying an ice-cold dark beer. Guido hasn't come home yet, she announced. Well, well, where has our little criminal gotten to? You think you could take him at the gate? Jenny asked. Bold, too bold. I shook my head. He's got cameras everywhere. Maybe in a few days I can put on the homeless look and camp out, but I'll have to do the gate guard too, and I would prefer not to do that. Maybe we can upgrade the Glock to a thirty aught six sporting rifle. Always the humanitarian, and I agree, just Guido. Thanks to the red eye, we still have eight days left. We sat out by the pool with the lights off and the screen dimmed. We waited for another hour before Guido rolled up to the gate. We had a single image of the guard lifting the gate for him. 
Guido made it into the garage before the next image was taken. This trail cam sucks, I said. We should be able to trigger it remotely to record video. How many trail cams have an active Wi-Fi near them? That's not a feature of any value in the woods. If only the motion sensor reached to his gate. Time to send Babs a love note, I said. The email was getting flooded with spam emails. Screw this city post. Those guys are scum-sucking bloodsuckers who would sell their own grandmothers for a buck. What do you really think, Ian? Jenny joked. You knew what was going to happen the second you commented. I chuckled. That was worth it, though. Aliens. Some people are entertaining by their very presence. They had no value, mind you, but they're entertaining. I'm sure their families still love them, Jenny offered. I hoped that was the case. We were of the same mind in believing that people were inherently good. I pushed the computer toward Jenny. Read this, if you would be so kind. Barbara, felicitations. We noticed you were following Guido when he raced out of his home yesterday. We're curious where y'all went. We suspected it was to the New York City Post main offices in Manhattan, where he could rail on your editor to get you fired and the article expunged. He could have gone to an illicit meeting with the mayor, too. You know you hit the nail on the head when you get that kind of activity, what? Your article asked tough questions that I hope lead to answers. Inquiring minds and all that tripe. Best to you and yours, Barry McStufflebeam. Jenny read it twice. Y'all? And what? I don't want her to profile me as anyone, so I mixed colloquialisms from a variety of cultures. She will be appropriately confused. I like your use of the word tripe, but I'll tell you that your grammar is impeccable. My eighth graders would have been impressed. She signaled for me to press send, so I did. Look at this. It's like our actions are getting reactions. I like being in the driver's seat. On the feed from the trail cam, two Escalades waited at the gate. The guard was still in the shack while the vehicles waited. That told us he wasn't prepared for their arrival. Ten seconds later, the image looked the same. Ten more seconds saw the first one through the gate and the second following. The next image had four men in suits walking toward the door while two more men in suits waited at their vehicles. Drivers wearing suits and sunglasses, even though it's almost dark. Reeks of government to me. Is it time to call Jimmy? Or heaven forbid, that Rick Bannock guy? They're both good people. Neither approves of what we do, but at least they recognize the necessity of it. We get results. Jenny waited patiently while I tried to decide whether to make a call. I didn't want to bother the vice president, but Rick might already know what was going on. Okay, I'll give Rick a call. I tapped in his number. It rang until it kicked over to voicemail. You can leave a message, but I won't get it. Please call my office at 202-555-1212 if you must talk with someone. I'm not sure they'll answer, but at least you have a better chance than by calling me. Rick completely doesn't care, does he? Jenny said. I didn't need to have the phone on speaker for her to hear. That's something I don't understand. He's a bureaucrat, but he hates them as much as we do. He is also good about telling the truth when it comes to talking with people who aren't used to hearing it. I'm all kinds of jiggy with that, Jenny said. Leave the colloquialisms to me. You are far too cultured to pull it off. I waggled my eyebrows at her. I studied the images on the screen. The drivers remained outside the vehicles, and we were treated to a decent look. I took screenshots throughout and zoomed in, trying to learn if the drivers were armed. That would tell me more about who we were dealing with. The good news is that we didn't have to wait long for the dignitaries to leave. The bad news was that the images weren't clear enough to conduct a search. We had one license plate and no idea who it belonged to. I don't feel like talking to Rick's office, so we don't have that silver bullet to fire. Puts us back at the beginning. I pulled up my email. Not exactly at the beginning. I added a couple screenshots as attachments. My email to Babs was simple. Who dis? She would figure out where our camera was, but she wouldn't be able to get to it without climbing a fence that wasn't meant to be climbed. I doubted she was a golfer or knew anyone who liked her enough to play around on her behalf. There we go, making our own luck. Jenny chuckled. Guido is spinning, and so are the people in his circle. 
Anonymity was his shield. Once that was breached, it was like turning on the lights and seeing the cockroaches run for cover. I smiled. I like that. Guido is such a... My untraceable phone rang. I recognized the number. It was Freddie Mac. How does he have this number? I wondered. Gladys, which tells me you should answer it. I pressed the green button and held the phone to my ear. I can hear you breathing, Ian, Freddie said. A phone call from the inimitable Freddie J. Mac. How do I deserve this honor? Guido called. He was furious. He said he was sending his boys after me. For what it's worth, he said you were toast, too. I figured. He's scrambling right now. I'm not sure his boys, whatever that means, are going to be working for him much longer. I'm concerned, Ian. My house isn't exactly Fort Knox. As you figured out, I talk a tough game, but I'm not quite all that. I'll call Gladys and ask her to put you in my house until we have things squared away with Guido. You need to hurry, Freddy countered. We're going as fast as is reasonable. If Guido offs you before he has someone on the board, it will eliminate his chance of gaining control over your companies. If it comes down to it, you can go to your grave knowing that, in the end, you gave him the finger. Is that a joke? Are you trying to be funny? Honestly, this is my life you're talking about. It was kind of funny, but also a dose of reality. I think Guido's blustering. He's upset and not in control. This could be the second time in his life. The first was in the tower. He's getting slapped around a lot more than he can handle. He's flailing. We're going to give him a little more rope and he'll hang himself. I'd rather not wait that long. I'm afraid you'll have to, Freddy. He's holed up in his house right now, but he's got a stream of visitors, and they're not his boys. They are distinguished types that are probably yanking Guido around by his collar. Once again, it's more of the stuff he can't handle. We're going to ride this one for a while before we move. He's going to make a fatal error, if you get my drift. That's what people do when they're flustered. Chapter 27 People are not disturbed by things, but by the view they take of them. Epictetus I liked seeing Guido flail, at least from what an image every ten seconds showed. Ten minutes after the two Escalades left, a limo arrived. It parked close to the entryway. The passenger never appeared. You suck, I shouted at the screen. Next time I buy a better camera. What the hell was I thinking? You bought what was available without sending up flares with special orders. I feel like I should have remembered that. Maybe we needed to travel farther and wider to find what we needed. You were in a hurry. Jenny looked down her nose at me. Ah, uh, I remembered. It reinforced my man card, but did nothing for my credentials as a professional operator. Naked hot tub. I was distracted. In those instances, you have to think for me, and you know it. Are you making this my fault? I rethought my strategy after realizing the implication. It was 100% my fault, but if you could keep me from making such errors in the future, I would greatly appreciate it, while simultaneously not restricting the extracurricular activities, which I also am most thankful for. Jenny leaned close. I'll do my best, but sometimes I'm in a hurry too. She winked at me. I couldn't see the green in her eyes. It was too dark. The light from the computer screen was dampened and gray. Who is this person? I pointed at the screen. It had been less than five minutes before a figure was ducking into the car. At least we had the license plate. I sent Babs another email. It's getting exciting. I think she should be working right now, working on answers to our very important questions. I looked to Jenny to agree with me. You are the only one I know who works 24-7. Work is relative since we take a lot of time off. Beach time, casual time, travel. This job is hard because when we get into something, it becomes all-consuming. If I completely disconnect, I start making mistakes, like a trail cam that gives us 10% of the picture. Such mistakes can be lethal. At least we were on our game to relieve the dealer of his peace. Too bad his friends had to pay for it with their lives. Let's not rehash that, Jenny replied. She was right. We had to take a trip this evening to ditch the license plate frame. That would tie a bow on the day's events and put them behind us. Three different people or groups meeting with Guido at his home, plus one meeting somewhere else. 
I'm sure he wasn't out for a joyride. I wonder if the politicians are lining up to tell him they are returning his campaign donations. With his current state of mind, I doubt he's taking it well, Jenny suggested. Maybe that's why they're leaving so quickly. They have no need to listen to him yelling at them. I can hear them promising to lay low for a while, but they're still friends. The black hole of the friend zone. Friends without benefits. The screen showed more activity from Guido's house. It was him and the Bentley heading out of the gate. One image and he was gone. Where's he going now? I wondered. Does it matter? Jenny asked. Maybe now is the time for a homeless guy to stroll the road, ditch the plate and drop off. I was tired. We'd just come in that morning. A target of opportunity doesn't get any better. Yeah, let's go. I kept clothes that were well worn. A blanket that had been left in the garage when we bought the house would complete the outfit. A ratty Mets cap to hide my face. I rushed inside and removed everything that would identify me. I put on the old jeans and t-shirt, popped the cap on my head, stuffed the pistol in my waistband, and wrapped the blanket around my shoulders. You look dreadful, Jenny confirmed. I held up the license plate frames. We'll toss these on the way. You drive. Jenny was a good driver. I wasn't worried about that. And I wasn't a backseat driver either. I needed to get into character. Is it going to be this easy? I didn't think it would be. But if I could get a shot, I'd take it. Jenny drove a roundabout route, starting by heading north. We took a remote road with a darkened bend. Jenny accelerated to put distance between us and the vehicle behind. We rounded the corner, and I sent the frames spinning toward the ditch. I left the window down. We approached the turnoff to the loop going past Guido's mansion. Jenny pulled over. I hopped out, stumbled a few steps, and righted myself to continue staggering away. Once she was long gone, I drifted into the shadows. The area had more traffic than I liked, but not so much that I couldn't stay out of sight. I wandered until I could cross the road. I hauled myself over the fence that wasn't meant to be climbed and onto the Bethpage property. I moved one row of trees in and then moved parallel to the road. I had no way of checking since I left my phone behind. Then again, the trail cam was hooked to a burner phone that still had battery power. I retraced my steps to a spot that was 30 feet from the road but 200 yards from the trail cam. If I got the shot... That would give me time to get my setup down and take it away. The waiting was always the worst part. I stayed perfectly still in the shadows where I would remain unseen. The 45 felt good in my hand. The Glock 41 was a beautiful piece of hardware, smooth and easy to operate. I didn't bring any spare magazines because I didn't have any. The dealer only had the one magazine, but like the pistol quality, the magazine had been full with 13 rounds of 230 grain bullets. It now contained 10, the other three sent to new homes in Thug Cemetery. The safety was integral to the trigger, as in, pull the trigger to fire the pistol. It was one of the best weapons out there, especially for a person in my trade. I chambered around and placed the barrel through the fence, then focused on checking each approaching vehicle. There weren't many, one every couple minutes. I had thought the road was a dead end, but it was not. It connected two roads, and many used it as a shortcut. But I only cared about cars coming from one direction. I bet Guido would return from the same direction he'd left. The Bentley had unique headlights, and that would make it easier to identify, but I had to keep myself from staring at the headlights because I needed to shoot at a dark figure inside. I squinted. I kept one eye covered. I did a little bit of everything to make sure I could take the shot. After three hours, the Bentley appeared. I lined up the pistol and waited, ready to pull the trigger. It was technically a double action, but pulled evenly on every shot. The cocking mechanism worked with minimal pressure. The weapon was ready to fire, but a second set of lights hugged the Bentley's rear bumper. The last-minute rush of shoot or don't shoot ran through my head, I glanced back and forth from the Bentley to the car behind. It was too close. If I fired, I'd be spotted. I wouldn't have enough time to get away. I pulled the pistol away from the fence. The car behind the Bentley was a county police car, one of the law enforcement organizations on Long Island. 
It pulled into the compound behind Guido. This changes things, I whispered. My target put his Bentley into the garage, but walked out before closing the door. He shook the hands of the policeman driving the chase car and walked back into the garage. The door closed, and the officer left. That was it for me. I walked through the tree line of the golf course. I climbed into the tree and used the burner to call Jenny and let her know where I'd meet her. The walk down took a half hour before I climbed the fence to get next to the road. Jenny waited in a nearby parking area. I figured she'd spotted me when the lights came on and the jeep headed my way. She stopped just long enough for me to dive in. She was off before I had my seatbelt on. That was a bust, but it was a good shot had Guido been alone. I look forward to seeing the trail cam footage. The inchage, I corrected and chuckled lightly. Cops escorted him home, so maybe the politicians haven't completely abandoned him. That doesn't give me a warm and fuzzy. I fidgeted during the drive home. I wanted to take a shower and get some sleep. We could look at a better plan once we had fresh minds. I was out the second my head hit the pillow. Sometimes I thought Jenny was bothered by my ability to fall asleep within seconds. She'd toss and turn for a while and then have trouble getting up after she finally fell into a sound sleep. With an early rise, I was out on the patio in the cool of an early fall morning. I wore shorts and a hoodie while sipping coffee and checking the overnight activities of one Guido Calcovecchi. I hurried to check my faux email despite the spam. Babs was turning out to be our sole source for activity. She didn't disappoint me, and the New York City Post came through. Maybe Guido hadn't railed on the editor to get his story off the skyline. An American Oligarch, Part 2, by Barbara Jekyll, Pulitzer nominee. From mayors to producers to other unidentified government officials, what has Guido Calcovecchi been doing? He doesn't operate any businesses, not legally registered ones. How can such a demonstration of wealth be made without a source of earnings? Apparently, I'm paying more taxes than a man who rubs elbows with the mayor of Queens, who is apparently on speed dial and responds when summoned, as shown here. That's a limousine that you paid for with your tax money for the mayor to visit his source of dark money used to keep him in office. I have accepted no money from anyone named Guido Calcavecchi, the mayor said in response to my question. Campaign money that can't be tracked. How is the mayor showing his appreciation for this support? What is the mayor doing for his dark money friends? And Nino China for? And these other face-hiding amigos? Some people live their lives in private, while some people don't exist. Guido doesn't exist. Who lives in this mansion, and what does he do? The public deserves an answer, because your public servants are answering to him. Is this what the deep state looks like? Demand accountability from your elected representatives. We can't tell them who they should be friends with, but we sure as hell can tell them who they shouldn't do business with. Part 3 coming tomorrow. The Big Reveal. We know who Guido Calcavecchi is. Well now, Babs, you have outdone yourself by saying nothing and then showing the picture that will get our camera taken down. I reread the article. All supposition and innuendo. But she was attacking the one target there was to attack. The mayor was public property. I wanted to focus on Guido, but we couldn't. We had to come at him from a different direction. The lights came on upstairs at the mansion at exactly six in the morning. The spam was already getting out of control, so I highlighted all the emails in the McStufflebeam inbox, then deselected the ones from Babs. When I hit delete, I found one of Babs's messages that I hadn't read. He went to the Congressional Representative's office for the 6th District. Guido's mansion is in the 3rd District. Are you having me followed? although the information you've provided has blown open a hugely interesting can of worms. You'll see that I've moved from the Nobody Reads This section to page four. Tomorrow, it'll be front page coverage. I hit reply. Keep your head down. Guido is extremely dangerous. Keep fighting the good fight, Barbara, but lay low at least for now. You've shaken the bushes and all kinds of things are falling out. I double-checked to make sure I wasn't giving myself away, but I would feel bad if Babs got herself killed, even though she was reveling and doing what she did. Still, I put her into a dangerous situation for personal purposes. 
business purposes, that was. Jenny and I had been paid $10 million to make Guido go away. We had seven days remaining to fulfill the contract. I thought briefly about the $8 million we'd taken from the gang of four that we had not repaid. They made it hard. I'd pay back $2 million each to everyone but Guido. At 6.15, a limousine arrived to pick him up. The driver loaded a suitcase into the trunk. Jenny, I yelled. She had just gotten up to use the bathroom, but was not getting up for the day. Get dressed. We leave in one minute for the airport. Which airport? Jenny asked, instantly alert and rushing for the master bedroom. I was stumped. Was he taking a trip from a smaller airport on the island or from JFK? I'm guessing JFK. We need to get there before him. I stared at the image on the screen, agonizing through the ten-second wait for the next to give me an idea who the limo belonged to and which direction they'd go. The next picture showed a red Corvette pulled across the entrance and blocking the gate. Ten more seconds. The man walking toward Guido could have been the mayor of Queens or someone else entirely. He was dressed to stymie my camera, just like parking sideways. It was the drawback of sharing the pictures, but their value had been in stirring up the hornet's nest. Hold on, sweetheart, I shouted from the kitchen, where I held the computer in one hand while trying to stuff a banana in my face with the other. Jenny hurried to me, only half-dressed. We watched the images populate the screen. Is that the mayor? Or Nassau County officials? I admit that I'm woefully ignorant about the governments around here. Can't swing a dead cat without hitting an official. Farmingdale is a village. The county supplies the police. Congressional districts are all over the place. And what about state government? No wonder taxes are so damn high out here. We're paying for all of those people. You think taxes are high everywhere, so I'm not sure your barometer is calibrated like a normal person's. She poked me in the arm. Looks like someone thinks Guido isn't going anywhere. Guido isn't calling the shots. I grinned with the revelation. The next image showed who we thought was the mayor, standing calmly while Guido's image was blurred. His arms were maybe over his head. Is he frothing mad? I nodded. He's not in control. I leaned close to the screen. How's it feel, buddy? An image showed Guido carrying his bag into the house. The vet left, and then the limo. What do we do now? Jenny asked. Thank goodness we don't have to go to the airport. There are upsides to Guido being forced to hole up. Being forced. I mulled the words over. Who has that kind of control? The ones shielding him. You don't think it's the cops, do you? Not at all. Cops aren't going to put themselves at risk for a guy like him. Someone ordered the escort. But why? And most importantly, how can we use that to take care of him? Guido isn't going to go away. He becomes a greater threat the more he feels trapped. Wise words, my love, I told her. We'll try the homeless routine again whenever we see him leave. I had a good shot, but the police were too close. Guido's not stupid. Chapter 28 Do not let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. John Wooden the day passed without movement, then the next, and the one after that. We were down to four days to fulfill the contract. Barbara Jekyll's big reveal was that the individual was indeed Tony Puccio, but there was nothing on him before he abandoned that identity for the Guido persona. Another big nothing burger. She was on the first page, but there was no part four, and nothing came after. It made me wonder if they had gotten to the editor, or if there was enough real news to fill the pages. Babs hadn't emailed me back either. Three days of silence. Someone had counseled Guido that it was best to do nothing and wait for the news cycle to run its course. It looked like it had. Three days of flailing, followed by complete disinterest. No one was being asked the hard questions. The mayor rolled out a new initiative to get drug dealers off the streets of Queens following an unsolved triple murder. The implication was that it was a rival gang in a turf war. We were happy they believed that. I almost feel bad drinking fruity specials and watching the ocean while the rest of the world races past. Any bids on the three contracts? 
Jenny asked. I won't admit that I completely forgot about those. I accessed the dark web and maneuvered into the distant realms where the Peace Archive's series of gates held everyone at bay except those we wanted. Multiple bids on all the contracts. I beamed at Jenny. We read through each of the proposals before accepting an operator. These individuals were hungry for work. One was willing to travel from the East Coast, another from Florida. It was clear what needed to happen. We had to solicit more work. Chaz loved the salesman side of the business, where I disliked it to the point of bordering on hatred. It was a necessary evil, and Jenny was good at it. I preferred to let her handle it, but we weren't in Chicago. Not with this Guido mess hanging over our head. How did Guido learn about us? You might as well ask how many stars are in the sky, Jenny replied. We had our party coming up for the day after our contract concluded with Freddie Mac. We'd probably get more work there. I was hopeful. Being an operator wasn't all it was cracked up to be, but the money was ridiculously good. We probably should have bid out the contract on Guido. Jenny shook her head. Freddie and Philippa were adamant that we handled it personally. I guess there's that. I blew out a long breath and then stood. Time to spar. We've only been throwing around some iron. I need to sharpen my reflexes, which sharpens my mind. I'm sure a plan will come to me in the millisecond before you punch me in the face. I would never punch you in the face just so you can see the way ahead. Jenny tried to look contrite. For a school teacher, you've got a mean streak. She didn't. She was everything my parents would have wanted for a daughter-in-law. You'll need to meet a teacher on the first day of school, and then the last day. You'll see cynicism, defeatism, and barely enough tolerance to leave the school parking lot without driving over as many of the students as she could find. There are good students, aren't there? That's the only reason they come back the next fall. After drinking all summer, Jenny quipped. She saluted me with her glass, but it was only fruit punch, same as mine. It was early in the day, and until we fulfilled the contract, we needed to stay sharp. Tonight, I'm going undercover, and we'll stay that way until we can get to Guido. I wasn't happy about it, but the calendar was going to drive us as much as our target. I'll watch and listen. You'll need another burner phone, and probably a new battery for the trail cam, which is still where you put it. Surprisingly. I wasn't sure why Guido hadn't sent someone to remove the camera. I want to go back through the images. The day after the Corvette confrontation, as we took to calling it, there was a ten-minute-long space where we didn't get any images. I thought a bird had landed in front of the camera and was blocking the view, but it wasn't blocked. It was blank. I compared the image that appeared after the dead space with an image from before. The perspective had shifted slightly. They recorded for a day, and then replaced the image feeding into our camera with their own. We've been watching a loop for the past day. I sighed. We've lost Guido. Maybe. We can't see his movements, but he could be at home. We simply didn't see him leave or return or any of his visitors. Going homeless starting right now, I said. I bet he'll count on us figuring out the looping video, but it's only been a day. I need to get into position. He's going to give us a shot and I better be ready to take it. Jenny wasn't happy about it. The morning daylight showed all the warts. We couldn't hide. Whatever we did would be in the open. That meant a combat roll out of the jeep and into a ditch in a secluded area, then the slow stagger to the target zone. I wasn't sure about climbing the fence into Beth Page in the daylight, but I'd do what had to be done. A burner phone, a battery pack, you have more of a plan than to wait in the trees. I do. I'm going to enter his house, and then I'm going to take him down. Jenny was taken aback, physically recoiling at my so-called plan. We have no idea what the inside of the house looks like. We don't know anything about what is beyond that gate besides there are lots of cameras. Sniper insert. An hour to crawl 20 feet, get inside the camera coverage. Will it work? Motion-activated cameras won't pick up super slow motion, and someone watching the feed from 20 different units will miss the slow approach. As I was working my way into a firing position, there was cover on the west side, enough to get close to an upstairs window. Jenny shook her head. Are you bringing a ladder? 
She knew the answer and didn't like it. Spider-Man routine. I'll climb the wall. It's in a corner, and I'll wear my shoes with a good tread. I smiled broadly while shrugging into my clean yet nasty-looking homeless outfit. I draped the blanket over my shoulders. It was cool enough that I'd appreciate the blanket. I had plenty of time waiting for him to think about this. If he leaves the mansion, I'll go in. He'll get an ugly surprise when he gets home. What if his house is bugged and he knows you're there? Then you'll give me a heads up. I'll undongle the trail cam first. I expect it has a unit attached that's feeding it the image loop. I held my hands out at ten and two as if holding a steering wheel. We're back in the driver's seat, baby. I'm not feeling it, Jenny shot back. We're going to finish this by finishing him. The politicians will turn their backs, and this will go the way of the blue buffalo. Let the news cycle pass us by. My exfiltration plan is going to be due north, because we've not used that direction before. My target is the Pine Ridge Conservation Area. There are a pair of hotels backed up against it. The parking is covered by trees. I'll meet you there, slipping into the back seat. Just sit there and enjoy the weather with the doors open. We've done it that way before. Take a sandwich and a coffee. Jenny scowled. She used my computer to bring up the map. That's three miles away from Guido's house. You have to cover three miles after making a hit? There's enough tree cover that I won't be in the open for long. I opened my shirt to the t-shirt I had on underneath from a bridge run three years ago. I also had on running shorts that were little more than underwear. I'll be jogging when I'm in the open. It'll go fast. Probably still take an hour. I'll call on my new burner, but the 800 number that forwards to the untraceable phone? Can't make it easy on anyone who might get me. You better have Stacy on speed dial in case we need her. Don't say things like that, Ian. It scares me. Guido isn't going gently into the good night. I'll hit him the instant I see him, no posturing. He's the one who has a Kevlar briefcase. He probably wears body armor when he goes out. I just need to get inside his action loop and be waiting for him when he returns home. Why are you convinced he's leaving? Because I have no doubt he's the one who spoofed the camera. A politician would have simply had it taken down. Running a separate feed has a lot more moving parts. I'm sure it was Guido. We finished what we needed to do, including test calling the 800 number, then deleting the call history. They could probably dissect the SIM card within to figure it out, but that toll-free number would be long dead by then, with no record of who owned it, at least not anyone real. The SIM card would be buried in a hole somewhere in the middle of the woods. That was my plan. I had high hopes that it would execute exactly as planned. It would be the first time, but as they say, there's a first time for everything. Chapter 29 To be is to do. Immanuel Kant Jenny took the jeep to a maintenance access on the Bethpage property. I was stuffed between the front and rear seats. Passenger door, she whispered over her shoulder. I popped the door and scooted out, hitting dirt and rocks without ever lifting my head above the window frame. I kicked the door shut and scooted into the brush. Jenny rolled the jeep toward the entrance, then looked left and right before playing on her phone as if trying to figure out which way to go. I low-crawled deeper into the brush. The only problem was that I had to go the other way. I was south and east when I wanted to be north and west. I had to be invisible. I moved under the fence where it was in ill repair and assumed my homeless shamble as I walked up the road. I moved in front of Jenny, who had not yet left. She accelerated without looking and then jammed on the brake, sliding in the gravel to stop inches from me. I threw up the back of my hand at her and shouted a string of obscenities. Get out of here, you! A man shouted from a small trailer that looked like an office. He ran toward the jeep. I shuffled toward the road, waving my middle finger at him, the jeep, and everywhere. Go on! He made a fist at me. I ducked my head and hunched under my blanket. I could hear his voice soften. Are you okay, miss? I'm fine, but my husband would be mad if he thought I ran someone over. Husbands are like that. He'd probably make it like it was your fault, too, so you feel guilty. I seen it all, and you aren't to blame. That beggar jumped in front of you. She almost ran me over. 
No, it really would have been her fault, I thought. We'd have a good laugh about it later, but for the present, I had about a thousand yards to go before I'd be in position for the next phase of the operation. It started with crawling through a culvert from one side of the road to the other, to Guido's side. I wasn't a fan of going underground. I preferred the stars above my head. Alas, that wasn't to be since it was daytime. I shuffled, staggered, rested, stared into the distance, and acted like I had no purpose in life, when at that moment I had a singular focus on bringing one Guido Calcavecchi to justice. Justice of the vigilante sort. Justice that came with a ten million dollar price tag. I passed by Guido's house on the Beth Page side and kept going until I reached the culvert. The dip in the ground allowed runoff from the golf course to disappear through the culvert under the road and into a storm drain on the other side. That runoff came through a gap under the fence. I'd gone vertical to get over it last time. Now I was going under it. With my blanket in hand, I squirmed underneath and crawled into the tree line, moving tactically toward my camera. I climbed the tree to find the trail cam plugged into a secondary device also using a backup battery that had been bundled with mine and the burner phone. Don't mind if I do. I now had two power cables and two backup batteries. I used the second one to provide direct power to the trail cam after removing the plug-in from the secondary feed. I connected the phone to the backup I was carrying. I left the first battery, and then I thought I'd better plug it into the secondary source in case it was being monitored. Three devices, three batteries, each using minimal power to achieve its purpose. Another thought came to me. With the new battery, I had as much juice as I needed for the trail cam. I toggled it to full-time video. That would be the indicator to Jenny that I had reached the camera. I checked the aim and finally climbed down. I moved easily from tree to tree until I was at the culvert, back under the fence and into the ditch. I hunched under my blanket and watched. The entrance to Guido's house was a good two hundred yards away. I hoped it was far enough to provide cover for me. My initial assessment told me nothing. The gate guard was inside his shack, no vehicles were in front of the house, and I couldn't tell if any lights were on inside. All I could do was watch and wait. Except that I had a phone. I dialed the 800 number. Jenny picked up on the first ring. My wife is so hot, everyone hits on her. You gave me the finger. She laughed. I'm happy I didn't hit you. What were you thinking? How was that my fault? I shook my head as if I hadn't heard properly. I'm in position. How's the feed? I'm not home yet. Close. Give me two minutes. I'll hold, I said as if talking to a customer service agent. I could hear the garage door close and then the door to the house as Jenny went inside. Thirty seconds later, she was back on. Live feed now, eh? Looking good. This is so much better. Probably burn through the battery, but I give it a day to resolution. I'm hunkered down and waiting. I have eyes on the gate. I'll move if he moves. Be careful. Get back to it. I love you, Ian. Jenny ended the call before I could reply. She was right. Even though the phone was under my blanket, it still wouldn't do to be talking on it while observing Guido's compound. The morning dragged into the afternoon, dragged into the evening. I was getting stiff from sitting in one position. Darkness fell, leaving me feeling better about where I could see as well as be seen. The floodlights to Guido's house came on, and his garage door rolled up. He drove out, slowly and casually. That gave me a different idea. I eased the forty-five into my hand. It was loaded and ready to fire. I crawled forward to the road's edge. The Bentley entered the road and took a left, going the other way. I tucked the pistol back into my waistband. Back to plan A. I had checked the culvert in the daylight. There was storm debris inside, but nothing that blocked the tunnel completely. I still only made it about fifteen feet before I turned on the light from my burner phone. There was a limit to what I could do, and I hid it with the complete darkness inside the confines of a partially blocked culvert. My shoulders nearly rubbed the sides, 
which added a difficulty factor when trying to navigate over a stump caught in the middle and the sludge that I had to power through to get to it. I sucked in my stomach and contorted myself as much as I could, but there wasn't enough room. I backed up and pushed the stump in front of me, but it wouldn't slide. It had protrusions from branches that had been ripped off. I had to lift it and toss it a foot at a time. Lift, toss, crawl, and repeat. I held my phone in my teeth with the light facing down. It was enough to keep me from going insane. By the time I passed into open air, I was more than ready to be outside again. I was also a sopping mess. It would be nearly impossible to sneak into Guido's compound as wet and nasty as I was. I stripped down to my running shorts and t-shirt, which left me to carry the phone in one hand and the pistol in the other. I turned the phone off so I didn't accidentally light up the screen during my approach to the target. I dumped my blanket and clothes into the water, making sure it was soaked thoroughly where no DNA could be recovered. No one needed to know that I was there. The only problem was that I had lost my disguise. The gate guard looked to be my size. A new plan formed in my mind. Remove the gate guard, but do it without being seen. I looked at the blanket covered in sludge. Damn it! I wrung it out as best I could, knocking off the big chunks, and put my pants back on, which was worse than putting on a wet swimsuit. I was sure people would do a lot worse for ten million, but I wasn't doing it for the money. I was doing it because Guido needed to go. I half ran, half waddled down the road. The gate guard popped out as I approached. He carried a baton as if he'd been a police officer in a previous life. Move along, he growled and shook his stick at me. My head was completely shrouded in the blanket. I showed nothing that could identify me. I turned toward him. Hungry, I grunted. I don't care. Get out of here before I crease your skull. He took another step toward me. I cowered but didn't back down. I stumbled two steps toward the guard and fell to my knee. You stink. He reached down with his free hand to yank me to my feet. I came upright with an uppercut to the point of his chin. The crunch said I'd broken his jaw. He staggered. I headbutted the bridge of his nose and his eyes rolled back in his head. I dragged him to the small guard shack. I waited to see if anyone in the house was watching but the cameras led to a bank of monitors inside the gate building. There were also motion sensors and a panic button. I wondered who would respond if that button was pushed. I removed my nasty clothes and wiped off best I could, squeegeeing my body with my hand. I changed into his clothes. They were warm and dry. They made me feel better. The little things in life. True to form for an officer of the law, he had zip ties hanging inside the shack. I used them to truss him up tightly, legs and hands connected behind him while he lay on his face. I covered him with my nasty blanket. I kicked him every now and then to see if he had regained consciousness. I had hit him pretty hard, and the result was that he'd seen nothing. As long as he kept seeing nothing, we would be good, and I wouldn't have to hurt him further. The guard shack phone rang. My name tag read Jones. I picked up the phone and coughed a couple times before finally muttering in the raspiest voice I could, Jones, on my way in, eat a cough drop, would you? Guido hung up before I had to reply. I was liking plan C. I stepped outside and prepared to lift the gate. We'd seen how the guard did it from when Guido left an hour earlier. The Bentley rolled up from the same direction it had left. I started to raise the gate and then coughed and coughed until I nearly doubled over. I wasn't sure if Guido's car had bulletproof glass, but I wouldn't put it past him. I needed him to open the window. I coughed some more and stumbled away from the gate. The passenger window rolled down slowly. Open that gate, he shouted. That was all I needed. I brought the pistol up and fired into his face from a range of four feet. The look of shock filled me with gratification before his head exploded against the far window. The car rolled forward. I lifted the gate so it could enter the compound. I kept my head turned away from his cameras and jogged down the road. Once out of sight of Guido's mansion, I ditched the uniform into the runoff, soaking it thoroughly. 
That left me in my jogging outfit. I carried my phone and pistol in my hat. I needed to get rid of the forty-five as soon as humanly possible. There was a lake on the next block. It was going to get a new resident to live on its bottom. I jogged past, dodged toward the shore, and in the darkness I sent the Glock 41 winging into the middle. I put my sopping ball cap on and held my phone in my teeth while I scrubbed my hands using the sand from the six inches of beach at the water's edge. The ripples from the pistol lapped at me. I rinsed off, climbed back to the sidewalk, and jogged on, doing my best to look innocuous. Two blocks later, I dodged into the trees. The trees provided cover and concealment, especially when moving slowly. Glacially, slowly. Ten yards, then fifty, and a hundred later, I needed to cross a street. I waited until there were no cars or sounds of cars. That took nearly fifteen minutes. I turned sharply out of the trees to make it look like I had been running along the road, then crossed and ducked back into the trees, where I became nothing more than a shadow. Fifty minutes after that, I was crossing into the preserve. It took thirty minutes to get across, as it wasn't meant for people to travel that way. I wasn't the first, though, or it would have taken a great deal longer. I heard the music long before I saw the jeep. Rushes 2112. I listened for a few seconds. It brought a smile to my tired face. I crawled out of the trees and jumped into the back. Hi, honey, I'm home. Before you say it, I know I need a shower. That wasn't the plan at all, Jenny said. Looks like it worked. When do any of our plans work out as planned? Just about never. But your claim to fame is that you can wing it better than anyone I've ever met. Ad hoc should be your middle name. That pains me to hear, dearest. I can't believe you tried to run me over. That again? I thought we were done discussing it. That nice man came to see if I was okay. Jenny laughed out loud. I would suggest that men are predictable, and it was Guido's demise. I knew he wouldn't be able to tolerate any delay opening the gate. He was more than happy to berate any underling for not measuring up. Bad leaders have bad things happen to them. I would call it karma. Maybe karma is your middle name. You're right, you do need a shower. I relaxed while lying in the back seat, so much so that I fell sound asleep. Chapter 30 A man's true wealth is the good he does in the world. Khalil Gibran I purged my Barry McStufflebeam email of spam before reading one final note from Babs. Looks like someone got to him. I think it was the mayor. I'm going to keep digging. There's something there. Thanks for the tips. With that, this chapter of our lives is closed, I said softly and deleted the email account. We'll ask Lenny Goldman, Northeast Regional Director, to keep an eye on Guido's boys. But once they find out they're not getting paid, I doubt they'll remain loyal. Our burn barrel had been working overtime, and the t-shirt and shorts burned quickly once dry. I wore the shoes into the ocean and stomped around until my skin started to wrinkle before bringing them inside to run through the washer. I called Gladys to check in, but she didn't have much to say. I let her know we'd be working for more contracts here over the weekend and more when we returned to Chicago after our party. We never had access to Guido's people or clientele, but I figured they would show up in certain dark corners of the net looking for someone of the Peace Archive's particular talents. If they had any relationship with Guido, we would know they were safe to do business with because they'd already know how to fly below the radar. Let Freddy know the contract has been fulfilled. Give him three more days and then boot him out of our house. I will be happy to see the aft end of that one, Gladys said ominously. Has he been giving you grief? No, but I still don't like him because of his role in taking my family hostage. I know, I know. He was as much a hostage as we were. Thank you, Ian, for solving that problem. You are just a peacemaker, aren't you? That's my calling. Jenny suggested Karma was my middle name. I thought it was Tiberius, Gladys deadpanned and hung up. Hey! The connection was already dead. She star trekked me. What are you talking about? I raised a finger as I was about to devolve into a lengthy lecture on the virtues of Star Trek as a franchise, but Jenny's expression suggested I had best not. 
I went with how the look directed me, despite her asking me for clarification. It was a test. I smiled. It's me being me. Babs is going to keep riding the mare. She thinks he was the one who had Guido killed. The rest of the rats in that nest will run for cover. That would be a pretty bold move for a mayor, but then again, he has aspirations for higher office. Removing problems is a tried and true way of making progress in this world. Just ask Bonnie and Clyde, I replied. Hey, we could be them, but not Rob Banks. That was kind of their thing. Did you know that Bonnie was only four foot nine? Clyde was only five four. That's kind of short. I pulled Jenny to me while we watched the ocean. The initial worry over being targeted by the police had passed. We had purged ourselves of evidence linking me to the crime. I doubted they'd be able to get DNA from the guard shack because I made sure I used a sleeve to touch things like the gate while also wiping down anything and everything. The doorknob to the shack had to sparkle for as often as I wiped it. I can't believe you gave me the finger, Jenny said softly. The homeless guy did. It was completely in character. And the words that came out of your mouth. Homeless guy. Had I known you could swear like that, our marriage would have been seriously in doubt. Jenny looked up at me, her eyes sparkling. More pennies to the virtual jar. I looked around before speaking. I kill people, but you draw the line at swearing when you should be proud of me for not talking like that around you. I have my degeneracy completely under control, thank you very much. I guess you do. Point to Ian Bragg. Jenny kept her head on my chest. What's next? Get back to contracts for our people and stay off the trigger ourselves. We keep them gainfully employed, removing the plethora of bad people from the streets of our country. Cue the national anthem. What plethora? It means a lot, I replied. Jenny jabbed me in the stomach with her index finger. I still can't believe you gave me the finger. My satellite phone rang. A 202 number showed on the screen. I closed my eyes. Please don't let it be Jimmy Triplethorn. Please not you, Jimmy. I punched the green button and waited. Ian, Jimmy here. Is there any way you can whip down to D.C.? Say, tomorrow around lunchtime? 12.30 to be exact. Your usual escort will meet you at Reagan after the 11 a.m. flight arrives from JFK. I mouthed the words. How did he know we were in New York? I took a breath. We'd be honored, Mr. Vice President. Do we already have tickets on that flight? Of course. What kind of host would I be to make you pay your own way? You're scaring me, Jimmy. No one's supposed to know about us. You make it sound dirty. Don't worry about it. You're not being arrested or anything. This is something good. Are you going to offer us another job? I emphasized another in case I was being set up. Everyone would know this wasn't the first time. You know it. Someone of your talent is what this one calls for. How's your Italian? I don't speak... The line went dead before I could finish. Italian. We had a couple nice stops in Italy on our around-the-world cruise, Jenny said. It'll be nice to go back. No, we're not going to Italy where Interpol will coordinate with the polizai to disappear us. No, not going. I think he was jagging you, Jenny suggested. Look at Jimmy developing a sense of humor. She shrugged. We better be back tomorrow night. We have guests coming in a couple days. I don't want to have a messy house. What mess? We're the cleanest people I know. You don't know very many people, Jenny replied. I had to give her that. I tended to avoid people. They trusted me, but I didn't want to get too close to anyone. Disappearing from their lives might lead to uncomfortable questions. I was better off holding them at a distance. I was what I had to be when I had to be it. A devoted husband, a homeless guy on the street, a corporate executive and sometimes a killer. Tomorrow would be a new day, and we'd find out what the vice president wanted. Like when Guido stopped calling his own shots, we were at the mercy of those who held leverage over us. It was slightly unpleasant, but not altogether debilitating. Jimmy, what kind of monster had I created? No matter. We'd be okay because Karma was my middle name.
This has been The Tower, written by Craig Martell, narrated by Chris Abernathy. Copyright 2023 by Craig Martell. Production copyright by Craig Martell.